Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? The clerk. President, I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. Mr President, committees have lodged proposals as shown at item four of today's order of business. Additional proposals have been lodged by the Community Affairs Legislation Committee and the Joint Select Committee on Australia's Family Law System for private meetings today. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, we shall move on. I have received, through the Governor-General, from the Governor of Victoria, the certificate of the choice by the Houses of the Parliament of Victoria of Lydia Thorpe to fill the vacancy caused by the resignation of Senator Di Natale. I table the document. A new senator approaches the Senate chamber. Admit the senator. Will the honourable senator please come to the table to make and subscribe the affirmation of allegiance? Senator Thorpe, could you please recite the affirmation on the card handed to you? I, Lydia Thorpe, do solemnly and sincerely affirm and declare that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, her heirs and successors according to law. Senator, please sign the test roll and the senator's roll. I'll ask senators to take the opportunity to resume their seats after welcoming Senator Thorpe, and I'll call Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I seek leave to uh, move a motion to provide for the remote participation of senators. Leave is granted. Senator Cormann. Uh, I thank the Senate. Uh, I move uh, that the rules for remote participation of Senate proceedings recommended by the Procedure Committee in its first report of 2020 uh, have effect during the sittings of the Senate from uh, 6 to 8 October 2020. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Thank you. So we can welcome our senators now attending remotely. Uh, in terms of my statement regarding COVID-19 and the operation of parliament, it is simply that the, op the procedures announced in recent weeks uh, remain in place until further notice. So senators should be familiar with the operation of the building while parliament is sitting and circulars have been sent out to that effect. I'll now call the clerk. 
Government Business Order of the Day number one, Higher Education Support Amendment, Job Ready Graduates and Supporting Regional and Remote Students Bill 2020, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Higher Education Support Amendment, Job Ready Graduates and Supporting Regional and Remote Students Bill 2020. Well, that's what the government calls this bill anyway. It might be more fitting to call it the Higher Education Support Amendment. Scott Morrison is making it harder and more expensive to go to University Bill 2020 because that is the reality. The Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, and his Liberal National Government want to make it harder and more expensive to go to university. At a time of the Morrison recession, the first recession in three decades, the worst, deepest, and most devastating recession in almost 100 years. At a time when there are almost 1 million unemployed Australians and a further 400,000 Australians set to be out of a job by Christmas. At a time when youth unemployment has hit 14.3 per cent and even higher in regional areas. At a time when there are 13 job seekers for every job vacancy. What does this government decide it's going to do for people across Australia, including young people and people looking to reskill? The Liberals and the Nationals, led by Scott Morrison, want to make it harder and more expensive to go to university. Labor will oppose this bill, and we urge other senators, particularly the crossbench, to do the same. Prime Minister Scott Morrison famously said, if you have a go, you get a go. But this bill is going to make it harder for Australians to get a go, and it will make it more expensive for them to have a go. Let's face the realities of this legislation. One, thousands of Australians, many young Australians, will pay more than double for the same university qualification if it passes. Forty percent of students will have their fees increased to $14,500 a year. On average, under the government's legislation, students will pay 7 percent more for their degree. That means people studying the humanities, commerce and communications will pay more for their degree than doctors and dentists. Two, this bill will cut $1 billion out of Commonwealth funding from universities. The government is going to increase the student fee burden and reduce Commonwealth funding over higher education. We know Scott Morrison loves to pass the buck when it comes to responsibilities, you know, the bushfires, the Ruby Princess, aged care, the first recession in three decades. But with this legislation, the Prime Minister is literally passing the buck to Australians seeking a university education. Three, Scott Morrison's university plan won't do what he promised it would do. As always is the case with the Morrison government, they're always big on the headline and the announcement and the photo op, but they never deliver. This bill means that in academic areas in which the government wants to encourage students to take up, universities will receive less money to teach those students. In areas where the government wants to discourage universities, they will receive more money to teach those students. Now, don't take my word for it. The CEO of the Grattan Institute, Danielle Wood, has said, I honestly think this is one of the worst design policies I have ever seen. Even if you accept its stated rationale, it doesn't go anywhere near achieving it. It doesn't take a university degree to know that when you cut money that supports engineering and science courses, you're either going to get worse courses or you're going to get fewer scientists and engineers. Under this legislation, universities will receive 32 per cent less to teach medical students. They'll receive 17 per cent less to te teach math students, 16 per cent less to teach engineers, 15 per cent less for clinical psychology, 10 per cent less to teach agricultural students, and that's uh, really not so good for regional Australia. And universities will receive 8 per cent less to teach nurses in the middle of a global pandemic. Even the former Liberal Foreign Minister, Julie Bishop, has pointed out in her role as Chancellor of the Australian National University, my concern is that under these new arrangements there is a greater incentive for universities to take in a higher number of law, commerce and humanities students than there is to take in students in engineering and maths. That appears to be contrary 
to the government's policy intentions. Even former Liberal Minister Julie Bishop has called it out. This government's policy will do the exact opposite of what they say it will do. To put it simply, you can't promote science and engineering by starving universities and their departments of money. The Prime Minister has either been dishonest about the intention of this legislation, or worse, he doesn't actually know how university funding works. Maybe the Prime Minister and the Education Minister need to return to university themselves to work out what will actually happen under their proposed plan. It's clear you cannot trust the Liberal Party with universities. All they do is cut funding, jack up prices, and lock out students. They're cutting bill billions from the sector while doing nothing to help young people get into high-priority courses and jobs. They're depriving young Australians in year 11 and 12 a chance to help rebuild our economy by making it harder and more expensive for them to go to university. Scott Morrison is making students pay more for their degrees, and he's locking others out altogether. Now, just like all parts of our society, COVID has wreaked havoc on our higher education system. Australian universities are in distress. Classes have moved from in-person to online. Student unions have had to strip back their operations. And estimates show that at least 12,500 jobs have already been lost in the sector. Student life has been turned on its head. International student numbers have dropped off a cliff. The ABC reported yesterday that from January to July this year, Home Affairs had received 40 percent uh, had received 40 percent of the applications they had received in the same period to last year. In June alone, Home Affairs received just 4,062 student visa applications, compared to 34,015 in June 2019. Not only are Australian universities not receiving the tuition fees of international students, the ripples are being, and will continue to be, felt throughout the economy. Those students won't be spending money in shops, they won't be running apartments, they won't be travelling around our country as part of their time here. International education was worth $37.6 billion to the Australian economy last year. It's our fourth largest export industry. And we won't know the true impact of COVID on the international education sector and the economy, but the Mitchell Institute forecasts a $19 billion loss in student revenue over the next three years. And the international students who are in Australia are suffering because they've been left behind by the Morrison government. They've been denied job seeker by this government. They've been, been denied job keeper by this government. They've been forced to rely on charities and food hampers to survive because of the actions of this government. They've been exploited in their workplaces and faced shocking racial abuse. Close to two-thirds of international students say they are less likely to recommend Australia as a study destination than before the pandemic. I've met with international students, and they've been in tears as they've told me how Australia, the country that they have lived in and contributed to for years, sometimes four or five years, has simply abandoned them. Another group who's been abandoned by this government are almost, the almost 30,000 Australians stranded overseas. And this does impact on our higher education sector. Let me explain. Australians stuck overseas, abandoned by the government during a deadly global pandemic. They're stranded in the UK, the Philippines, the United States, Canada, Lebanon, India, the list goes on. Thousands are considered medically and financially vulnerable. They've shared their stories with the Senate COVID Committee only a handful of weeks ago, some with their lives at risk, so risk overseas, others with their, their livelihoods in Australia on the line. All because they're stuck overseas and not been afforded assistance by the government. The Australian government's failure to help these stranded Australians come home is actually standing in the way of our international student sector reviving. With the support of the respective state governments, universities in both South Australia and Northern Territory are both considering launching pilot programs to see international students return to our shores. But the Education Minister, Dan Tian, told ABC RN Breakfast just two weeks ago, and I quote, what's been, hold what's been holding that up, though, is that we've got to make sure, first of all, that we're getting Australian residents back into the country and getting them properly quarantined so they can return home. 
The Morrison government's failure to have a plan to get stranded Australians homes is actually impacting Australian universities recovering. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. But still, it should come as no surprise, given the Liberal government's neglect of Australia's higher education system. They failed to save university jobs at every step during the COVID crisis and the Morrison recession. There have been over 12,500 jobs lost to date, with forecasts of 20,000 jobs lost by the end of the year. 20,000 Australians and their families and their communities devastated. And what has the Prime Minister done? What has this government done? Nothing. <clears throat> Nothing at all. In fact, the government went out of its way to exclude public universities from JobKeeper. They changed the rules three times to ensure that universities don't qualify for JobKeeper. Government backbenchers often attack our universities and, more specifically, academics. And when they do, we need to take a moment and realize not only are they attacking academics, they are attacking the people who are educating the next generation of Australians who will help rebuild our economy, our society and our country in the wake of COVID-19. They're also attacking everyone who works at or is connected to a university. That means librarians, the catering staff, the maintenance and the ground staff, security guards and cleaners, many of whom have had to continue going to work during the pandemic, many with families trying to make ends meet. That's who they're attacking when they attack universities. They're also attacking regional Australia. Universities support 14,000 jobs in regional Australia, and this crisis is already devastating our regional unis. Senator Hanson says she's for central Queensland and for regional Queensland, but why isn't she standing up for the 300 jobs that have been cut at central Queensland University? Will she stand up for the jobs that will be lost across regional Australia and the economic devastation that will hit those communities? No, she won't. The Liberal national government, who wants to make these changes, including government senators sitting opposite, have benefited from Australia's universities. I'm sure some of the government senators opposite would have received free university education thanks to Gough Whitlam. Yet here they are today, unleashing another kick in the guts for students and uni staff. Every member of Scott Morrison's cabinet went to university, but they don't think that our kids deserve the same chance in life. We're relying on our brilliant universities and their researchers to find a vaccine for COVID-19, but they can't even rely on Scott Morrison to protect their jobs. We will be relying on universities to drive our economic recovery, but the Morrison government is cutting funding to those very universities. We're relying on an additional 3.8 million university qualifications by 2025, but instead, the government is making it harder and more expensive to go to university. Labor Prime Minister Gough Whitlam said, we believe that a student's merit, rather than a parent's wealth, should decide who should benefit from the community's vast financial commitment to tertiary education. Only Labor will ensure that a university education never remains out of reach for Australians. No matter who they are, no matter what family they're born into, no matter how much money they have, no matter where they live, in that spirit, Labor is going to oppose this irrational, unfair and poorly designed legislation. We commend Senator Lambie for signaling she will also oppose this bill, and we urge others on the crossbench to do the same. Thank you, Senator Keneally. Senator Faruqi. Um, thank you, Madam De President and Deputy President. I rise to speak to the Higher Education Support Amendment Bill 2020, and I want to be clear from the outset. The only correct cost of a student's degree is zero dollars. University staff, research and teaching should be protected. Our universities should be fully funded, and this bill achieves none of those aims. This bill is cruel. This bill is punitive. This bill is an irredeemable mess. This bill is shit. This um, bill is not worth the paper Senator it is written Fariki. on. Senator Fariki, can you withdraw that uh, statement, please? Sure, Madam Deputy President. So uh, you need to say I withdraw. I withdraw. Thank you.
We will be moving a second reading amendment to give the government an opportunity to withdraw this terrible bill. It would take chapters to catalogue everything wrong with this legislation, but I'll sample its litany of problems today. This cruel bill hikes fees on students, massively shifting the cost of university education away from the government and onto students. We're not talking a small tweak here. We're talking more than doubling the fees for degrees like arts and commerce to more than $14,000 a year. Right now, the most common unit cost is the lowest cost. Under the Liberals' plan, it will be the highest. The hypocrisy of these fee hikes is stunning when we know that 16 members of this government, including the Prime Minister, received a free education. Now they're forcing students to pay tens of thousands more. The attack on the humanities that this package represents is particularly galling. One submission to the consultation rightly suggested that the government was legislating to ensure the irrelevance of the humanities. The Liberals salivate when they blather on with the corporate language of agility and job readiness, but they willfully ignore that the transferable skills needed to weather a recession and adapt to a changing labour market are those taught by humanities. We know this legislation won't encourage students to study the so-called priority degrees. All the experts agree. Even the minister's own department agrees. The modest fee cuts the government is tendering to a minority of students in exchange for destroying the quality of their education simply won't change the average high school graduate's plans. But I am gravely concerned that first in family and regional students who are less engaged with higher education will avoid Scott Morrison's astronomical fee rises and avoid the humanities and business, which have been a fantastic entry point to higher education for countless students. To see the arts return to an elite quasi-private pursuit would be a tragedy. With the fee hikes come the cuts to teaching and learning that force universities to teach more students with less funding across the board. Billions are being cut over the years to come. That's how the government is creating their dubious new places. Not through new funding, but by cutting it and demanding unis take more students on. Make no mistake, this will destroy the quality of education in all courses, including absurdly the STEM subjects like engineering the government claims to care about, which are expensive to deliver, but have little, l still suffered cuts. Overall, it means fewer teachers, less support, and less choice of courses and degrees. I feel in particular for the high schoolers watching on at the pointy end of an already terrible year. Many of them made course choices years ago and have watched their hopes of an education dashed as the promise of decades spent in study debt is all but guaranteed by this government. Under this bill, high schoolers can't even rely on having a place waiting for them at uni. It's incredibly unlikely that the government's plan will create the places it claims to. But even if it does, the promised places are not enough to meet ordinary population growth, let alone the surge in demand during this recession. The result will be hardworking, deserving students missing out. For those students that do get a place, this bill creates a grim future. Young people are already graduating uni with a decade of debt repayments ahead of them. With youth unemployment skyrocketing, these fee increases will leave students in much deeper debt for much longer. Modeling we commissioned found that many students will be well into their 40s before they pay off the study debt that has dogged them through the start of their adult lives. The blokes who put this bill together, Scott, Dan and Josh, are probably um, proud of themselves. Senator Faruqi, may I remind you to refer to those in the other place by their correct titles. The blokes who put this bill together, the Prime Minister, the Education Minister and the Treasurer, are probably proud of themselves for crafting fee hikes that disproportionately hurt women. On average, fees for women will rise 
by 10 percent compared to 6 percent for men. They shouldn't be allowed to run from the misogynist consequences of their policy. To make matters worse, the bill also disproportionately impacts First Nations students. IRU analysis has found that First Nations students' fees will increase by an average of 15 percent. That's years and years more debt. For struggling students, the government's cruel answer is to take away help loan if you fail subjects. And I will be moving an amendment to strip this cruelty from the package. Altogether, those are plenty of reasons to scrap this bill. But it gets worse. Universities themselves have said this plan encourages them to enroll students in the courses with the highest fees instead of the supposed national priorities. With that absurdity, it also destroys the vital research presently cross-subsidized out of the Commonwealth Grant Scheme. Our researchers who should be focused on securing a vaccine and helping us navigate through the pandemic are instead worried about their jobs. A whole generation of young researchers working casual jobs are already being shown the door. Thousands of additional researchers are expected to lose work in the year ahead. And they won't come back. This plan does nothing to protect university workers. The government has stood idly by as thousands have been lost already, rigging JobKeeper three times to exclude universities, voting down my disallowance motion in this chamber, which would have scrapped the unfair rules and exact the punishment they've longed hoped to on a sector that they hold in utter contempt. The impacts of that contempt that riddles this package will be felt most by regional communities. Regional unis are at the heart of our communities. The great benefit of regional education is that students who study locally tend to work locally. But the terrible consequences of this bill is that every dollar of extra debt for a regional student is a dollar not being spent in their communities when that spending is desperately needed at this time. You can guarantee the sweeteners promised for regional unis will disappear. Further liberal cuts to education are a safer bet than the sun rising tomorrow. It's wishful thinking that they won't use the impending recession to eventually yank support from regional unis. In the meantime, this bill will hurt the agricultural work workforce, as Charles Sturt University submitted. The university may need to concentrate enrollments in smaller number of courses, leading to fewer opportunities for regional students and with flow on effects for the agricultural workforce. This whole thing is a policy disaster. The Liberals arrived at such an all-round useless bill by relying on useless labor market predictions that even their buddies and donors on the Business Council disagree with. This bill will see, for the first time, students paying different rates for units depending on what type of psychology degree they are a part of. This not only runs counter to the idea that students should be able to make unit-level decisions, it's completely confusing. The new funding rates for units are based on bad, incomplete data from the Deloitte report that doesn't fully cover the university sector or pass intellectual rigor, as one expert put it. Relying on it is an exercise in diving to the lowest common denominator that saves the government money at the expense of diversity of teaching offerings and research. Let's not forget that made-up Texa integrity unit the minister slapped together when he was called out on the perverse incentives in this legislation. And let's be clear, even if the plan was good, this legislation sucks. The few carrots the minister has dangled for industry and student support in the package aren't implemented in the legislation, and vital details yes, are sorry, desperately um, lacking Senator, or totally absent. Senator, a uh, point of order. Minister. Order. Senator Farouk is uh, very regularly flouting uh, the chair. In fact, it was the, uh, the deputy uh, president's ruling on unparliamentary behaviour, and I'd ask you to uh, seek more appropriate language uh, from the senator for this uh, debate. Uh, thank you, Minister. Senator Faruqi, um, you have obviously been reminded earlier before I came into the chair, so we would appreciate you keeping your comments in a parliamentary fashion. You have the call. We have no guidelines for how this will work and no details at all of how the range of onerous new regulatory requirements co-opted from VET regulation will be enforced on universities. 
Any one of these problems with the bill would justify voting against it. Taken together, they make Centre Alliance's decision to sell out students, young people and our universities for a reprehensible deal even more shocking. You've bought the government's spin, hook, line and sinker, Rebecca Sharkey MP and Senator Sterling Griff. You should be ashamed of condemning generations of young students to decades of debt. You don't need to pass this unfair and unpredictable legislation in order to deliver new student places. It's really not a matter of accepting this messy bill that punishes students and staff or nothing. Minister Tian's own conveniently timed announcement of millions of dollars for extra places has confirmed that it's not. It's not too late to do the right thing and block this bill. It's clear how, how far out of depth Minister Tian and the Prime Minister are. Instead of anything close to a vision for universities, we've got this jumble of competing priorities and a desperation to not invest in students or their education. They have neither the respect for higher education or the command of the policy detail needed for reform. Outrage is to be expected when the Liberals try to cut uni funding, as they have done time and again. But with the justified outrage this time came bafflement. An entire sector bewildered by the policy disaster that is this bill. Everyone from the higher education unions to the business lobby to Julie Bishop say this doesn't make any sense. The disciplines the government claims the bill will advantage, like physics and maths, they were all out condemning this plan. And the best defense the minister could manage was to tell the Herald that I, the only engineering PhD in parliament, should study a maths unit. That was mere hours before he was caught using dodgy figures in a press release in an attempt to talk this bill up. From the lack of detail in the original announcement to the mere six-day legislation consultation and their opposition to Senate inquiry into this once-in-a-generation legislation, the government has shown nothing but contempt for the university sector, the community and the parliament throughout this process. Unlike the government, the Greens' vision for post-school education could not be more clear. Uni and TAFE should be free for all students, for life. We recognize that our collective future depends on the education and training happening in our public universities and TAFE. We see that our ability to see this crisis through and the opportunity to rebuild as a more just society afterwards turns on ensuring people can actually access that education and training without going into decades of debt. We know everyone has a right to education, whether you're leaving school, changing careers, retraining later in life, or looking to gain new skills and knowledge. This is not a flight of fantasy. This is a matter of priorities. If the government closed the loopholes that let one in three major corporations pay no tax, and stopped giving tax breaks to the super wealthy, which they are going to do in the budget today, we could make lifelong access to public education a reality for all students and reap the collective benefits. We can do this and ensure that staff have security of work with fair wages, so they can do their work, teaching and research, side by side and with certainty. That's the vision the Greens will keep fighting for in this place and in the community. It's only fair that students of today have the opportunity so many in this place, including many of the hypocrites sitting opposite, had. The Senate can and should reject this package. We should call on the government to come back with a plan to support staff and create new student places by adding funding, not cutting it. The Greens oppose this cruel attack on students, on staff, and on universities. I move the Green Second Reading Amendment on Sheet 1050. Thank you. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Madam, Madam Acting Deputy President. I too rise to speak on the Higher Education Support Amendment Bill. Sorry. 
iPad has frozen. It's back up. Uh, because uh, this bill is a direct response to the workforce skills and training challenges that we are indeed facing as a nation. It's a recognition of the unprecedented impact and churn uh, within the Australian labour market, and it's an acknowledgement that we, in partnership with industry, businesses and the broader Australian community, understand that skills will be absolutely critical in driving not only our recovery but also our long-term prosperity. Uh, as we've heard only too often, the economic shock from the coronavirus challenge is unprecedented. Each and every Australian has been impacted in some way or another, whether them personally, their friends or their family. Small businesses have been disrupted. Local communities have been disrupted. Entire industries have been disrupted. And indeed, the higher education system, the higher education sector has been disrupted. And ensuring that the Australian economy is the best possible position on the other side of this challenge will take every policy lever available to government. And we know that as a result of this disruption to our economy and the churn in our labour market, there will be record demand on our higher education system. And we need to ensure that it's ready for that and accessible to as many Australians as possible for those that want to get the skills that they need to enter the workforce. So this government is providing leadership on this issue, and we're making sure that our higher education system will be able to respond to this enormous challenge. And we're getting on with the job. We're putting in place the reforms our nation needs to not only recover but continue to prosper. And I would make this argument that this is one of those rare Team Australia moments which arise in this place every so often. So you'd think that those opposite would be supportive of getting Australians back into work and making sure that our higher education system remains as accessible to as many Australians as possible. But no, you would be wrong. We've heard that already this morning. They have continued with their policies of fear, their rhetoric of division and their old class warfare nonsense that they come up with every now and then every now and again when they have little else to argue with. So let's look at the facts, shall we? I know that's something that uh, those uh, over here uh, on the crossbench uh, and, and indeed the Greens uh, fail to do more often than not. Let's look at the facts and the practical impact of these reforms. This package will create 39,000 new university places in 2023 and 100,000 by 2030. It will also provide additional support for students in regional and remote Australia. With this bill, the Morrison government's record funding to Australia's higher education sector will also increase. Now, I know that those over there don't like these numbers because it doesn't quite fit their narrative, but here they are. Through to 2024, funding will increase by an additional $2 billion an additional $2 billion increasing to $20 billion. And overall, Australian taxpayers will continue to pay more than half of the costs of Commonwealth-supported places, with funding prioritised to the areas of high public benefit and those most needed by the labour market. In addition, universities will work more closely with industry to ensure that graduates have the job-ready skills and experience that they need in this challenging labour market. So this means that our universities will be able to respond more effectively to the jobs and the skills challenges that we have than that we're facing, and it will give school leavers more options to take up the career of their choice. Commonwealth-supported students studying courses in key growth areas, including science, nursing, teaching, engineering and IT, will see significant reductions in their student contribution for those units. In total, around 60 per cent of students will see either a reduction or no change at all to their student contribution. By choosing electives that respond to employer needs and the future demands of the Australian economy in subjects like mathematics, engineering, science and IT, with their degree, students can actually reduce their total contribution and enhance the skills that they bring to employment. Australian employers and industry 
are the ones that are actually best placed to know what skills they need for their business, for their work, for their jobs that they have. They're the ones that know what they need in the near term for immediate recovery and the medium and long term. And that's why those who study agriculture and maths will pay 59 per cent less for their degree. 59 per cent less for their degree. Those enrolled in teaching, nursing, my wife's a nurse, my sister's a nurse, my mum's a teacher, uh, clinical psychology, uh, English and languages, they will pay 42 per cent less for their degree. Why? Because these are these are careers that are in need. These are careers that are in demand in our economy. And students who study science, health, architecture, environmental science, IT and engineering will pay 18 per cent less for their degree. And importantly, these reforms also align the costs of completing these units with the costs incurred by the provider in teaching them. All of these decisions have been made using data from the higher education sectors which clearly show the breakdown of actual costs. For those students in these subjects already studying with a Commonwealth supported place, these measures will be grandfathered. They'll be grandfathered so that they'll either pay a lower rate or the current rate. So this notion that someone's chosen to do a degree and they're now going to be faced with higher costs is just an absolute untruth. As a, as a Senator for Western Australia, I'm also very proud to be part of a government that's delivering for regional and remote students. And I know Senator Reynolds would completely agree with me. We are very proud of our regional areas in Western Australia, and this bill is going to help uh, deliver opportunities for more and more students coming from those areas. We need to make sure that the opportunities afforded to students as part of this package are afforded to all students, particularly those who live in some of the most regional, remote and isolated parts of our nation. And Western Australia has those places in spades. It could be said that these places are often where the bulk of our national wealth comes from, but no doubt that's for another debate. In addition to providing more student places at Australian universities overall, the government will provide more than $400 million over the next four years to increase opportunities for regional and remote students to attend university and to lift investment in regional university campuses. All, all, all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students from regional and remote areas will have a guaranteed Commonwealth supported place upon admission to their university of choice. For the first time, the Higher Education Participation and Partnerships Program will support regional, remote and Indigenous students, in addition to low SES students, to access and complete higher education. This bill also amends the Social Security Act to reduce from six to three the number of months a student must be receiving eligible support, student support payments to be eligible to receive fares allowances uh, for a return journey home another important NAPFINE review recommendation. Now, regional communities will benefit from strengthened and newly established re regional university centres, enhance uh, regional research opportunities and regional growth through additional funding to regional university campuses. Now, I've seen the impact of these centres. I've, I've visited them, the ones that are operating in uh, Western Australia, and uh, I acknowledge the, the good work of, uh, of my colleague in the other place, the, the um, member for Durack, Melissa Price, uh, for the tremendous work that she has uh, 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 brought into this area and in seeing uh, a newly established uh, regional university centre in, in Karratha. And continuing to support regional students to get into their career of choice, one with long-term demand in the Australian economy, is critically important. Critically important. Now, I don't have the luxury of time here this morning or this afternoon beg your pardon, to go over all the measures in this bill. I've seen a long list of speakers and I'm sure others will, will take us through that. Uh, but despite not being able to do that today, I can say this. We cannot underestimate or downplay the long-term impacts of the economic shock caused by the coronavirus, particularly the effect that this is having upon the Australian labour market. Now, we know that in a downturn, the demand on skills and higher education providers it actually increases. We must ensure that our higher education system can respond to this demand from a position of strength. 
At the same time, we must ensure that any reform we undertake makes further education and higher education uh, more accessible to the broader Australian public. Those looking to get into the workforce and gain those skills and set themselves up and their families uh, are setting themselves up for life. And uh, those that are looking to have a go, we want to make sure that they certainly do get that opportunity to have a go. And we need to make sure that our higher education system responds to the actual demand from businesses and industry and those who will ultimately end up employing these graduates. We must ensure that they've actually got the skills that are in demand by employers. That they're not, people are not just training or educating for training or education's sake, that they're actually undertaking courses and, a, and, a, and a getting the requisite skills that are required to be productive in the workplace and to hold and keep down a job. So we're in partnership with our universities, and we're best placed to know what skills, because they're best placed to know what, what skills that they need for the near, medium term and long term. And I believe that this bill meets those objectives. But don't just listen to me. Let's take a couple of points that we've heard through the committee process. We heard and through the submissions that came in. We heard from the National University Vice Chancellor, Brian Schmidt. He said that the government has put forward a set of higher education reforms that should allow essentially everyone, young and old, who wants a university opportunity to get one. We heard from Professor Greg Craven, VC of the Australian Catholic University. He said that the package is massively pragmatic, responding to real problems in real time. Industry are also on board. Employers are also on board. The Australian Primary Healthcare Nurses Association, President Karen Booth, said this is a major boost to our profession. It will attract many more students into nursing, making their university education more affordable. Now, these are just a sample of the comments from universities and industries. There are many, many, many more. And they all acknowledge the importance of putting in place a sustainable funding model, a system which will deliver skills for the future, uh, deliver skills for the jobs of the future. And we are in a rapidly changing labour market environment, and we have to adapt and change our education and our training sector to ensure that we're meeting the demand and the needs of those jobs that exist not just for today but exist into the future. These are just a sample of some of the comments from universities and industry, and they all acknowledge the importance of putting in place a sustainable model, a system which will deliver skills for the jobs for the future and, critically, to allow all Australians, importantly, who want to have a go, that they will get a go. So I commend this bill to the Senate. Thank you. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. And, you know, if that's the flavour of the, the contribution from those in the government, you know, this is a sad day for our democracy. Reading those talking points while absolutely just holding through with the support of the crossbench a radical structural change to higher ed in this country that is unjustified, unjustifiable, and was found very, very wanting. It's a miracle we even got two days of hearings because this government didn't want it. So hardball did they play with the crossbench that they actually intimidated them. The government did not want any scrutiny of this bill, no scrutiny. We had to fight tooth and nail to get two days of crammed hearings in for this most significant, enormous structural change to our higher ed sector. And we've got that nonsense contribution from those opposite. Oh, it's good and we're going to make it sustainable. The minute they say sustainable, the country should say cut, because that's exactly what it means. This will be a cut to higher education and it will forever dislocate teaching from research and that is a recipe for disaster. This is like the government that's gone out and kicked higher education to the ground for every single year for the last seven years. They've, they've inflicted multiple fractures on the sector to the point where this is a bruised and battered sector, and now they want to get this legislation through. And with the shameful support of the crossbench, they're going to get it through here, and what they will do is lock in, in like a plaster cast, a multiple fracture that we will never recover from. That will be the record of this government in terms of higher education. It is an absolute disgrace, an absolute disgrace. The higher education uh, bill that is before us today, 
the Higher Education Support Amendment Job Ready Graduates and Supporting Regional and Remote, Remote Students Bill 2020 is exactly entitled, as most of their other nonsense bills, to do the opposite. There is no support in this. This is about breaking things. This is about, as I said, breaking the nexus between teaching and research. This is about breaking the sector that they've been working on breaking for seven years. This is about breaking the hearts of young students who want to go to university and know now, after the government gets this through, that their debt will be increased. The dissenting report from Labor is in fact 36 pages, which is quite a significant dissenting report in my time here in the Senate, and it reflects the evidence that was received from the large number of submissions and evidence that was taken against the government's wishes in the series of hearings that we had. Clearly, the headings, the subheadings of our report give an indication of just some of what's wrong with this bill. A lack of time for proper scrutiny. A dangerous extension of ministerial discretion who can pick his own winners when he wants to. And the, and the sector is very, very concerned about getting on the wrong side of the minister who seems to be able to wield power in the most extraordinary way and advance or withdraw money at his will or her will, as the case may be. But that's what's getting locked and baked in with this legislation. Student fee hikes that actually have no justification. Our report goes on to describe the pricing model that underpins this funding uh, structure that's been established is profoundly weak. The, incenti the incentives that are in here in terms of universities are perverse, and they do not match the realities that confront our universities. The labour market assumptions in this bill are wrong. The barriers to job-ready graduates are well discussed in this, in this document, and we know that those barriers are going to increase as students fear taking on more debt. Many students will pay more, some much more than others, as this government arbitrarily redetermines the shape of higher education. Worse impact on women and First Nations people, the removal of an enabling note loading, which is how Indigenous, many Indigenous students, many older students who find that they have recovered from not being such a good student at school, develop their life skills and decide, I can go to university. They go on and do that. This plays with that system and leaves it with the discretion of the minister to respond. Punitive and unnecessary interference in students' progress. And I'll have more to say about that and the severe, the severe impact that is likely to have on students' mental health and wellbeing. Compounding the COVID-19 crisis, just what we really need from a government that says it's, we're all in it together. Well, this is about making it a very separate kind of experience for those with wealth and those without will miss out. The consequences for research and the economy of that dislocation of research from uh, teaching funding, the risks to regional universities. We had Senator O'Sullivan up there saying how good this is for regional universities, but he wasn't there to hear the evidence from the regional universities where we know that there's every chance that as they lose their research status, they will be simultaneously losing their status as a university. Charles Sturt University, massive job losses in the seat of the Deputy Prime Minister just down the road from here in Wagga Wagga. Hundreds of jobs lost during this COVID-19 crisis, hundreds and hundreds of jobs still to go. And what's going to happen to that university and that town, that great town of Wagga Wagga, if the university loses its status as a university? Failure to attract research from overseas will be a common problem. All of these issues you, were Senator aired in our two days of furious evidence reception at, that, that the government didn't want to have on the record. We will have the loss of university status and private, pro, pro, private providers, the mirage of 39,000 new student places. Don't believe that number for a, a minute. That's an absolute lie. And the last couple, a de degrading of the sector. They, they are just a taste. They are just the subheadings in a 36-page dissenting report from Labor senators. That's how bad this bill is. It's wrong on so many, many fronts. As a former teacher and university lecturer in education, I've always believed in the power of education. Getting a proper education is the best way to build a dream career, a life worth living, and to give your talents and capacities 
the strength that they need to become a vital part of the Australian economy as well. But instead of the supporting of those sorts of goals, instead of supporting aspirational young Australians, this government has created a bill that shifts a larger proportion of debt onto students. It's also a bill that, through research funding changes, further empowers the minister to punish or promote universities at his own discretion. And in fact, in the dissenting report, I think there is a critical statement that just indicates how dangerous what this government is, is doing. And I want to read it into the record. The bill breaks the nexus between teaching and research. It makes no provision for research funding at a time when universities are suffering huge revenue losses because of falling international student numbers during the COVID-19 pandemic. The cuts to teaching and to research will inevitably result in universities gradually losing their capacity for civic engagement with the communities and the regions that they serve. The, this bill challenges the very notion of a university as it has been understood in this country. The impact on young Australians should not be overlooked. For those who are still locked up in Melbourne, can I just say how much, as a Senator for New South Wales, the sympathies, my sympathies and the sympathies of my state are with you being in that situation. But it's not just students in Melbourne, but right across the entire country who have been locked up and engaged with a very uncertain path to university. And this is what we've said in our dissenting report. Year 12 students graduating this year will have endured stressful exams during a deadly pandemic. The bill will ensure that they enter a depressed jobs market with more debt than ever and fewer opportunities than their parents. According to ABC News reporting, youth workers say instances of self-harm and suicidal thoughts have risen significantly among young people in recent months, and the Kids Helpline reported a 40 per cent, yes, a 40 per cent rise in demand for counselling services in March. This bill does not take any account of the effect on the mental health of these young Australians, which has already been buffeted by the cancellation of traditional rites of passage like graduations and formals, and instead presents them with a mountain of debt rather than a doorway of opportunity. That is the general flavour of this bill. It's a vicious and partisan attack on the university sector. Its central premise, its central goal of supposedly creating more jobs-ready graduates is not backed up by the evidence. The overall effect of this bill, if it continues to achieve the support of the crossbench, as has been indicated in uh, mail this morning, this bill will cause deep and lasting harm to an already battered and bruised cohort of young Australians that will result in vast cuts to research and jobs in our world-class university sector. This bill represents a billion-dollar cut, a billion-dollar cut to the university sector, and it forces the burden of funding that deficit, that cut chosen by this government, it forces that $1 billion debt onto Australian students. There is no merit in this bill. The bill also seeks to make it cheaper for rich families to send their kids to university by giving discount to upfront payments of fees thanks to the actions of One Nation. This is an obscene and unnecessary discount to those whose parents have the wherewithal to pay thousands and thousands of dollars up front rather than take out what's basically an interest-free loan. It will make it harder and more expensive for working-class students and easier for affluent ones to study. This bill will have lifelong impacts on working-class students' ability to accumulate wealth, personal savings, or to get a loan and obtain property, while at the same time this bill, as it's baked by this government, will give that upfront discount to rich families who can afford to, to pay upfront. As Labor's dissenting report noted, if this bill becomes law, the difference between the lowest fees paid by students and the highest fees paid will grow to a magnitude of four. Now that should tell you all you need to know about Mr Tien's priorities. Once you strip away the sophistry 
and the lack of empirical evidence around the key aims of this bill, you get to the hard call, and that's the cuts, the cuts to funding, the cuts to student support and the cuts to research. The bill declares that it aims to send price signals to students to entice them into disciplines that it deems will be growth areas in future projects, a future job market. But there was simply no evidence in any of the submissions or in any of the evidence received in, uh, in our committee hearings to support the government's claim about this method of funding. Researchers who gave evidence to the committee, such as uh, Mr Mark Warburton, and Professor Andrew Norton have instead said, the evidence suggests that student choice is informed by a more complex set of factors than a simple response to price. The central premise of the bill is that price will drive students in a particular direction. The central premise is incorrect. That alone should be enough to reject this bill. And in this time of change, the government failed to heed the wisdom of thought leaders across all industries and professions who know that knowledge is moving so fast that you can't train for today, let alone for tomorrow. Graduates need deep and broad knowledge. It will be historical, but they also need to know that their knowledge will have to be refreshed over and over as change continues apace. We need problem solvers in all faculties who can think creatively and know how to learn. We need good communicators who can share their new knowledges with others, and we need skilled collaborators who work with others. They are not related to particular strains of learning or particular faculties. They are about learner disposition and capacity to bring the knowledge and talent that you have to the fore in an ever-changing workplace. The bill doesn't only affect students. It will have disastrous effects on universities as well. They've already shed tens of thousands of jobs due to the COVID-19-induced recession, the Morrison recession, and the callous decisions and political playing by Josh Frydenberg to exclude Australian universities from JobKeeper. But they didn't miss giving the New York University Sydney, camp Sydney campus the opportunity to claim, uh, to claim JobKeeper. The bill, as it stands, is a wrecking ball through Australia's university sector. We're seeing course cuts, courses cut at Sydney University, Macquarie University, the University of Sydney and Monash, and all of our regional universities. The enabling loading, which uh, allows for students from uh, diverse backgrounds to achieve, is being removed. And it also puts pressure on struggling students by cutting off government support if they fail over 50 per cent of their subjects. Students live complex lives, and the university submission from Queensland, uh, Central Queensland University point, pointed out that implication, the impl uh, implementation of this will be extremely limiting, very, very damaging. This bill is a major structural reform that's just not necessary and it's not called for, neither is it just. The bill goes to the cruel heart of this government and national ideology. Instead of support for an ailing sector, with the empty promises of a minister doing the cutting, the poison is locked in legislation and the antidote merely on the lips of the minister. It fails transparency, it fails in terms of its spending, Sorry. and it, uh, fa it fails uh, in every Senator, possible generous way that we can consider has education. Expired. Senator Rennick. Uh, thank you, Acting Madam Deputy President. I rise today in support of the Higher Education Bill. Uh, and before I get on to uh, what was written down, I'd just like to address a couple of the issues that have been raised previously. Uh, the first one was the discount up front. Uh, when Paul Keating introduced this hex debt originally Excuse in 19. Excuse me, uh, Senator, if you could use uh, uh, the former, former Prime, Prime Minister Minister's title. Paul Keating introduced this in 1989. Uh, there was a 15 per cent discount if you paid up front. I will remember it because I paid mine up front. Uh, I got my money from fruit picking over the summer and then I used that money to pay off the upfront loan. And I think it's a very good idea uh, to have a discount in order to encourage the loans get paid off because what we've now got is a $70 billion hex debt uh, that's been funded by the taxpayer. The ATO estimates that about $30 billion of that's probably going to have to be written off. So I think it's a very good idea that we do encourage our students to pay it off uh, through doing part-time work whilst they study uh, so that they you know, both get rid of the debt and they also develop a work ethic 
while they study, because you know it is very easy to get caught up with student life, and, and we have a lot of fun there. But we should never forget that universities are about uh, you know a pathway to a better future, and and you know getting work in the long run. Uh, the other thing that I'd like to touch on is the misogynistic comments uh, earlier by Senator Faruqi, uh, and saying that you know us on this side of the chamber are misogynistic. Um, you know, I, I think Senator Faruqi should actually try and draw inspiration from the women in my family. I happen to be a fourth generation graduate of the University of Queensland. Uh, my great great aunt got a degree in 1920, a Bachelor of Arts, and she went on to teach at All Hallows, where she taught generations of women in maths and physics. Generations of women in maths and physics, so much so that she's now got a hall named after her at the school she taught at. Okay, my grandmother went on and got a Bachelor of Arts in 1930. She also became a teacher. Order. She also, Order she also went on to become a teacher. She had four children before the war and four children after the war. One of those children was my uncle Keith, who unfortunately at the age of seven became blind. He went on and got a law degree through Braille because he persevered. And finally, uh, my other aunt, uh, Arnie Helen, who got a Bachelor of Arts from QU in 1972. And then there's a whole range of women in my family, my own wife, my own sister, all went to Q UQ and got degrees. Okay, so this idea that somehow we're against women getting degrees, I find totally repugnant. I find totally repugnant. I find totally Order, repugnant. Senator Mifuki. And just on Senator O'Neill's comments that somehow we're breaking hearts. We're breaking hearts. The whole idea of this bill is to make sure that we don't give our children false hope. Because what we don't want is to actually see our children go through university, rack up a huge hex debt, and then get to the end of it and not be able to get a job. So it is very important when it comes to universities and, and you know, university degrees that there is a job at the end of it. Because to come out before you've even left the starting blocks and have a massive hex debt around your neck is not a good thing. It's not a good thing. It demotivates our children, and we don't want to see that happen. And it's also not smart from an overall uh, economy perspective, because what we've got is we've got a lot of unemployed graduates, while at the same time we've got to import people from overseas to do our trades. Now, there's a lot to be said, and, and you know, if Senator Cash was here, I, I, this bill about where we're supporting apprenticeships is a great thing, uh, because at the moment we've got a country, in my view, whereby we've got 500 architects and one builder as a result of those Dawkins plans, which turbocharged universities, instead of having one builder, one architect and 500 builders. So we've got to try and fix that, you know, all the money that's gone into higher education and, and hasn't actually got our children a job. And that is what this bill is trying to do. That is what this bill is trying to do. Because we should never forget the importance of our trades, our carpenters, our mechanics. And Lordy knows that you know, out in the regions they can't get enough carpenters, mechanics, boiler makers. You know, we need to actually match demand and supply so that our children can, can get a job, can start earning a, a livelihood so that they can own a house, put a roof over their head, and they can go forward and have children and basically be able to provide for those children and have good health. And that's what this, you know, this is, I know it's an education bill, but it's about actually having a better economy and a happier lifestyle and encouraging home ownership as well. So, and yeah, so this, this leads on to you know, what I've written down here is whether through infrastructure, trade or health, good investment remains one of the best ways to grow the economy and produce jobs. This government has always been committed to smart investment. Exiting from one of the biggest economic crises since World War II, investment has never been more important to get Australians working again. This government has committed over $250 million in dam projects, $800 billion for, million, sorry, for small business to transition into online business, as well as $380 million being put into the regions in order to stimulate areas hardest hit by the coronavirus, the recent bushfires and drought. Make no mistake, the Job Ready Guarantee Bill is an investment. 
It is this government's investment in countless Australians who choose higher education. It is a stimulus for these Australians to make the most worthwhile investment in themselves. An investment in your own education creates opportunities for yourself for the remainder of your life. School leavers looking to start their career, people in the workforce upskilling and individuals looking for a change in career through new qualifications all have one thing in common. They are all investing in their future. Self-investment is a pillar of small government, a concept I am sure that those opposite could not hope to co comprehend. But let me summarise. Small governments allow individuals and businesses to largely manage and invest in themselves with appropriate checks and balances. It is a system where government does not overreach its authority or power, but encourages individual improvement rather than government intervention. Common sense will tell you that when considering two investments that both see the same rewards, the cheaper investment will be more desirable. Higher education is no different. When a degree is proven to allow access into a rapidly developing sector with higher wage growth but also less cost to compete, complete, then others will be inclined to study units which relate to this degree. In 2009, enrolment in STEM subjects were approximately 14,000. When student contributions for these subjects fell in 2012, this number increased to 26,000. It was largely expected that this growth would continue, paving the way for students to continue choosing STEM subjects and increase Australia's standing in the science, technology, engineering and mathematics mathematic subjects. Unfortunately, due to a conveniently quiet 78 per cent increase for student contributions enacted by the then Labor government, a tactic the Australian have come to expect from those opposite, we saw this number plateau, stifling growth in this sector of study. Now, what do these figures demonstrate? They show us that the Australian public shares this government's view that higher education is an investment. It is not a small investment, but one that in many cases reaps large rewards. The government is not in this government is not interested in making higher education a more difficult process for Australians. Instead, we want to support countless investments, uh, investment Australians make in themselves, in their future and in their education. We would like to see Aussies go through higher education and gain a foothold in the job market in order to receive the returns on their investment that they deserve. And that's a really key point about this bill. It's about making sure that Aussies can get a foothold in the job market when they graduate. You do not want to see students, after spending years at study, putting, in their, putting their nose to the grindstone, come out and have no opportunities. There is nothing more heartbreaking than false hope. This is why, in conjunction with private industry, we have readjusted the funding being allocated to units based on future growth. This restructure shows Australians where the best possible returns are available for their investment. This is why it has been restructured, restructured to ensure Aussies see the benefit both financially and personally in studying science, technology, engineering and mathematics, allowing student contributions to fall 18 per cent for all STEM units. Now, it is true that the risk-reward factor is not the only factor students consider when choosing a degree. Passions, and in particular some individuals' desire to help the community, also play a role in determining the outcome. The government not only understands that need to help the community, but actively encourages it. This is why the funding has been restructured to support individuals who seek to give their lives to care for the sick and teach our kids. This will see a 42 per cent reduction in student contributions 
for units relating to teaching, nursing, psychology and languages. And that can't come soon enough because coming from Chinchilla, my hometown, who when I was born there had three maternity midwives with a population of 3,000, now has a population of 6,000, no midwives and no maternity wards. And one of the reasons why it's so difficult is to get nurses out in the regional areas is because the cost of studying to become a nurse is exorbitant. And they've got to do two degrees if they want to be both a, 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 a midwife and a, a general practice nurse. You know, when my mum did it, she had both tickets. She did it through uh, training in the ward. You know, and that's something we need to look at, is getting our nurses and teachers back into the classroom, back into the wards, and our mechanics back onto the workshop, uh, instead of, you know, I think there's a little bit too much em emphasis on seeing uh, our students spend in the classroom, spend time in the classroom, uh, rather than out there on the job, gaining on the job experience whilst they're studying. Even in the COVID-19 era, this government understands that Australian is the Australia is the food bowl of the world. We understand the need for growth in agriculture, particularly to support the rebound out of the pandemic. We understand one of the most rewarding investments Australia can make is in agriculture. All farm families need a far uh, farmer. And yet again, I'll look at those opposite us. You know, the Queensland State Labor government shut down three uh, agricultural colleges in regional Queensland uh, under this term of government. Why they would do that? When our farmers look after the land, they're the ones on the land. Wouldn't you want to encourage you know, farmers to adopt best practice so that they can look after their farms uh, and manage it for all of our children's future, as well as generate uh, income for themselves and have a prosperous uh, regional community? Uh, so for Labor to sit here and complain about you know, what we're doing with this bill when they've sat there and closed down pastoral colleges uh, smacks of hypocrisy. So this is why, in our support for our agricultural industry, uh, student contributions in units relating to agriculture will fall by 59 per cent. Additionally, the government is allocating a further $400 million over the next four years for regional students, allowing a greater opportunity and access to higher education for our regional and remote communities. It's interesting, I, I forgot to touch on before, my grandfather actually topped maths in the New South Wales Public Service exam in 1911. He never got to go to university. He had to go back to the farm. So, you know, maybe if this stuff had been around then, he might have gone and got a degree. Who knows? The additional funding will be prioritised into newly established regional university campuses and enhanced regional research opportunities in order to maximise the chance for members of these communities to attend university. This government understands that regional communities have been particularly hit hard by the coronavirus pandemic with many, in particular Victoria, forced to sustain some of the world's harshest lockdown laws despite recording uh, zero coronavirus cases in, in many regional areas. We also understand, particularly in this post-COVID era, that many within our regions and remote areas simply cannot afford to leave the home. This understanding has led to the development of a one-off 5,000 payment, known as a TAP payment, for regional school leavers who are forced to relocate more than 90 minutes in order to enrol in higher education. This new payment is designed to encourage students leaving school in these communities to enrol in higher education. I commend this bill to the Senate. Thank you, uh, Senator. Now we're going to go to Senator Billick remotely. Senator Billick, you have the call. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, it's always interesting to speak after Senator Rennick too. I've got to say, I heard him say that he paid his degree off by picking fruit. He must have picked a lot of fruit, I think. If he's got a commerce degree, uh, that's worth $14,500 a year to any student uh, that wants to undertake it, uh, should this bill go through. Uh, and I'm not sure if it's a three or four year degree, but it's a minimum of $45,000 uh, so that's a lot of fruit to pick. Um, so maybe he's an expert senators, fruit picker. Senators, can I ask senators in the um, chamber? Can I ask the senators in the chamber to pay the normal courtesy 
for those people who are making a contribution remotely, and that is not to interject. It's um, disorderly to interject at any time. So I remind senators to give Senator Billick the opportunity to be heard in silence. Senator Billick. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And I, Senator Rennick also talked about how many architects and how many builders there are. Can I just say, if, uh, if they didn't keep cutting funding to TAFE, then there'd be a lot more um, builders around, I think, uh, to be able to help fill that gap. But I am speaking today against the government's higher education support amendment, Job Ready Graduates and Supporting Regional and Remote Students Bill of 2020. It's a terribly poorly thought through bill. It's made in haste and it's based on outmoded prejudices and ideology. I really don't know what made the government propose this ill-conceived bill. It's based on an ignorance of the higher education sector or, and or of the wider community. Perhaps it's based on a dislike of arts graduates, although there are plenty of those that actually sit on the government benches. But honestly, I think they simply do not want young people from low socioeconomic backgrounds going to university. The Liberals want to return to the past where, unless you went to an elite private school and had wealthy parents, you had almost no chance of gaining a tertiary education. And those opposites should be ashamed that they introduced this bill and ashamed that they're supporting it. At least the Nationals for once managed to secure, to secure some government concessions with this bill. What did the Liberal Party room secure? Did they all just sit there meekly and let it go through without giving it a second thought? I really believe that those on the government side have betrayed all those voters who believed that you did truly care. The bill we're debating today makes it harder and more expensive for a lot of Australians to go to university. Why? Why are they making more people pay more money for the same qualification? And why, having hiked fees, do they then still cut billions in funding from the sector? I'll tell you why. It's ideological, and I don't believe that this policy is backed by any evidence. 40% of students will have their fees increased to $14,500 a year, doubling the cost for thousands. That means people studying the humanities, commerce and communications will pay more for their degree than doctors and dentists. Now, the title of this package, the Jobs Ready Graduates, or JRG, is farcical, like a lot of bills that we come across by this government. There's no evidence that these degrees make students less employable than other degrees. In fact, the job prospects of humanities students are very healthy. According to recent research, people with humanities degrees have higher employment rates than those with science or maths degrees. The government has provided no sensible or reasoned arguments for these changes. Perhaps they should study some units in logic or critical thinking. Terrible bills have terrible consequences, and I'd like to focus for a while on how this bill will affect my home state of Tasmania. In Tasmania, we have only one university, the University of Tasmania, and Tasmanians are rightly proud of their university. It's an affordable and quality pathway to a higher education. And UTAS plays an important role in providing skills and training opportunities, as well as research and development capabilities. Higher education can have a transformative effect on individual lives. It creates employment and opportunities, and it results in generally higher salaries. It also creates employment opportunities in the wider society, increasing the capabilities of companies to deliver services and products, as well as the creation of new services, products and technology. The benefits of higher education do not just flow to students, they're shared by the whole of our society. And particularly in regional um, areas like Tassie, like Tasmania, by working smarter, not harder, we can leverage our natural advantage and utilise them for the maximum benefit for our state and for our people. We'll be relying on university graduates to drive our recovery from the recession. And recently I spoke to the National Tertiary Education Union about the bill in general, and more specifically on the impacts it will have on UTAS, and this is what they told me, and I quote, under the job-ready graduate scheme, some institutions will be more severely impacted than others 
due to the mix of disciplines that their Commonwealth supported students enrol in. Put simply, the universities that have a relatively high proportion of students enrolled in disciplines which experience the largest cuts in total resourcing will be under even more financial pressure should the JRG package come into effect. While no university will be better off under the JRG package, the University of Tasmania will see an average reduction of over $900 per Commonwealth supported place. And in fact, NTEU calculations based on 2018 student load data shows that 60% of the Commonwealth supported places at UTAS will see a reduction in total resourcing under the package. This means UTAS will not only have less resources per student, but like all institutions, will have to teach more with less in order to maintain current levels of funding. And they also advised me that the JRG package will not alleviate the funding issues facing UTAS as a result of the COVID crisis. In fact, the JRG package will increase pressure on the university to increase its level of discretionary funding. While there are some sweeteners in the JRG that UTAS may be able to access, such as regional loadings, these do not outweigh the loss the university will be facing overall. Furthermore, most of these benefits also rely on the university substantially increasing domestic enrolments, which will be a challenge. So it's clear that UTAS will be disproportionately impacted by this bill. The NTEU also made the following point about research funding. While well, the JRG package will see a reduction overall in the resourcing for teacher per student, it also removes the research allocation from CSP funding. In fact, the JRG package does not provide a single dollar for research, and the government has remained silent on any research funding changes despite the importance of research in a post-COVID recovery. Tasmania does important innovative research, particularly in marine and, and Antarctic sciences. And it's disappointing that this government not only wants to attack students, but the important research our universities are doing as well. It's a stark contrast to what Labor did in government. In government, we made policies to ensure that university education never remained out of reach. In order to achieve this goal, we invested in our universities and we supported them when they needed it. After years of neglect under the Howard government, Labor boosted investment in universities from $8 billion in 2007 to $14 billion in 2013. And our policy resulted in an additional 200,000 young Australians going to university. Sadly, those opposite don't have this kind of vision. And it's clear that this is a bad bill and it's coming at a really bad time. We all know what a terrible year 2020 has been. We've seen increases in the rate of youth unemployed, unemployment rising by more than 90,000 in recent months alone. We're in the depths of recession, so now is the perfect time to be training young Australians. The demand for unity places, university places has surged. Yet we've got Mr Morrison refusing to provide enough extra places to meet this increase in demand. And even when the government is promising new places, they provide no extra funding to support them and no guarantee those numbers will eventuate in practice. The effect of this bill would be to increase the student fee burden and reduce Commonwealth funding to higher education. And as I said earlier, perhaps the government simply doesn't have an understanding of the current labour market because the industry stakeholders tend to agree. Bronwyn Evans, CEO of Engineering Australia said, and I quote, the government's announced changes may lead to increased inequality and a harmful reduction in the diversity of skills necessary for a modern workforce. An increase in university fees risk increasing structural inequality for women and people from low socioeconomic status backgrounds who choose to study humanities law and other courses that will now leave them in even more debt. And Megan Lilly from the Australian Industry Group said, we're not of the view that the humanities is unnecessary. Graduates get very good generous skills and it can lead to very good career opportunities. 
There is also potentially a problem with reduced total funding to some courses being promoted. Universities might have limited places for engineering courses despite student fees being slashed, and that could be very problematic. And then Dan Woodman, President of the Council for the Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences, or has said, some of the fastest growing job areas for university graduates are new, many of which require exactly skills and experience that the study of HAS subjects can provide. Content specialists, customer officers, data scientists and sustainability analysts are in high demand. These jobs didn't exist five years ago and a strong humanities or social science degree provides a foundation for working in these and the new related fields that will inevitably emerge in the coming years. The bill has even been criticised by the former Deputy Leader of the Liberal Party in the House of Representatives, Ms Julie Bishop. That's right, Ms Julie Bishop has criticised the bill. Ms Bishop, who is now Chancellor of the Australian National University, has argued that the substance of the bill won't result in the government's stated policy goals. Similarly, the CEO of the Grattan Institute, Daniel Wood, has said, I honestly think it's one of the worst design policies that I've ever seen. And even if you accept its stated rationale, it doesn't go anywhere near achieving it. When industry, when students, when business groups, when unions representing staff, including academics, and even a former deputy leader of the Liberal Party are all opposed to the bill, you know it's a bad bill. It's a bad bill. There's just another move in a continuing pattern of attacking our higher education sector. But of course, we shouldn't be surprised. This government has had a habit of attacking and failing to support the university sector. For months now, Labor has been urging the federal government to finally step in and help universities save jobs during the pandemic. Since then, thousands of jobs have been lost across the country. Australia University forecasts 21,000 job losses in coming years. And Scott Morrison has done nothing, nothing to stop these job losses in our fourth largest export industry. He's shown no interest in the thousands of university staff who are losing their livelihoods or the communities that depend on their jobs. The federal government has gone out of its way to exclude public universities from JobKeeper. It's changed the rules three times to ensure that they don't qualify. The impact of this crisis on regional universities will be devastating. Universities support 14,000 jobs in regional Australia. These are not only academics and churches, but also admin staff, library staff, catering staff, ground staff, cleaners and security. And all these people have got families, all are trying to make ends meet. We know that Australia will require an additional 3.8 million university qualifications by 2025. Yet when it comes to our higher education system, this government's priority has always been to cut. By promising to support the study of maths, science and engineering, this legislation reduces the money universities will receive to provide those courses. And in areas where the government says they want to encourage, universities will receive less per student. And in areas that the government says they want to discourage, universities will receive more per student. It provides a disincentive for universities to enrol extra students in these disciplines. And in total, this package will cut $1 million, $1 billion, $1 billion from universities. As always with this Prime Minister, the detail doesn't match the announcement. Mr Morrison is making students pay more for degrees and he's locking others out altogether. While promising to support the study of math, science and engineering, this legislation reduces the money universities will receive to provide these courses. Prime Minister is either misleading Australians about the intention of this bill or he doesn't know how university funding works. The reform is a complete mess. It can't be amended or fixed and we can't trust the Liberal Party with universities. All they do Senator is Billy, cut good, funding, your lot of time jack up has expired. Prices. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. And I rise to speak on the government's higher education bill, which is sadly the latest in a long line of attacks on the university sector.
from this government. Now, this is a bill that would hike fees and push students into decades of debt right at a time when youth unemployment is at record highs. It will hurt women and First Nations students the most. It will slash billions in funding from teaching, leading to bigger classes, fewer teachers and a worse quality education, including for rural and regional students. It will force universities to do more with far less. It will shift the overall costs of education away from the Commonwealth and onto students' shoulders and it will fail to encourage students to do STEM courses. And of course, it fails to save a single university worker's job from the COVID crisis and their exclusion from the JobKeeper support package, despite multiple occasions where the government could have fixed that. So here we are again. The government is ripping money out of the tertiary education sector, and yet it's got the audacity at the same time to be relying on that same sector to develop a vaccine for COVID-19. So it's saying to universities, you're going to have to do more with less. Students are going to have to pay more. We're not going to support you to keep your staff on the books. You can just fire thousands of people because we're not giving you enough funding. Oh, but you need to save us from COVID-19 and you need to be the first. You need to get ahead so that Australia can do that. Well, what an absolute farce, once again, from this anti-intellectual government that sees everything as a potential profit-making and a potential to privatise and flog off to the private sector. And we've seen for years now, with successive cuts to university funding by this government and, and uh, over, in, over decades, in fact, um, we've seen that universities have been forced to become more and more corporatised. Thanks to the cuts by this government to university funding, unis have had to go cap in hand to industry, do more research for sale, more research for industry, uh, become more and more like a business and more and more corporatised, with less focus on public interest research and less focus on the interests and the outcomes for students. And this government is just continuing that trend. They've excluded universities from JobKeeper, leading to tens of thousands of people in that sector who have lost their job. They're expecting unis to do more, with less they've already faced so many cuts. And now they have to teach even more students with even less money. They are cost-shifting cost shamelessly onto students. Now, I just genuinely don't understand why, in a recession, with record high youth unemployment, you would discourage young people from skilling up, from getting further tertiary education. I just don't understand why the government thinks that that is a bad investment when we all know that education is a boon for us all. It is not only good for the individual, but it is good for our prosperity as a society and a community. And so naturally, naturally this government wants to defund the sector. They don't value education. They certainly don't value tertiary education, um, and they're just ready to continue to see it flogged off uh, and corporatised um, while they give yet more uh, subsidies of, of public dollars to the fossil fuel donors that they are so cosy with. Well, we here at the Greens think that education should be free. Now, the Prime Minister got his university degree for free. I think there's 15 others in, in the government ranks that also benefited from free education. We all benefit from free education. That is the point. Education is a universal public good. It should be free. And yet, these old white guys who've gotten uh, free education when they were at uni now want students to pay even more for an even worse quality education because they are squeezing universities and bleeding them dry. Wrong way, go back. Um, we'll be moving a second reading amendment uh, which calls for decent support for universities, for universities and, its, and their research programs to be fully funded, for the employees of universities to be properly supported and covered by JobKeeper and for university and TAFE, for that matter, to be free. It is just tragic to watch the progression 
of increasing fees and increasing corporatisation of the higher education sector. And this government has a chance, as always, to rectify that, but it's just doubling down. So I don't have a lot of hope that we'll get much support, in all honesty, when we move that second reading amendment that says uh, higher education should be free. But nonetheless, we move it because I believe that the majority of Australians see education as a good thing that should be supported by governments because it's an investment in people and it's an investment in the prosperity of our shared future. So I look forward to uh, where the numbers will fall in that regard. Now I want to talk briefly about the impacts on women, because this government's not really known for prioritising women. It sort of hasn't really met many women. It certainly doesn't have many women in cabinet, with a handful of exceptions. Uh, and we, well, it's still too low, I'm afraid. It is still about one quarter. That is not good enough. Do better. Maybe if there were more women around the cabinet table, we wouldn't see such a terrible policy as this, which will disproportionately affect women once again. So women are about two-thirds um, of the students in the field of humanities and social sciences and media and comms. So the yearly fees in those courses are set to more than double. They're just shy of $7,000 at the minute. They're set to go up to $14,500. Now, uh, my, my colleague, Senator Faruqi, who um, has our portfolio responsibilities on this matter, also mentioned a very interesting statistic. The fee increase will again be disproportionately borne by women. Women will pay on average 10 per cent more for fees, should this bill pass, whereas the blokes will only pay an extra 6 per cent. Now, we don't think anyone should be paying more because we think universities should be free, but there is absolutely no case for women to be bearing the brunt of increased university fees. Now, we know that women already take longer to pay off our hex debts, um, thanks to the fact that we're still paid lower wages uh, and we often have to take time out of the workforce for caring responsibilities, which we disproportionately bear the unpaid brunt of. So doubling the cost of humanities and comms degrees will further push women into debt and will lead to even more long-term economic insecurity. Um, we know that the additional debt burden just compounds the systemic disadvantage that flows from the gender pay gap. But this government either hasn't thought about that or does not care. This whole pandemic has disproportionately affected women. This bill before us will disproportionately affect women, and yet we still don't have a women's budget impact statement, and we still don't have enough women around the, budget, uh, the cabinet table making these sorts of decisions. So it's no surprise that once again we have a bill that's completely blind or doesn't care about the disproportionate negative impacts on women. Um, now, interestingly, uh, some other female-dominated degrees, including teaching and nursing, will cost less under these changes. However, these industries are already highly feminised, and it won't surprise anyone that they are amongst the lowest paid. And those two concepts are sadly linked. Um, in fact, for nursing, they're also the highest risk professions in the year we've just had. So those uh, sectors have been subject to things like public sector pay freezes, casualisation, um, and of course they've been largely ignored in the COVID stimulus packages. So lower fees to encourage women into lower paid, undervalued professions is not good policy. Uh, the minister has argued that the proposed changes could advance gender equality by prompting more women, young women to study STEM because of the cheaper university fees for STEM. However, that flies in the face of evidence that financial incentives alone repeatedly fail to achieve gender equality in STEM. If you really want more women and girls in STEM, then we need some serious investment in that sector. We need to challenge the gender bias that sadly still persists in that sector and so many others. Um, and we need to look at the way in which young women are encouraged to study STEM at school. Look at the role models that they have. Um, look at the teachers, look at the gender composition of uh, those mentors and destigmatize flexible working conditions in institutions uh, that practice STEM. The proposal, finally, on this point, the proposal to remove HECS support from people that fail 
their subjects also has an immense gendered impact. So this government is saying if you fail more than half of your subjects, you'll be cut off from your hex uh, and help support. Um, and sadly, we know because we pay attention and we talk to young women and we talk to university students and workers, we know that many women that have been subject to sexual harassment or rape or assault um, on campus often go on in that subsequent semester to fail many of their subjects. Understandably, they've been traumatised and they're often very much let down by the university uh, system in grappling with those assaults. And yet, this government has not factored in that. It hasn't factored in the burden that young people bear, the juggling exercise that they have to undertake to even afford to go to university, the fact that many of them are working uh, jobs, many of them have uh, caring responsibilities. Again, this government is blind to the realities of life as a young person and it's blind to the realities of life as a woman. So it's no surprise that this package will have a disproportionate effect on women. Now, I'm from Queensland, and there will also be some extremely poor outcomes for some of our universities in Queensland. The University of the Sunshine Coast will lose $31 million per year, more than any other university. James Cook Uni up, up in North Queensland will lose $6 million a year. The Central Queensland Uni in Rocky and Griffith Uni have also opposed the changes in this bill. So the Greens stand with students. We stand with those universities that are saying, actually, we'd like more funding rather than less, and we're really spread quite thinly as it is, thanks very much. Um, we stand with investing in a prosperous and bright future for young people, for anyone that wants to go back to uni and study a new skill for anyone that needs to retrain as our economy changes. And in particular, yes, we're in a global health pandemic, but we're also in a climate crisis, and there will need to be some retraining and reskilling um, of workers as industries change and adapt to our uh, climate collapse. Another reason we think that university should be free and that tertiary uh, education in all its forms, TAFE, you name it, should be free. Um, unfortunately, it looks like we just lost the numbers, and that's why we're debating this bill here today, folks, is because the government's finally got Centre Alliance uh, to vote to cut university funding. It's given them a few crumbs from the table for South Australia, um, and here we are. The reality of balance of power once again uh, shows itself in a poor decision that will be rammed through this chamber because the government has managed to bribe <coughs> enough support out of the crossbench to get them to support it. So I want to commend Senators Lambie um, and Patrick for standing with the opposition and with the Greens to oppose this bill. Um, and we're extremely disappointed that Centre Alliance, or I think we're calling them Liberal Alliance now, um, have decided to stand with the Liberals and slash funding for universities nationally just to get a few crumbs from the table for South Australia. And I think my South Australian colleague, Senator Hanson Young, will be saying some uh, considered words uh, about this very issue later on in the debate. Um, but here we are, folks. We've got a government that um, has never met a young person, doesn't think much about women, uh, doesn't value tertiary education, um, and they're ramming through this bill right before the budget after successive cuts already to our university sector and after refusing to support university staff with JobKeeper eligibility. They are shameless, and let's turf them out next time. Senator Davey. Thank you. And uh, just to um, correct Senator Waters, many of us not only have met young people, we are parents to young people, we support young people in our communities. So, you know, I, I really appreciate the generalisation, but it is false. Uh, look, the Nationals do support this higher education amendment, job ready graduates and supporting regional and remote students bill. And uh, we support our regional students and our regional universities. And we support the contribution that they will play to our economic recovery. And we do this with thanks, and I must acknowledge the work of my Nationals colleague in the other place, Minister Andrew G, who consulted extensively with regional universities to ensure that these reforms meet the needs of regional students and regional institutions alike. 
and mine's just done what. Um, higher education is an important career pathway choice. It plays a vital role in our economy, both through producing qualified job seekers, professional development opportunities, and also as an income generator in its own right. We want to ensure that tertiary education is available to any Australian who wants to attain a university qualification. And that's why this package will create more places—39,000 new university places in 2023 and 100,000 by 2030. And to kick-start it, we're increasing the funding of universities from $18 billion to $20 billion by 2024. These extra places and the extra funding will also assist people from rural, regional and remote areas to access university courses. Because we know that there is disparity in educational participation and attainment for people from regional and remote areas and our Indigenous populations. The Senate Education and Employment Legislation Committee heard in the recent uh, round of hearings that the biggest impediment to rural, regional and remote students undertaking a university course is not cost but access. Mr Duncan Taylor, CEO of the Country University Centres, which manage six supported study hubs across regional New South Wales, told the committee that, and I quote, without doubt it is access. The upfront costs of potentially relocating to a distant university campus or, in the case of online study at home, it is the lack of supports in place that are likely to make that study successful and the student does not feel isolated to drop out of university. When I asked for a figure on the attrition rate for students who choose to study at home in remote locations, Mr Taylor said it is about two and a half times higher than that at face-to-face -face learning. But that rate falls greatly for those who can access a supported study centre. And that's why the nationals in government are very proud to support regional university centres. Because we know not everyone can relocate and move to a university campus for their study. And regional university centres do a very important job in providing additional support for those students. We also recognise, however, that some do want the benefit of face-to-face -face learning and some remote students want the choice to be able to go away and experience university life. The Job Ready packages and package acknowledges this and provides for a tertiary access payment for those students. This one-off payment of $5,000 for school leavers from outer regional and remote areas who relocate more than 90 minutes from their home to undertake tertiary education will make this relocation and accessing university easier for many. It is estimated that over 8,000 students will benefit from this payment next year alone. But importantly, this payment, the tertiary access payment, is not limited to university courses because re we recognise that university is just one career pathway for our young people. Some go through university, some through TAFE, TAFE, and others learn on the job. There is no right way to enter the workforce. This bill also amends the Social Security Act to reduce the number of months from six to three that a, a student must receive eligible student support payments to be eligible to receive a fares allowance to return home, which is really important because we've seen recently the stress of students who've been blockaded by state border closures and unable to travel home for holidays, to see their family or for special events. Our package will also ensure that universities target the enrolment of rural and regional and remote students. By expanding the Higher Education Participation and Partnerships Program to recognise these students as a key target group, along with the already recognised low socioeconomic uh, group and Indigenous students. Currently around 130 students from low socioeconomic backgrounds or Indigenous students are eligible for support under the HEPPP. Our changes will mean an additional 125,000 students who either meet those criteria or are from regional and remote areas 
will be eligible for this support. So, contrary to what we are hearing in this debate from Labor and the Greens and some of the independents, we are not making it harder for students from lower socioeconomic de demographics. We are actually supporting and facilitating those students to access pathways through the higher education and ultimately into the workforce. And we're making sure that this includes a new regional partnerships pool to support outreach activities to increase the aspiration of rural and regional school students to attend university. Because we know universities have a big role to play in reducing the gap between educational attainment from between metro and regional areas. And we are also supporting our regionally based universities because we know if someone learns in the region, they are more likely to earn in the region. They're more likely to stay regional. Not only do our regional universities make it easier for these Thank students you, to study Good. and hopefully continue to work in regional areas, but they support our regional communities through employment, through research and by fostering regional development, and we support them. Indeed, we heard this over and over again through our inquiry at the Senate committee. The regional universities network told the committee that they support this bill and that its timely passage would enable relevant arrangements to be put in place prior to 2021. The Vice-Chancellor of the University of Tasmania, who Senator Billick only today so rightly said she was very proud of, the only higher education institution, um, university institution in Tasmania. The Vice-Chancellor said that this package really supports regional and rural education and assists in creating a sustainable university for the island. Central Queensland University Vice-Chancellor Nick Klomp said reducing the cost of studying teaching, nursing, agriculture, health and engineering will make these courses more attractive to students from all walks of life, particularly from the regions. And in Victoria, the Federation University Vice-Chancellor Helen Bartlett remarked how students, communities and providers should benefit from this new reform package and regional, rural and remote students, communities and tertiary education providers will benefit from this decision. In New South Wales, the University of New England Vice-Chancellor Bridget Hayward said this reform will help regional Australia. I also note that Senator O'Neill referenced Charles Sturt University, who did not appear before the uh, Senate committee, but who I have had extensive briefings from about their recent restructure. And in my consultation with Charles Sturt University, they made it clear, and I want to put this on the record, that their restructure was not brought on by these reforms, nor was it brought on by COVID, but it was brought on by their strategy to ensure that they can continue to deliver quality, modern education into the future. And I commend CSU for being proactive for undertaking this work and, importantly, for keeping their stakeholders informed. Now, to address reducing the cost for students studying priority areas, I fail to see what the problem is in reducing the costs for 60 per cent of students. We know there is a gap between the skills of graduates as they leave university and the skills and experiences needed to succeed in the workplace. We have shortfalls in priority areas, including sciences, health and IT. And I note there has been a welcome increase in the number of Indigenous students enrolling in health courses, and our reforms will encourage rather than discourage more of that. There are also key growth employment areas which will require more graduates, such as engineering and agriculture, particularly relevant for regional Australia. And because our government is committed to regional Australia, we are committed to developing and delivering major infrastructure projects such as inland rail that will need such graduates into the future. We also commend the National Farmers Federation and their ambitious goal 
of a hundred billion farm gate return by 2030. But we know to reach it, agriculture can, needs to continue to innovate. And to do so, we need more graduates, we need more agricultural research, both practical and developmental, if we want to fulfil that goal. So by strengthening our regional universities, by improving access to university for outer regional and remote and indigenous students, Order. and by offering Senator Davey, incentives— you will be in continuation when debate resumes. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I seek leave to make a statement regarding ministerial absences. Leave is granted. Thank you, and I thank the Chamber. I advise the Senate that Senator Cormann will be absent from question time today, Tuesday 6 October 2020, due to budget arrangements. In Senator Cormann's absence, I will represent the Prime Minister, the Minister for Finance, the Minister for the Public Service, the Minister assisting the Prime Minister for the Public Service and Cabinet, the Minister for Population, Cities and Urban Infrastructure, the Treasurer, the Assistant Treasurer and the Minister for Housing. Senator Payne will also be absent from question time this week, Tuesday 6 to Thursday 8 October 2020, due to ministerial business overseas. In Senator Payne's absence, I will represent the Minister for Foreign Affairs and Order. the Minister for International Development and the Pacific. Senator Rustin will represent the Minister for Women. Senator Cash will represent the Attorney General and the Minister for Industrial Relations. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Senator Sheldon. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Last week, Professor Brendan Murphy said that if the Australian government had acted sooner to protect residents of aged care from COVID-19, and I quote, there could have been some avoided deaths. Does the minister agree? Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator Sheldon, for the question. Mr President, uh, as I've said a number of times in this chamber, every death that's occurred in aged care as a result of COVID-19 is an absolute tragedy, and each of the 681 who have passed away um, is, is an absolute tragedy. My condolences and the condolences of my colleagues in the government go to every single one of those families. Uh, it is it is absolute, absolutely tragic that these people have lost their lives, Mr. President. Uh, at all times, Mr. President, the government has acted on Order. the appropriate health advice of the time, Mr. President. It's very easy for la the Labor Party. It's all very easy for the Labor Party to come in, in here with a 2020 uh, vision of hindsight uh, and make, make comments or and or allegations, but, Mr. President. All through this pandemic, Order. all through this pandemic, this government uh, has acted on the advice available to us at the time of the uh, health professionals that have been guiding us. Uh, we have continued to do that, and we have we will continue to do that. We will continue to update our our plan as we learn more about the virus, as we learn more about the way that it acts within residential aged care. And Mr. President, as we have learnt more, we have applied that to our response, and that is clearly uh, evident in the work that we've done, particularly, for example, in Victoria with the Victorian Aged Care Response Centre. So, Mr. President, at, on each occasion, we have worked Order. with the sector, provided advice to the sector, Mr. President, and we ha and we will continue to do that because that's the appropriate Order. thing to act on the health advice of the day in the best interests of residential aged care uh, residents within Australia. Order. I will call Senator Sheldon, Senator Wong, Senator Rennick, Senator, Senator, Senator Sheldon. The Royal Commission's special report released last week confirmed, and I quote, there was not a COVID-19 plan devoted solely to aged care. How many of the 673 deaths in residential aged care could have been avoided if the minister had a plan? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, the government has maintained and continues to maintain that we do have a, a plan to deal with COVID-19 in On residential right aged and care. Left. And as I said in my answer to the primary question, as we've learnt more about this virus, we've continued Order. to update 
that plan, and we will continue to do that, Mr. President. We will continue to update Senator our plan Wong. as we learn more about the virus, how it operates, and we will continue to communicate the learnings Senator of Gallagher. management of COVID-19 in residential aged care to the aged care sector. We continue to do that. Uh, we have commissioned a number of reports uh, into uh, Dorothy Henderson Lodge and Newmarch, and we applied the learnings Senator from Watt. those particular incidents to our, our uh, approach to managing the virus in Victoria. And we, as we've learnt more, we continue to update the plan, and we will continue to do that, as we said in our response last week. Senator Sheldon, a final supplementary question. The Royal Commission also described insufficient supplies of PPE and infection, con training, con infection control training as deplorable. How many of the 673 old Australians who died of COVID-19 in residential aged care would still be alive if the Morrison government had acted sooner? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank uh, Senator Sheldon for the question. Mr. President, uh, all through the COVID-19 pandemic, the, the one thing that this government has made sure of is that any facility with a COVID-19 outbreak has had availability of PPE to appropriately deal with the virus. Mr. President, Order. The, Labor Party, the Labor Party quite conveniently forget, Order. Quite conveniently forget that as we entered this pandemic, there was a global order. shortage Senator of PPE. Colbeck, uh, will please resume your seat. Senator Wong, on a point of order. A uh, point of order, direct relevance. Thank you, Mr. President. The comment to which the minister refers, the deplorable comment, is a comment of the Royal Commission, not the Australian Labor Party. I'd ask him to address the Royal Commission's description of a PPPE availability as deplorable. Senator, that is the Senator question. Wong, um, Two matters. I was having trouble hearing Senator Colbeck's answer because there were interjections from both sides of the chamber. Uh, the minister was getting to the point of PPE as you rose to your feet. Uh, I'm going to let him continue that because I cannot instruct him how to answer a question, but I believe that is directly relevant to the question asked. Senator Colbeck to continue. Thank you, Mr President. And it, and it, is, it is actually Order. a tragedy that not only do the Labor Party come into this place and mis Order. misrepresent our comments, Senator Wong, but they on misrepresent Order. the Senator comments— Colbeck, please Senator Wong, on Order. Senator Wong, on a point of order. He's deliberately uh, avoiding the question, Mr President. I ask the minister to return to the question. It is not directly relevant to speak about the Labor Party. He is being asked about his Royal Commission's comments. Deplorable comments. S Senator, Senator, oh, Senator Birmingham on the point of order. Mr President, Senator Wong had begun her interjections on Senator Colbeck before he had even started speaking in response to that question, before he had even said a single additional word, Mr President. And so, Mr President, in your previous ruling you did acknowledge it was hard to hear in the chamber. Uh, and if Senator Wong wants the Senator or the Minister to be able to address the question, then a little silence for them to do so would be appropriate. I Interjections are always interjections are always disorderly. I remind all senators of that. The senator is being directly relevant if he is talking about PPE, but he has not yet concluded a point before both interjections uh, and a point of order was raised. I need to hear him make this point before I can make any ruling on direct relevance. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. As I was about to say, the Labor Party actually even misrepresent what the Royal Commission said. Because what the Royal Commission said was that the practice of aged care providers in withholding PPE was deplorable. It made no comment about what we said or did, Mr. President. We at all times made sure that, the age, that aged care providers had adequate supplies of PPE for COVID-19 outbreak. Time for the answer has expired. Order on my left. Order, Senator Watt. Senator Watt, when I call you to order, the rule is to count to 10. Senator Wong. Senator Rennick. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. As we rebuild the order. Australian economy from the impacts of COVID-19, how is the Morrison government's plan for jobs ensuring we support our skilled workforce by investing in training and apprenticeships in this year's budget. The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business. Order. I'll call the Minister. 
Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Rennick for his question. And Mr. President, tonight the government will unveil one of the most significant budgets in modern history. This federal budget, as the Prime Minister and the Treasurer have said, is all about jobs. This federal budget is all about helping those who are out of work get into work and helping those who are in a job stay in a job. And Mr. President, from our very first stimulus package, the government has put in place support to ensure that our apprentices and trainees are able to stay on the job. Mr. President, we've done this through our supporting apprentice and trainee wage subsidy. This will now support around 180,000 apprentices and trainees across 90,000 businesses stay on the job because that is exactly where we need them to be. Mr. President, the Prime Minister has also said that the COVID-19 economic recovery will be a skills-led recovery. And that is why we have announced the introduction of a wage subsidy to ensure that we're supporting the commencement of 100,000 new apprentices and trainees. Colleagues, as of yesterday, businesses of any size, in any industry, in any geographic location in Australia, if they sign up a new apprentice or trainee, they will be eligible for a 50 per cent wage subsidy on wages paid from 5 October through to 30 September 2021. Mr President, whether it's in manufacturing, whether it's in housing, whether it's in construction, the arts or the mining sectors, our new wage subsidy gives businesses the certainty to hire, but it also provides a career path to aspiring young tradies and trainees. This latest measure now sees the Morrison government's continued investment to jobs and skilling Australians, with our total investment for this financial year now almost $7 billion. Senator Rennick, a supplementary question. As part of this record investment, how will the government's job trainer fund support essential short-term training to— Order. Sorry, Senator Rennick, please. At the rear of the chamber on both sides, Senator Watt, Senator McKenzie and others— Senator Watt, I said. I said Senator Watt. Um, I can't hear the question. I'm going to ask Senator Rennick to start again because I can't hear the question. I doubt the minister could. Senator Rennick, please start again. As part of this record investment, how will the government's job trainer fund support essential uh, short-term training to help Australians back into work in areas of skill demand? Senator Cash. President, well, the government has partnered with states and territories to put in place the $1 billion job trainer fund. This will provide Australians access to free or low-cost training in areas of demand so that they can get the identified skills and get into a job. Mr President, job trainer is central to Australia and Australians' economic recovery from COVID-19. What it will do is provide school leavers and job seekers with new opportunities and new skills to get into a job. And I'm very, very pleased to inform the Senate that we have launched job trainer agreements with Queensland, South Australia, Tasmania, Western Australia, New South Wales, the ACT, and we will shortly launch Job Trainer in the Northern Territory. And those states and territories have agreed to match the federal government dollar for dollar. Mr. President, Job Trainer will provide Australians with an additional 340,700 training places. And again, these are in areas of identified need so that they can get Order. into a job. Senator Cash, Senator Rennick, a final supplementary question. How does this much-needed investment in tonight's budget build upon the Morrison's government existing investment in our skills system to keep apprenticeships and trainees in training through the COVID-19 pandemic? Order. Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. What those on the other side fail to remember is they actually decimated vocational education and training in Australia. Uh, there was the greatest drop in apprenticeships Order. ever under the former Labor government. 110,000 people left apprenticeships in one year. They pulled out $1.2 billion in employer subsidies. That correlated with the drop. But who can forget, colleagues, Senator Birmingham in particular, who can forget vet fee help? Seriously, vet fee help totally, completely and utterly decimated the reputation of vocational education and training. And colleagues, to date, the taxpayer has invested or paid out in excess of $2 billion. 
$2 billion to students who were signed up by dodgy providers for courses that didn't exist, uh, given a laptop told to sign up. And guess what? There are still more students out there that are still suffering because of the failure of the former Labor government. In this financial year alone, Mr President, Order, we will Senator invest Cash, now $7 time for the billion. Has dollars. Expired. Senator Keneally. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. It's been reported that taxpayers have paid more than half a million dollars, or the equivalent of $56,000 a month, to the liquidators of a 40-bed aged care facility in Murchison, Victoria, to keep the facility open. Minister, how many residents have benefited from this funding to the liquidators of this facility since February this year? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the uh, facility at Murchison is actually not open. What this government has done is to support the, the administrator to maintain the administration of that facility pending an agreement to, uh, for another provider to purchase the facility, Mr President. Uh, this government understands that provision of aged care, particularly in regional Australia, is important so that locals can actually access uh, that resource. Uh, and, and because of COVID, Mr President, and the impacts of COVID on the aged care sector and wanting to ensure that a pr pr new provider coming in can actually uh, build a new, uh, rebuild that business. Mr President, we have been making uh, payments, uh, as the opposition indicate, uh, and I have to say I think it's a bit unreasonable to, try to average across the entire period uh, and, and make that a monthly number because it, uh, there was an initial ups upfront payment to support the facility through its administration, uh, but now to maintain the administration, Mr President. Uh, so, quite, so quite dishonest of the Labor Party, I must say. But we are supporting the administrator to maintain that administration pending the purchase and sale of the facility to another provider uh, and taking into account the impacts of COVID-19 on the aged care uh, sector uh, as a part of that process. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you. Minister, since the Aged Care Royal Commission was established, Australians have heard shocking stories of ants, ants crawling through wounds residents left in dirty nappies and providers begging for more staff. Minister, why did you choose to give this $564,000 um, grant to a liquidator to run an empty 40-bed aged care facility rather than investing this money in an aged care facility that is actually open and with residents who need help? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, again, Senator Keneally should have listened to my primary question before she asked the secondary question. The facility, the facility is not open. It's not being run. It's being maintained on a care and maintenance basis uh, in administration uh, while, while COVID-19 runs. And Mr. President, we have not, we have not denied any aged care provider support during the uh, COVID-19 uh, outbreak. Mr. President, in fact, we've invested more than $1.6 billion in the aged care sector during COVID-19. $1.6 billion have we, we have invested, and we continue to support this sector to ensure that they can provide all of the things that Senator Keneally talked about, and that's what we will continue to do. We have proactively worked with this sector. We have continued to invest $1.6 billion we've put into this aged care sector during just for COVID-19, Mr. President, just for COVID-19. So, Mr. President, Order, why Senator the Colbeck, time for the answer has expired. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. Minister, you lead an aged care system where there are 100 reports of assault and sexual assault every week, where more than 1,000 assaults go unreported every week, and with more than 2,000 complaints reported in just three months. Minister, why are you determined to waste half a million dollars on an empty aged care facility instead of funding the most basic services to help older Australians who deserve better? Senator Colbeck. Well, Mr. President, we understand, this government understands the importance of residential aged care in regional Australia and regional Australians having the capacity to access it close by. It's an important part of a local community, Mr. President. And so as that, as that facility is taken over when it is, it will be a major employer in that town. 
and we are in, we we in this government are looking to see the growth of jobs after the COVID-19 pandemic. It will be an important facility in that local community, Mr. President. And we continue to reform the aged care sector to make it better. That's why we called the Royal Commission, Mr. President. That's why we called the Royal Commission to ensure Order. that we have a forensic review of the entire aged care, care sector, Mr. President, and that we can actually make it better. And that's why we continue with the reforms that we have been undertaking while the Royal Commission continues, Mr. President. And that's what we will continue to do. We will continue to act in everybody's interests, not just sectoral interests like the Labor Party. Order. 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 Oh, Senator Seawitt has the call for a question. Thank Senator you, Mr. Seawitt. President. Mr. President, my question is to the Minister uh, for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. A minister, a constituent recently told me um, that surviving on JobSeeker was very difficult after the cut to the coronavirus supplement. They said, I don't think many politicians understand how heartbreaking it is to live in poverty. Constant financial stress is causing my mental and physical health to deteriorate. Without an extra $300, I'll have no way of paying for necessary appointments and medical assistance. Minister, if the government is funding tax cuts for millionaires, then why aren't you funding a permanent increase to the job seeker payment so that people aren't living in poverty? Why are you prioritising millionaires over the millions of Australians who are unemployed and underemployed? Yeah, Minister yeah. for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Seawitt, for, for your question. Um, well, clearly, one of the things that, that this government has done what, from what, right back in March when we realised that the coronavirus pandemic was going to have a significant impact on Australians, uh, and particularly Australians um, who find themselves out of work. And it was for that reason that we put in place the $550 supplement to support people, because we recognised, first of all, that, that there were no jobs out there, and secondly, that people were sent home, and basically we shut Australia down for two months. That ran for six months, as you would be well aware. Uh, and then in the July economic fiscal update, we made the announcement at that time that recognising that the jobs market was still shallow, that we were intending to extend that supplement for, at a rate of $250 through to the end of the year. But at the same time, recognising that we've seen jobs come back, I mean we've seen over five hundred thousand over seven hundred thousand jobs, I think it's seven hundred and sixty thousand jobs if I'm, I'm correct, Senator Cash, um, have come back. And so what we're seeking to do is to encourage Australians um, to test themselves by um, going back into the jobs market, even if it only means getting a part-time job. And that's why we put in the three hundred dollar per fortnight income free area so that those people who find themselves out of work but have got the opportunity to go and get a little bit of work can do so without losing any of their payment. So going through until the 30th, uh, 31st of December, uh, people in order. Australia— Order. Senator Seawood on a point of order. Point of order. Um, I do appreciate, before you preempt me, that I did do a little bit of a preamble, but I've, I've gone, it's gone for a minute and a half with a history lesson. With a history lesson. I don't need a history lesson. I asked about tax cuts over Senator, job seekers' okay. permanent Se increase. Senator Seawitt, you asked a question with loaded language at the end of an extensive preamble, um, which gives me very little ability to tightly hold the minister to direct relevance, because they can be directly relevant by addressing any part of the question, including your preamble. The minister is being directly relevant in this because of the nature of the question. Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, and one thing that this government will continue to do is that it will support all parts of our economy. Because, um, you know, despite what Senator Seawitt might think, um, you know, jobs don't grow on trees. They're actually created by profitable businesses. And so that's why we are making sure that whilst we maintain levels of elevated support for people who find themselves without a, a job, we also need to make sure that we stimulate our economy because the businesses that create the jobs will be the ones that get Australians who find themselves unemployed back into a better place. Yeah. Senator Seawood, a supplementary <coughs> question. Thank you, President. Um, Minister, there are millions of Australians who are unemployed and underemployed. What good is a tax cut if you don't have a job? Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President. And, and um, Senator Seawood, as I, I 
um, mentioned in my previous answer. Um, this government is targeting all sectors of the economy because we believe that the pathway out of the pandemic is by making sure that our entire economy starts working again. That means providing supports for people who find themselves unemployed, as I've said we do it with the extension of the coronavirus supplement through to the end of the year. And if at the end of the year we are still um, in need of additional supports for people who find themselves unemployed, then we will make those supports available at that time. But equally, we must open up our economy. We must put incentives in place by stimulating aggregate demand so people start spending money. Um, so this is not just a one-trick um, government. We have got a range of measures that we're going to put in place to make sure that all Australians play their role in making sure that our economy can, can return back to the, the strength um, and making sure that it happens as quickly as possible. And I think you'll see in tonight's budget a range of measures that go towards making sure that our economy rebuilds with Order. great strength. Senator Ruskin. Senator Seward, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Shu Yu, Mr President. We established in the COVID committee that the government hadn't done any modelling of the impact of cutting the coronavirus supplement. I ask, does the government have any understanding of the impact this reduction is having on people looking for work? No. No. Senator Rustin. Yeah, well, first of all, I would like to, um, to clarify that the government has not cut anything. The government has extended. In March, we put in place Order. a six-month coronavirus supplement at $550, and in July, we made the announcement that we were intending to extend it through until the end of the year. Um, Governments don't model individual measures, they model things in total. And tonight, the next big lot of economic modelling will be available for all to see because it will be the budget tonight. The last lot of economic modelling that was available to Australia, all Australians was through the July economic fiscal update. So I would say to you, Senator, uh, Senator Seward, the government is absolutely committed to supporting Australians who find themselves in a tough situation. We are absolutely committed to make sure that we continue to provide elevated levels of support to people who um, find themselves unemployed. But to characterise the extension of a payment as a cut is completely and utterly misleading. Order. Order. Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr President. My question is also to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. How is the Morrison government ensuring those escaping domestic and family violence situations have a safe place to go to and seek support? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and thank you very much, Senator Askew, for the question. Um, because I was really pleased uh, last week to be able to make an announcement in conjunction with the Assistant Minister for Community Housing, Homelessness and Community Services, um, Luke Howarth, uh, an announcement in relation to the $60 million Safe Places initiative. An absolute priority of this government is making sure that we keep all Australians safe and secure. And it is particularly important that when women make the very brave decision to escape domestic violence, that they have a safe place to go. So last week we announced the awarding of 40 projects across the country, which will create 700 new beds for women and children who are escaping domestic violence. Um, over a 12-month period, these new place safe places will support. 6,000 women and children who have had to leave their homes as a result of domestic violence. Um, this will account for both new and refurbished accommodations, which will provide them with a safe place to live and a safe place to sleep, but also, most importantly, to be able to access the, uh, the domestic and family violence services that these women need so that we can wrap around them in a coordinated way so that hopefully we can help them through what must be an extraordinarily difficult time. Um, in selecting the projects, we work with the state and territory governments around Australia, and I thank them all for the extraordinary amount of work and support that they have afforded us as we've gone through this very detailed process. Um, we made self-contained um, accommodation an absolute priority because that's the feedback that we got from the sector about what women and their children want when they have to start rebuilding their lives. Uh, it was great to be able to announce the project in, uh, in my home state of South Australia alongside Anglicare and uh, Nunga Minamana, the Indigenous Family Domestic Violence Provider in South Australia. And I look very much forward to seeing all of these projects completed over the next 18 months to support women escaping domestic violence. Senator ask you a supplementary question. Thank you. Minister, what does this investment mean for women and children in particularly, particularly vulnerable cohorts? Thank you. 
Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you very much, Senator Askew, for your follow-up question. Um, the government is making sure that the funding of these new safe places are in place in rural and regional communities, as well as in city areas, and also specifically targeting culturally and linguistically diverse uh, women. Um, from Rockhampton to Shepparton, from the Illawalla to the outer skirts of, of Perth, about 50 per cent of the projects that we will be funding um, in, this, uh, in this project will support women in rural and regional and remote areas um, who in the past have tended to have very limited options in terms of access of this kind of service. Um, unfortunately, we also know that Indigenous women are overrepresented in the statistics uh, in family and domestic violence, and that's why housing providers are working directly with organisations who are able to provide culturally appropriate services, such as the one that uh, we announced in Adelaide last uh, week, which is Aboriginal women providing support for Aboriginal women and their children. Senator, I ask you a final supplementary question. Thank you. How is the government ensuring that the providers are suited to work with at-risk women requiring emergency and crisis accommodation? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and thank you, Senator Askew. As part of a very complex and detailed application process, organisations were required to demonstrate that they had extensive history in providing accommodation and housing uh, services. But coupled with that, we also required providers to be able to make sure that they could demonstrate that they had the appropriate family and domestic violence specialist services, or if they didn't have it themselves, that they were partnered with such a service to ensure that the delivery of the service was centred around trauma-informed response, because we know women and children escaping domestic violence need these sorts of services. This means um, that we have long-term providers that are able to provide full wraparound services with organisations who are experienced in family and domestic violence, because we understand that, that women and children fleeing domestic violence need much support. Uh, this will help women and children find exit pathways to safe and secure ongoing housing, legal support, financial counselling in safe and culturally appropriate ways Order. as Senator they Rustin. rebuild their lives. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Right now, in the lead-up to the next bushfire season, the Bega community is crowdfunding to build proper toilets at their showground in case they need to evacuate their community again. Why is your government leaving bushfire victims to crowdfund for toilets in preparation for another crisis? when you have a $4 billion emergency response fund sitting untouched. The Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Well, thank you very much, Mr President, and thank you very much, Senator Watt, for his question. Um, look, clearly, um, the federal government has absolutely made commitments, and they have honoured those commitments to our bushfire-affected communities um, across Australia. And clearly, as we work our way through this COVID pandemic, I want to make sure that all Australians who are living in bushfire affected areas understand we have not forgotten the bushfire affected areas, just like we have not uh, forgotten our drought affected areas. But um, as part of the announcements that have been made in relation to the support that this government has made to bushfire affected areas, um, as you would be well aware, Senator Watt, um, you know, the, uh, the $2 billion that was made available, um, which, of which I understand $1.2 million has gone out the door. It has been spent. It has been allocated. Uh, and in addition to that, there was order. a further $650 Senator, million. Senator Watt, on a point of mm -hmm. order. On relevance, Mr President, my question was about the $4 billion emergency response fund, which has been unspent, not a single dollar spent. Um, I've allowed you to remind the minister of the question. Um, I'm listening carefully. She has a minute seven remaining. Order. It's not an opportunity for others to answer on behalf of the minister. The minister can answer. Thank Senator Watt and Senator Molan. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, um, uh, Senator Watt, um, I'm more than happy to take on notice the allegations that you're making around some fund that hasn't been um, spent at all, at all. However, what I would like to say to you, Senator Watt, is that $1.8 billion, $1 billion 
um, is rolling into communities and supporting individuals and, and has already gone out the door supporting bushfire impacted communities. That's in addition to a number of other measures, um, small business measures that have been put in place courtesy um, of uh, programs that have been operated by Minister Cash. Um, and, and to assist them, including things like in my home state, where funding has been available for the bushfires because of the smoke taint that impacted on the uh, on the, the, the grape growers. But I mean, Senator, the, the the amount of money that has been provided by the federal government in support of our bushfire affected communities um, continues to be made available to them as they go through the very difficult task of rebuilding, um, and we have absolutely not shirked our responsibility to make that money available. The money is going out the door. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Right now in Victoria's Tawang Shire, charities are building homes for bushfire victims who are still living in caravans 10 months on from the bushfires. Why has it fallen to charities to build homes for bushfire victims when the Prime Minister said, and I quote, Australians are resilient and want to rebuild, and we will be with them every step of the way? Senator Rustin. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you very much, Senator Watt, for your follow-up question. And as I made uh, in my and my remarks in response to your first question, this government absolutely will be with our bushfire victims every step of the way. That's why we have made available significant amounts of money. But I also, in response to your questions in relation to charities, I also want to commend charities out on the ground who have played an extraordinary role, both through bushfires and through the coronavirus, supporting Australians. And I'd also like to make a big shout out to our volunteers on the ground. The 7.8 million Australians who volunteer, who support Australians, but equally through those charities, through my own portfolio area, Senator, uh, Senator Watt, we have provided significant amounts of additional funding to charities to make sure that they were providing the emergency res uh, response services that people may need in these bushfire-affected areas. But you know, to come in here and suggest that there has been no money spent on bushfires is simply Order. incorrect. Order, Senator Watt. Final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Last year, the Morrison government announced a $4 billion recovery and mitigation fund to spend $200 million per year helping communities across Australia prepare for and recover from natural disasters. The next fire season is about to begin, and not a single dollar has been spent. Why is the Morrison government always there for the photo op and never there for the follow up? Senator Rustin. Well, first of all, I would uh, I would suggest that um, the comments made by the the, the, minute, uh, the, um, the member opposite in relation to photo opportunities. I mean, absolutely, this government takes very very seriously its responsibility to support all Australians when they find themselves in difficult times, which has been demonstrated time and time again. Uh, our response to bushfires, our response to fires. Uh, sorry, uh, to floods, our response to the coronavirus pandemic. We have order. provided a huge. Senator Wong, on a point of order. Both the primary and this question ask the minister res to respond to the assertion, the factual assertion, that the $4 billion, $200 million per year fund has not had a dollar spent. I'd ask the minister to respond to that question. I, I, I've allowed you to restate part of the question. Um, you'll recall, Senator Wong, the concluding part of the question was somewhat more open-ended, and the minister has, um, can be directly relevant to any part of the question she chooses. Senator Rustin. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Um, and as I said um, in my previous answer, I will take the specifics of the $200 million fund and the application of that in terms of the building of bushfire resilience for the forthcoming um, fire season, and I will. Turn to the chamber and provide that information. But the allegations made by the member when he asked the question in relation to the fact that the, this government has not been providing assistance to the Australian community that's been affected by bushfires absolutely have uh, supported all Australians who find themselves impacted by natural disasters, including Order, the Senator COVID pandemic. Rustin. Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Industry, Science and Technology, Senator Cash. Last Thursday, the Prime Minister addressed the National Press Club on the Liberal Nationals government's modern manufacturing strategy Order. for the future of— Sorry. Order. On both sides of the chamber there. Senator McKenzie, please recommence the question. Recommence the question. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Industry, Science and Technology, Senator Cash. Order. 
Order. I can't hear the question. Uh, I, I, I'm just, I asked interjections. I didn't name anyone across the chamber so I can hear the question. Order. El, Senator Wong, please. Senator Mackenzie. Third time lucky. Third time lucky, Mr. President. My question is to the minister, representing the Minister for Industry, Science and Technology, Senator Cash. Last Thursday, the Prime Minister addressed the National Press Club on the Liberal and Nationals government's modern manufacturing strategy for the future of manufacturing in Australia and acknowledged the particular importance of manufacturing to regional economies. As leader of the Nationals in the Senate, Order. I strongly welcome Order. a regional. Do we want to? Do we want to try it again? Please. I got to, you can recommence from your reference to as leader of Nas the Nationals in the Senate, Senator McKenzie. But I am going to say that I'll get Senator McKenzie to start from the top again if there continue to be interjections. Senator McKenzie. Uh, from the top, Mr. President. No, no, no. From, from your reference to yourself <laughs> as leader of the Nationals, I was quite comfortable with. Kashi, are you ready? Uh, okay. I strongly welcome a uh, regional focus of the plan, particularly given the accessibility of rural and regional Australia to essential Senator manufacturing Carr. inputs such as critical minerals and agricultural food and fibre. Can the minister inform the Senate on how the strategy contributes to our plan for jobs in our manufacturing industry, including in rural and regional Australia? Great the minister question. representing the Minister for Industry, Science and Technology, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Mackenzie for her question. And I do acknowledge uh, the commitment that she does have to uh, rural and regional Australia, uh, and in fact, we all do in the coalition government. Mr. President, the $1.5 billion modern manufacturing strategy uh, to be announced in tonight's budget will deliver for regional businesses and communities. Mr. President, around 30% of Australia's manufacturing businesses are located in regional areas. In fact, Senator McKenzie, they employ close to 300,000 people. And in fact, in regional towns throughout Australia, manufacturing businesses, Mr. President, are often the largest employer. They source their inputs locally, which means that they support other local businesses, including our primary producers. And that is why our manufacturing strategy is just so important for regional Australia. Mr President, it is a key part of our job maker plan and it will harness Australia's manufacturing capability to drive our economic recovery and, of course, our future resilience. Uh, Mr President, as we chart the road to recovery through COVID-19, the manufacturing strategy will create jobs that will last for the future, especially, Senator McKenzie, in regional Australia. The strategy itself recognises that we must play to our strengths. We have to target sectors that allow us to achieve scale and generate future growth. And that's why we're focusing our efforts on six new national manufacturing priorities. Resources, technology and critical mineral processing, food and beverage, medical products, recycling and clean energy, defence and space. And Mr President, as Senator McKenzie would know, many of these sectors are firmly based in regional Australia. The manufacturing strategy will put in place incentives to grow these sectors and support more resilient regional economies. Senator McKenzie, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Creating a competitive business environment is the first component of the Liberal and National Government's strong manufacturing plan. Can the minister please outline how the strategy will deliver to overcome competitive challenges faced by businesses in rural and regional Australia so that opportunities for competitive advantage and value adding can be created? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, we know that post-COVID, many people are now expressing uh, an interest in moving to the regions, and many businesses are seeing the value in establishing their operations in regional communities. Many of our regional universities already have a very deep and practical research ties with their local economies and with the local businesses, as does our premier scientific agency, the CSIRO. Mr President, these businesses are uniquely placed to provide the expertise to drive innovation, support commercialisation and facilitate business-to-business -business collaboration. That will drive the necessary scale. And Mr President, again, as Senator McKenzie knows, regional Australia has a strong track record of exporting our unprocessed resources and food. The plan that we have is about enabling the value add and the best place to do that is right where the products are actually produced. 
The coalition's modern manufacturing strategy is all about helping scale up our manufacturing Order. businesses Senator Cash, so they are better time able for the to answer compete. Has expired. Senator McKenzie, a final supplementary question. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Minister, for such a comprehensive answer. Can the minister also outline how the Liberal and National government's plan will build national resilience by securing sovereign capability in these manufacturing sectors, particularly in rural and regional areas, given the resilience they've demonstrated during the COVID-19 pandemic? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President. The resilience shown by our manufacturers, and in particular in regional Australia during COVID-19, has been essential to support our COVID-19 health response. Uh, there have been some remarkable stories, of which uh, we're all aware. Uh, but Medcon, this was our only manufacturer of surgical masks at the commencement of the COVID-19 pandemic. It's a family business, and they're based in Shepparton. Uh, their machines were invented by the company founder 30 years ago. With the government's backing, they will now produce more than 59 million masks by December. They're employing 25 more people and they're providing vital supplies to our national medical stockpile. And importantly, they've now increased our national capacity long term. And that is exactly the type of example we're aiming to build with our $1.5 billion modern manufacturing strategy. Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the Minister representing the Attorney General. Last Wednesday night at approximately 8 o'clock, about eight hours after I announced I wouldn't be supporting the government's higher education bill, veteran serving members and their families were given a slap down by the government that announced that Dr. Bernadette Boss is to serve as the Interim National Commissioner for Defence and Veteran Roadside Prevention. Dr. Boss served for seven years as a legal officer in the Australian Army. She saw operational service in East Timor and Christmas Island. In separate meetings with both the Minister for Defence and the Minister for Finance, I was assured in no uncertain terms that the Interim Commissioner would not, would not be a current or former military serving member in any way, shape or form. How on earth can that commitment be reconciled with the fact that the Interim Commissioner is actually a senior ranking brigadier? The Minister representing the Attorney-General, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Lambie for the question. And Senator Lambie, uh, as you'd be aware, and certainly as the Attorney General and the Prime Minister have made clear on a number of occasions, reducing lives lost to suicide is a priority for the Australian government. And Senator Lambie, like you, uh, all members in this chamber recognise that the death of any Australian Defence Force member or veteran is beyond tragic for the family and is deeply felt by the entire community. Preventing suicide amongst ADF personnel and within our veteran community is a critical priority for the Australian government. And Senator Lambie, uh, you are correct. On 30 September 2020, the Attorney-General did announce the appointment of Dr Bernadette Boss, CSC, as the Interim National Commissioner. Dr Boss has served as a magistrate and coroner in the Australian Capital Territory Magistrates Court. She also holds a PhD from the University of Sydney, and she's practised as a barrister in Australia and in the United Kingdom, primarily in the area of family law, criminal law, administrative law and human rights law. In terms of her credentials, Senator Lambie, Dr Boss also served in various command and staff roles in the ADF primarily as a reservist. She also worked in the health care system as a nurse. And, uh, Senator Lambie, it is the position of the Attorney-General and the government that Dr Boss's experience makes her well-placed to engage with families, friends and communities affected by the loss of a loved one to suicide. Order. Dr Boss will undertake the role of National Commissioner until legislation formally establishing the position has been enacted. Senator Lambie, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. I've heard from veterans already around the country that are in, up in arms that have already written this off as a stitch-up. I'm telling you what's coming from them. 
No trust. You've got a real problem here already, and we haven't even got the interim, interim commissioner started. Doesn't this government realise that in order for the interim commission to have any positive impact whatsoever, it needs to have the confidence and support of the community it seeks to serve, especially veterans and their families who have lost their own sons and daughters? Why did you not appoint someone independent of the institutions Order. they're charged with Senator investigating? Lambie, time for the questions expired. Senator Cash. And again, Senator Lambie, I will just reiterate that reducing lives lost to suicide is a priority for the Australian government. I've already confirmed that on the 30th September 2020, the Attorney General announced the appointment of Dr Bernadette Boss as the Interim National Commissioner. And I've taken you through the reasons as to why Dr Boss was appointed. Um, she is, though, as you know, she will undertake the role of National Commissioner until legislation establishing the position has been enacted. And certainly the government congratulates Dr Boss on her appointment. Senator Lambie, a final supplementary question. Mr President, part of the job of the interim commissioner is to make recommendations to the permanent national commissioner regarding the direction operation of that office into the future. The government has allowed 12 months for the interim commissioner to produce an interim report and 18 months for a final report. My question is whether this interim report period will be allowed to inform the operation of the national commissioner before they proceed, or will the government straight jump straight into action without first giving any pause to consider the findings and recommendations of that office? Senator Cash. Uh, well, again, thank you, Senator Lambie. And certainly at this point in time, the government is now going through the process of the introduction of the legislation and the consultation process of which you are aware. You would be aware that on the 27th of August, the Attorney General himself introduced the National Commissioner for Defence and Veteran Suicide Bill 2020 and the National Commissioner for Defence and Veteran Suicide Prevention Consequent Amendment Bill 2020 to the Parliament. You'd also be aware that at this point in time they had four weeks, uh, a four-week period of public and stakeholder consultation, and the public consultation, as you know, has now concluded on the 24th of September 2020. We've actually received over 90 submissions uh, from both a range of individuals and organisations. Uh, and it is also expected that some further outstanding submissions will now be provided. Uh, the government is currently considering all of the submissions. Order. Senator Cash, time for the answers expired. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. Page three of the Royal Commission's special report into aged care and COVID-19 states that, and I quote, the Australian government should publish a national aged care plan for COVID-19 and establish a national aged care advisory body. How then can the minister claim, as he did earlier in this question time, that, and I quote, the Royal Commission made no comment about what we said or did? Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. Mr President, uh, the, the comment that I made um, was with respect to the uh, question that was asked to me about withholding of PPE, uh, and 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 that that and the report uh, made made comment in that question with respect to the actions of uh, providers in withholding PPE. If not, you were the... not 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 with respect to what the government has had done. My reference, and again the dishonest misrepresentation of comments that I make in the chamber, and applying them to a completely different context. Uh, continues, Mr. President. Uh, my, I was directly answering and being directly relevant to a question that I ans uh, was asked with respect to the provision of PPE, and, and in the context of the question with respect to PPE, the, the, comment, uh, the comment of the Royal Commission was related directly, related directly to the actions of providers in withholding PPE from staff. And I agree with the Royal Commission, Mr. President, that it was deplorable if that's exactly what happened. Mr. President, so uh, uh, with respect to other elements of the Royal Commission's report, we have said we have said that we don't agree with the Royal Commission with respect to the plan. We said we've always maintained that we have a plan in place that we will continue to update as we learn more about the virus, how it operates, and how we should engage with the residential aged care sector. And we will continue to do that, Mr. President. We will continue to do that. Mr. President, and so it's dishonest for the Labor Party to come in here and both misrepresent what the Royal Commission said 
uh, and what I've said here in the chamber. Mr. President, we accepted all recommendations of the Royal Commission's report on COVID-19. We've said that we will. We have said that we will uh, respond to them on the 1st of December in, the, in this place, as the Royal Commission recommended. But, Mr. President, it would be nice if the Royal Com if, Order, if the Labor Party Senator Colbeck, were actually time honest the with answer respect to has the questions expired. they asked. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Minister, earlier in question time, you said the Royal Commission made no comment about what we said or did. Page four of the Royal Commission's special report states that, and I quote, there was not a COVID-19 plan devoted solely to aged care. Was the minister intentionally misleading the Senate, or has he not read the special report? Senator Colbeck. Mr. Mr. President, Senator I would Gallagher. refer Senator Gallagher, and again, the, the opposition should listen to the answer to the primary question before they just read out the question that we've been given for the, to the supplementary question. Mr. President, my, I, I, I specifically answered that question, Mr. President, uh, and, and, and the question that was addressed to me in the previous question was relating to the actions of a provider, not by the government, Mr. President. Uh, in Order. every respect of the comments that were made by the Royal Commission with respect to the government and the recommendations, recommendations that have been made, Mr. President. We have said we will we agree with the re, with those recommendations and we will implement them, Mr. President. That's what we've said and that's what we will do. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Page 25 of the Royal Commission's special report labels the guidelines provided to workers, and I quote, deplorable. Will the minister now correct the record and admit that the special report made specific com comments about his failure? Or will he continue to deny responsibility and mislead the Senate and the Australian people? Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, the Labor Party again misrepresents what the Royal Commission has said. They have so little respect for this place. Not only do they misrepresent what we have said, but they misrepresent what the Royal Commission has even said. Mr. President, we have said that we will accept every recommendation of the Royal Commission's report that was tabled last Thursday. That's what we will do. We will report to this place by 1 December, as recommendation one has said. We are well on the way to implementing four of the six recommendations, Mr President, and we have applied $1.6 billion to our plan to support the aged care sector through the, through the COVID-19 outbreak, a fact that was acknowledged by the Royal Commission in its report, Mr. President. So we will, as we've said in our response to the Royal Commission report last Thursday, accept all of the recommendations. We will report to this Parliament by the Order, first of Senator December. Senator Colbeck. Senator McMahon. Mr. President, my question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Can the Minister outline to the Senate the defence investments the coalition government is making in recognition? of the strategic importance of the Northern Territory to our nation. The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator McMahon for that question, and yes, I can, uh, but also thank you for your boundless passion for defence uh, in the Northern yeah. Territory and for their support, so thank you. Northern Australia is of profound and increasing strategic importance to our nation. Uh, the Territory is the gateway to the Indo-Pacific, looking out to some of our closest neighbours and friends across the Arafura and also the Timor Seas. As the Indo-Pacific becomes more contested, our region faces the most consequential strategic realignment in our generation. This government reaffirms its commitment to bolstering defence capability in the top end through both the 2020 Defence Strategic Update and also the 2020 Force Structure Plan. The Territory has played a key role in supporting more recent initiatives, including the US Force Posture Initiatives. And next year marks the 10th anniversary uh, of the Marine Rotation Force and these initiatives. The US FPI provides the ADF with improved training opportunities, closer interoperability with US forces and also supports US engagement in the Indo-Pacific. I witnessed this cooperation firsthand when I visited Mount Bundy last month uh, with Senator McMahon and also the US Ambassador Culverhouse to observe exercise Coolandong. 
Observing this high-end live fire exercise demonstrated once again the great interoperability between our forces and the clear benefit to both our nations. The fact that the rotation went ahead at all uh, despite COVID-19 is a great testament to the ADF's ability to be agile and also for our ability to work with the United States forces. At Osmin, we signed a statement of principles to uh, guide the next decade of cooperation on force posture uh, to ensure peace and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific. Thank you. Senator McMahon, a supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister outline the investments the government is making in response to our changing strategic circumstances, including at RAF Base Tyndall near my hometown? And I thank the minister for her recent visit. Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank you very much, Senator McMahon, through you, Mr. President, uh, for your hospitality and again for your great passion for the community of Catherine and also your support for our defence personnel uh, at RAF Tyndall. Uh, the Morrison government is investing over $8 billion in, over the next decade in the Northern Territory. As part of this investment, we are spending $1.1 billion uh, to further redevelop RAF Base Tyndall. These works will enhance defence air combat capability and also our ability to engage with allies and partners uh, through the conduct of joint exercises, including our enhanced air cooperation with the United States. The building tempo for the redevelopment is accelerating very rapidly, as we both witnessed. These works are in addition to the new facilities uh, to support the Joint Strike Fighter, which are now, now already complete. Just last month, I had, with Senator McMahon, the great privilege of turning the first sod for this $1.1 billion additional development. Order. And this Senator will develop Reynolds. 350 Time jobs locally. The answer has expired. Senator McMahon, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister advise the Senate how the government is maximising opportunities for Northern Territory businesses and workers to deliver jobs through these significant investments? Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And at the heart of our $8 billion investment in the Northern Territory is our nation's security. But wonderfully, it is also providing significant new job opportunities, uh, for at least for the next decade to come in the Northern Territory. And uh, this government has provided industry with significant long-term pipelines of investment. And I was up there recently, again meeting with the Chief Minister, with Senator McMahon, and also with business representatives to work together to ensure that we can provide a continuous pipeline and supply of jobs and investments in the Northern Territory. Uh, local industry capability plans, which were implemented by uh, Senator Payne, uh, who was the relevant minister at the time, are now realising very significant benefits to local industry in the Northern Territory. The Northern Territory's industry participation in major defence construction projects is now over 80 per cent, and it is continuing to rise. Hundreds of local jobs and millions of dollars are now flowing uh, into local businesses, and again, this Order. will continue Senator for Reynolds. many, many Time years to come. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. There you go. <laughs> Senator Keneally. Oh, Minister Rustin, beg your pardon. Uh, thank you, um, Madam, uh, Madam, Acting, uh, Madam Deputy President. Um, as the Minister representing the Minister for Government Services, I rise to respond to the three recommendations contained in the third interim report of the Community Affairs References Committee into Centrelink's compliance program that were adopted by the Senate on 2 September 2020. Protecting the integrity of the Commonwealth social security system is a core responsibility of any government. The proper administration and distribution of taxpayer funds to those who are eligible for them and the recovery of debts from those who are not is essential to fulfilling that responsibility. There is a long-standing principle that people should be paid correctly according to their individual circumstances. If people receive welfare payments they are not eligible for, it is only fair that they, that they pay the money back to the taxpayer. The government has made changes to the income compliance program when the government was made aware that the ATO average employment income data is not of itself sufficient to raise the social security debt, it acted quickly to fix the issue. As announced by the Minister of Government Services on 19 November 2019, Services Australia is no longer using income averaging alone to determine debts. 
As of 1 October 2020, 374,888 customers have received refunds or had their debts zeroed, with over $650 million refunded. In response to the Senate's resolution arising from the Community Affairs Inquiry Third Interim Report, uh, in relation to the resolution of the Senate adopting the recommendations of the Community Affairs Inquiry, uh, I want to assure the Senate uh, that the Minister for Government Services, myself, uh, together with the Department of Social Services and Services Australia, have full regard for the process of the Senate and continue to cooperate to the fullest extent possible with the Community Affairs References Committee's ongoing inquiry into Centrelink's compliance program. It was not the intention of the government or officers of Services Australia or the Department of Social Services to show disregard to the resolutions of the Senate in making public interest immunity claims. Further, I am advised that the failure of the Minister for Government Services to respond to correspondence from the Community Affairs References Committee of 6 April 2020 was the result of an administrative oversight. There was no intention to not respond, and the Minister for Government Services has regularly engaged with the Senate and its committees to explain the government's position in relation to public interest immunity. Updates and additional explanations have been also provided as litigation in relation to the clients program has evolved. In addition, government agencies and witnesses have responded to many hundreds of questions at hearings and on notice in relation to the design and implementation of the compliance program. The government does not make public interest immunity claims lightly and without careful consideration of the particular harm to the public interest. The government understands and accepts there is significant public interest in the matters before the committee. However, it would not be in the public interest to disclose some of the information that has been requested. The current class action before the federal court involves very significant and potentially high-value claims against the Commonwealth. The trial for this litigation has now been set down for hearing on 16 November 2020. The applicants' claims in this litigation have been amended several times since the litigation commenced. In considering these evolving claims, the government has continued to review its position in relation to the prejudices it might face in defending the claims if certain documents were made public. As a result, public interest immunity claims have been reiterated and further information about claims has been provided to the Senate Committee as necessary. While the Senate has considered some of the government's previous public interest immunity claims, circumstances have now changed. On 16 September 2020, the applicants were given leave to file a second further amended statement of claim. This amended statement of claim alleges that the Commonwealth had particular knowledge which goes to the legal understanding of the program. While not clearly particularised, the applicants have also named particular ministers and senior APS employees as having knowledge of particular matters at particular times. These are very serious allegations and are completely rejected by the government. Given the nature of the allegations being made by the applicants in the class action, the content and timing of any legal advice provided in relation to the income compliance program is directly relevant to the issues to be decided by the federal court in the proceedings. Disclosing the content of any legal advice or the date of it would obviously have the potential to register the Commonwealth's ability to defend the claims made by the applicants. The Commonwealth has discovered more than 200 documents in the class action over which legal professional privilege has been claimed. The federal court has upheld the Commonwealth's uh, legal professional privilege claims over every one of those claims that has been the subject to challenge. The position taken by the government is consistent with past practices over many years and under different governments. The former Attorney-General, the Hon. Gareth Evans, QC, told the Senate, nor is it the practice or has it been the practice over the years for any government to make available legal advice from its legal advisers made in the course of the normal decision-making process of government for good practical reasons associated with good government and also as a matter of fundamental principle. More recently, uh, the, Attorney General, uh, the former Attorney General, the Hon. George Brand, has said what it represents is both a statement of the universal practice of all Australian governments in federation in relation to legal advice, subject in exceptional circumstances to waiver, I acknowledge, but that is something that is seldom done and is never done nor should be done if the advice to the government is that the publication of the advice would prejudice the legal position of the Commonwealth. The third interim report has also commented on the executive minute to the Minister for Social Services dated 12 February 2015. The minute is the subject to a, particular, uh, to a public interest immunity claim by the government on the grounds that its disclosure would or could reasonably be expected to reveal the deliberations of Cabinet. Notwithstanding this, the third interim report adopted by the Senate seeks production of the minute. While the minute was provided to the Commonwealth Ombudsman, it is important to note that the limited disclosure to the Ombudsman in these circumstances is not consistent with the maintenance of Cabinet confidentiality. 
It should also be noted that, as a part of the class action litigation, the federal court upheld claims of public interest immunity in relation to such documents. This type of claim for public interest immunity in relation to materials supporting cabinet deliberations and decisions making has also been consistent practice when successive governments, and was supported by the then Minister for Climate Change and Water, uh, Senator the Honourable Penny Wong, when she stated last week the government opposed a motion for the Senate order for me to produce the departmental, departmental documents relating to management options for the lower lakes. The government did so on the basis of extensive precedents, including those set by the previous government, where advice to government of a similar nature, that is, for the purposes of government's deliberative processes, had not been provided on the order of the Senate. Those opposite cannot possibly take issue with that. And that was the 1st of September 2008. The third interim report noted that it may be appropriate to disclose the minute to the committee in camera. However, disclosing the deliberations of cabinet to opposition and crossbench senators would not main the work, maintain the well-established principle that the deliberations of cabinet should be able to be conducted in secrecy, nor would it preserve the freedom of deliberation of the cabinet. By making a public interest claim in respect of the minute, the government is doing no more than asserting a well-established right to protect the public disclosure of cabinet deliberations in the same way as has been done by past successive governments. A letter from the Minister for Government Services responding to these matters has also been provided to the President of the Senate. Thank you, Minister. Senator Seward. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to take note of the Minister's response to, in fact, uh, recommendation one, two and three um, of the Senate Committee, Committee Affair Committee's uh, third interim report. I mean, quite this this scheme has devastated hundreds of thousands of Australians, and the government won't even answer questions that relate to not what the legal advice is, but whether they actually asked for legal advice. I have actually the original questions that we asked in that original way the original public interest immunity claim that was again subject to the interim uh, the third interim report because we did not get a response to our follow up correspondence now we'll just touch on that very briefly um, we did in our third interim report comment on the fact that the minister had not responded to the committee's communication in April this year, uh, when we asked for uh, rejected, in fact, um, the uh, claims of public interest immunity, um, and wrote back to the minister. Now that email with that letter, I understand, uh, went missing. Now, I will just let the chamber know that I've checked with the committee and the correspondence was sent in the usual manner. Um, that's the manner that we've been corresponding uh, with ministers for some time. However, I, I, I do personally accept that mistakes happen, admin mistakes happen. Um, but we then subsequently referred to that correspondence quite a bit. And what there was no thought in government that perhaps we need to find out where this letter is and what that I was about to say a slightly naughty word um, what was going on why was the committee carrying on I was um, uh, very concerned that we hadn't um, heard about uh, hadn't heard back um, from the minister having said that I want to go back to what is fundamentally the problem here and that is. Apparently, no one in government thought to check whether trying to claw hundreds of millions of dollars back from people that are on low incomes and that are income support, whether that was actually based on a legal premise or not, whether it was actually legal. And of course, it turns out it wasn't. There was no legal foundation for them to be claiming back this hundreds of millions of dollars that affected hundreds of thousands of Australians, causing them a great deal of distress. The sorts of questions that were asked 
is, is the department satisfied that its net to gross calculations provide a legal basis for raising a debt? Well, would have thought that was okay. Now, there's a series of questions that were asked about uh, how many times the department um, asked or obtained legal advice from a range of government agencies. Solicitor General, the Australian government solicitor, uh, and there's a number of them. We can't even ask how many times the department asked for it, or the, or the minister, for that matter, asked for that legal advice. Does that mean they didn't actually ask for it at all? Or does it mean that they asked for it and didn't get the answers that they wanted? They ignored the advice, or they just didn't care about the impact this program would have. They were so desperate, so desperate to balance the bottom line on the backs of people trying to exist on a payment, let's remember in this place, on a payment that is below the poverty line. And then the minister, in her response just then, talked about when the government was made aware that the H using the ATO information for income averaging was unlawful, when they were made aware, they never thought that they needed to go and seek legal advice. Well, the Community Affairs Committee rejected the concept that it was not in the public interest to release this information. We rejected the public industry, the claim for public interest immunity, because we don't agree that it's not in the public interest for the community to know this information. Because we have sat for hours and hours and hours hearing the impact of this scheme on Australians who were impacted by this scheme. Those of us on the committee have sat, and I've been through, I think it's now three inquiries dealing with this matter, and I've sat and I've heard people's accounts of the impact on their lives. People in tears. People's mental health badly affected. People who have, I've heard from people's families, from people who directly believe, who believe that very directly robo debt led to that person taking their own life. And I'm being trying to be very careful when I talk about this because I'm aware of triggering. And for people that read this or are listening, please, if you are impacted by this or need some help, reach out to Lifeline. But the fact is that the, this had a detrimental impact on people's lives. People have lost loved ones. People have had their mental health permanently affected. People talked of shame, of how they feel demonised, of how they thought that, the, that people thought they were cheating, all based on a lie. Because this was not lawful. This process was not lawful. And the government says the community has no right to know whether they knew whether it was legal or not. Well, no, it wasn't sufficiently lawful. It was insufficiently lawful. It was unlawful. It was against the law. And yet the government tries to hide behind public interest immunity that it's not in the interest of the, in the, interest of the community. Well, it's very strongly in the interests of the community. 
And then they try and hide behind because a, a, a minute went to the government, went to cabinet, trotting it through cabinet means that they can't give it to us. They sprinkle the cabinet dust. Yes, sprinkle the cabinet dust, Senator Patrick, around it. They did not directly tell us that it led, that it will impact on the, or it did impact on the del deliberations on cabinet, and giving us the minute would not release and not tell us what the deliberations of cabinet were. It is very important to this inquiry that we actually have a look at that minute and that we see what was in that minute, because we all know that while the government has finally paid back the, most of the people who were owed money from this illegal scheme, they've only paid back that going back to 2015. They're not going back before 2015. Now that's why this committee that's inquiring into Centrelink's compliance program needs to see that information so that we can actually get a true look at this. And because the government's not releasing that information, which is why we are and many other people are calling for a royal commission into this debacle. It is only that forensic review that will identify what went Thank on you, here. Thank you, Senator. See what your time has expired, Senator Patrick. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the minister's explanation. I might say I listened very carefully to the minister as she made her explanation, and uh, my, my assessment is it was legally insufficient. Um, Senator O'Neill, are you seeking a point of order? Um, no, Chair. I was seeking the call. I believe it's only half an hour allocated to the Yes, debate. no, Senator Patrick was up well before. Uh, you. Thank you. Okay, so, Sorry, Senator um, Patrick. Thank you, um, uh, Madam, Acting, uh, Madam, Madam Deputy President. Um, the minister ought to know that uh, the issue as to whether or not a House can call upon legal advice to be tabled has been settled uh, in the Supreme Court of New South Wales in the matter of Egan and Chadwick. There is no question that, uh, that, the, uh, that a House who has responsibility of oversight of government decisions has the ability to call any document before it that is relevant to the course of action that the government may have taken uh, in respect of uh, uh, discharging its functions. It, uh, so it's entirely appropriate that if a committee of the Senate, or indeed the Senate itself, makes a call for those documents, that those documents be tendered. Of course, you do have a right to advance a public interest, interest immunity. I did listen and I heard what you said about the matter that is currently before <clears throat> the courts. Um, but there's also another case that would protect you in this instance, and it's the matter of British American Tobacco Australia Limited versus the Secretary of the Department of Health and Ageing in the federal court, and no less than Chief Justice Keane, as he was then, made a, a decision that basically says if you wander into this chamber and you table legal advice as you are required to by way of order of production, you have not waived legal professional privilege. And indeed, nothing that has been tabled in the Senate, nothing that has been said in the Senate can actually be used in that court. They can't draw inference from it. They can't even use the information to establish truth. It's an important principle that allows us to do our work while the courts are permitted to do their work. So there can be no harm in tabling those documents. They cannot be used in the court case. It is not proper and the court would not permit it. Section, uh, section 16 of the Parliamentary Privileges Act, because there was some dispute over this, the Parliament, in fact, uh, uh, decided to make uh, to, to legislate to make it very clear to the courts that they can't use this. Although I will note that in a matter I've got before the courts, that uh, that uh, government lawyers have tendered some some um, uh, statements made in the uh, in, in the Senate, and uh, that will no doubt become a matter of privilege uh, shortly if uh, the attorney doesn't intervene properly. So um, I do not accept 
uh, when you roll out a list of ministers that have in the past said that legal professional privilege can, uh, can, you know, sh shouldn't be tabled, they are simply ministers making statements. That are, that they're making statements that are inconsistent with law. And we do have to comply with law here in this chamber. And I'll go to the second claim that you, you're, you're making, uh, and that is in relation to cabinet in confidence. And I'll draw your attention to the High Court case, the Northern Land Council, where the court has ordered that in, in, in exceptional circumstances, the court can order the production of cabinet documents. They are executive documents, not parliamentary documents, and the court can order the production of cabinet documents uh, in special circumstances, and particularly in circumstances where uh, uh, life or liberty uh, might be at stake, or certainly, certainly uh, someone's liberty might be at stake. And you might actually note that that is being uh, dealt with right now uh, in the ACT in the matter of uh, Kaliri, uh, or the Commonwealth in Kaliri, uh, the Witness K matter. Okay, and we'll, we'll probably see the court will make a judgment between the balance of the public interest uh, and the interests of justice. And the principle is, and I, uh, I listened to Brett Walker give a, uh, a presentation, a lecture uh, here, the principle uh, that uh, a court could, in certain circumstances, require the production of cabinet in confidence documents, makes it uh, uh, equally the case that the Senate could. There's no, nothing to distinguish uh, uh, that, provided a balance is, is uh, found in favour of the Senate requiring their production, and that's, that is what has already happened here. It's also not helpful that, um, in, in, in advocating that there would be harm caused. It's not helpful when the government makes ambid claims, uh, cavalier claims, over cabinet in confidence. We have the, currently a very bizarre situation where the COVID committee has been asked, uh, has, has asked for documents, minutes of the AHPPC. And it turns out the claim by this government is that a meeting of doctors is a meeting of a subcommittee of cabinet. That is just truly bizarre. And I am in discussions with the clerk at the moment Clark's office, uh, in relation to an FOI, I did for exactly the same documentation, where the department knew I would challenge them legally, and they dared not make that claim. They properly made a claim of uh, of intergovernmental documents, and uh, uh, that will come down to the balance of public interest. Okay, so they've, they've made a, a a claim that is a reasonable claim. I don't think it, it will stand the test. But they never tried on the cabinet in confidence claim. In the last sitting week, I stood in this chamber and I waved in front of everyone a document that I had obtained under FOI that had been denied the Senate because it was purportedly cabinet in confidence. In actual fact, it turned out not to be. So, whilst I accept the principle that uh, there is benefit in uh, protecting cabinet documents, collecting, uh, protecting the collective responsibility of cabinet, we have a real, really difficult issue before us in that the government regularly makes claims that are simply not believable or will not stand the test of a challenge either with the Information Commissioner or in the AAT. And if you continue to make cavalier claims, uh, if you continue to cry wolf, of course the Senate gets to a point where it simply no longer believes the claims that are being made by government. You undermine the doctrine yourself by making these cavalier claims. They're inappropriate. The minister should table the legal advice and the minister should table the cabinet documents as ordered by the Senate. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy uh, President. Senator Abetz, is 30 minutes for this for taking note of the response? Yes. Do you take the call to the other side of the chamber, or do you only take the call from one side of the chamber? Uh, well, I thought Senator O'Neill 
jumped uh, almost at the same time as Senator Patrick, and I did indicate to her that I would go to her next. So I'm giving the call to Senator O'Neill. Deputy President, but uh, I'm asking whether that is the appropriate course of action, because as I understood the proceedings in this place, you bounce the call from side to side and uh, not allow just one-way traffic in relation to matters of this nature. Well, in actual fact, Senator Obetz, you would normally go between the government and the opposition, mm. and I uh, didn't do that because Senator Seawitt sought the call first. So I thought, it, and after Senator Patrick jumped, I thought it only fair then to go to Senator O'Neill. So. so the fairness is 3 nil, and the government does not well, uh, the government has get the responded. response. Uh, thank you. Senator Keneally. In respect to uh, Senator Abatz's point of order, uh, his point would make sense if Senator Patrick or Senator Seward were a member of the opposition, but they are thank not. Thank you. I'm not intending to sit Senator O'Neill down. Continue, uh, Senator O'Neill. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Chair. And what we are discussing here this afternoon, for people who might have just been picked this up and who are listening, uh, who care about this matter, is a complex discussion about procedures, but it's all really about robo-debt. And what we see here this afternoon from the minister who is, is, is now departing, I think that's a natural turnover point, uh, so I won't uh, make a point about her leaving. However, this is another scene in this government's determination to cover up what's gone on with robo-debt. The senator made claims about proper administration and about fairness, but she couldn't even bring herself, couldn't even bring herself to actually name the matter that is being discussed today, which is robo-debt. And to be clear, robo-debt uh, was the matter over which the government had to be dragged kicking and screaming to say a very insincere sorry. And to this day, they continue to acknowledge that this scheme was responsible for the terrible impacts on mental health that were well described by Senator Seward in her contribution. And I acknowledge her as the chair of committee, and that is why I thought it was appropriate to exceed the first opportunity to speak to her. Uh, I also want to put on the record what Australians know, but this government continues to deny, is that the horror of the encounter for so many Australians with robo-debt caused such incredible anxiety, distress, financial burden for families that it is now a public record, a matter of public record, that family members attribute the loss of life, the total lack of hope that so overcame some Australians, particularly young Australians, that they felt they couldn't go on. And in the circumstances created by their own government, they uh, took their own lives. I want to acknowledge Kath Madgwick, mother of Jared and Jenny Miller, mother of Rhys, who came forward and enabled me to put on the public record their, the horror of their experience, their interactions with this government. And today, if you listened to the minister's comments after having been called here to the chamber by the Senate to answer these questions, you hear platitudinous comments, a failure to acknowledge the harm of robo-debt, a failure to call it by its proper name, known to Australians in every state and territory of this great country. The reality is we still, we still don't know, because this government refuses to answer questions, who came up with the legal advice for this unlawful scheme that the government still hang its ha hang, hangs its hat on, bogus public interest immunity claims. So, For those who don't understand what a public interest immunity claim is, in simple layman's terms, it's when the government says, look, this information is so precious, it's so important for the country, that we really can't talk about it. Just trust us, 
We're doing the right thing by you. Except hundreds of thousands of Australians already know the government was not doing the right thing by them with regard to robo-debt. We know that the government has had to accept at the end of last year that they acted unlawfully. And so much do they want to deny their responsibility, they can't even get the word unlawful out of their mouths. They had to come up, they had to coin their own magic phrase, legal insufficiency. What a con job that is. Any straight-talking, plain-talking Australian knows the truth. Robo-debt is a scheme of the government's making, and they refuse to answer questions about what they did advice that they received, and it is in the public interest for us to know. They stuffed it up royally. They should show us the evidence that they used to support their claim to establish it. But they won't. And what we've got from the government here today is more resistance, more obfuscation, more delay, more denial. And the only way, the only way we're going to get to the bottom of what happened is to have a royal commission. We cannot do with more spin from these ministers and their departmental staff. They have scorned the scrutiny of this chamber, the Senate of Australia. They do not think they're accountable to the Australian people who are represented here by senators of every state, here to hold the government to account. And we're holding the government to account on a very important matter of import to hundreds of thousands of Australian families. Make no mistake, this is the biggest social security scandal of a government in Australia's history. It's not the sort of history that you really want to be making as a government, but this is a scandal of extraordinary proportion. Hundreds of thousands affected nearly a billion dollars have had to be paid back to Australians, illegally taken from them by their government. And as I said in my opening remarks, countless Australians suffered emotional and mental anguish, financial despair, terrible financial impact, and all to prop up the Liberals' bottom line. And let's not forget who was the treasurer when this decision was made none other than the Prime Minister of Australia. Now, what terribly awful questions could we possibly be asking that are so dangerous for the country that this government simply cannot answer, them, that they keep saying it's not in the public interest to answer? These are the questions. This is what we want to know on behalf of the Australian people. We want to know, and we have a right to know, who came up with the idea for the scheme. We have a right to know and we want to know what due diligence was done and what advice was obtained by this government prior to its implementation. And those opposite will laugh and mock this process, but the reality is they're the ones that unleashed robo-debt. They're the ones who chose to change the way in which debt was recovered. Order. When did the government? This is what we want to know. When did the government first learn that its robo debt scheme was unlawful? And why didn't they stop it the minute that they knew? You have to ask the question: Did they know it was unlawful all along, and just went, "Oh God, here's a few billion we can scrape back. Doesn't matter if we hurt a few Australians on the way through. Let's just grab the money," because that's the question that lingers at the moment. We want to know, and we have a right to know, did the government settle legal challenges and choose not to appeal adverse AAT determinations in order to avoid a court ruling that the scheme was unlawful? Because what we do know is that some brave Australians who could handle the paperwork warfare actually went to the AAT, and they had the AAT, a, tri a tribunal, fined for them against the government. The government knew it. It didn't happen on just one occasion. It happened on multiple occasions. The government knew this, and instead of going, oh my, we, we might have a bit of a problem with this, we better sort it out, they did what they're doing today. They went all quiet. The big cover-up, the big hush-up. We want to know, for the Australian people, and we have a right to know, how was such a fundamentally and obviously flawed scheme allowed to continue for how, as long as it did? 
We want to know, and we have a right to know in total, how much has this failed scheme cost the Australian taxpayer so far? In total, how many debts have been issued under the illegal robo-debt scheme cooked up by this government? And how many law-abiding citizens, and especially vulnerable Australians, have been harmed by robo-debt? We know that the minister still refuses to respond to the Community Affairs References Committee. The letter has been uh, the subject of some discussion this afternoon, and uh, we can hope it was an administrative error, but sadly I fear it was just another part in the game, the cover-up game that this government plays. Scott Morrison and Stuart Robert need to rule out the possibility of a robo-debt 2.0 and the chance that they would continue with their old practices, develop a new method to harass the Australian people that have already been traumatised. Human services should be about human services. It shouldn't be about an out-of-control algorithm with no safeguards or oversight. I am constantly shocked at the disregard this government has for this august chamber and through that their disregard you, for Senator the great O'Neill, people of Australia. Time has expired. Um, I'm advised, Senator Rebecca, you've got three minutes. Thank, Thank you, you uh, Deputy uh, President. There are two issues here. One is the issue of reclaiming welfare payments, which was implemented, if I might say, in a suboptimal manner by the department. And I'm on public record as saying that, and I'm also on public record as saying that I helped achieve good outcomes for many of my fellow Tasmanians that had been unfairly targeted by an officious letter and uh, by a scheme that was uh, less than um, consumer friendly. That said, can I remind Senator O'Neill that this scheme was in fact an add-on to a labour devised scheme. So if she wants to talk about, if the Honourable Senator wants to talk about who implemented the scheme and started it all off, she need look no further than the mirror of the Australian Labor Party. But the real issue here is not the scheme and the problems it occasioned to far too many Australians, but the principle of public uh, uh, um, uh, interest immunity. That is a principle well and truly established, well and truly accepted by governments of both persuasions and usually attacked by desperate oppositions. And from time to time, my side of politics has fallen into that category as well, regrettably. And that is why these matters need to be considered with a degree of maturity and reflection. And you've got to ask the question, is this a principle that we actually want to undo? A principle that has withstood the test of time. And Senator Patrick, yes, he spoke for 10 minutes about how good he was with all the cases he's raised and how forensic he's been, but I would just invite him to have a look at a couple of High Court cases. One is Esso and the taxation, uh, Commissioner of Taxation, and the other is uh, Grant and Downs. And look, uh, I take Senator Seward's passion in relation to the issue of the reclaiming of welfare payments, but I would invite her and all other honourable senators to be able to divorce that issue from the principle of uh, the public interest immunity, which has served this country and this body politic, and might I add, not only in Australia but elsewhere as well, exceptionally well. It is something that does protect uh, the rightful business of government, even in circumstances where it frustrates an opposition. And that is something that if you have a mature reflection on these matters, you understand why the principle was established and why attorneys as diverse as Senator Evans and Senator Brandis have accepted Thank the you, principle. Senator Betts, your time has expired. So the question is that the, the motion to take note of answers as moved by Senator Seawitt be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We will now move to motions to take note of answers. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Keneally. Thank you very much, Madam uh, Deputy President. I rise to take note of answers given by Senator Colbeck in response to questions asked by myself, Senator Sheldon and Senator Gallagher. Well, 
There might be some fans in this chamber of that great uh, British comedy, Yes, Minister. You might remember that episode, The Compassionate Society, where Minister Jim Hacker found out that his government had been funding for 15 months a hospital that had admitted no patients. Well, today in the Australian Senate, we had our own version, where Minister for Aged Care, Richard Colbeck, admitted that his government had been funding for eight months a residential aged care facility that had not admitted one resident. Now, I gotta say, the British show was funny. This would be funny if the consequences weren't so tragic. Now, quite frankly, taxpayers have paid more than half a million dollars for a 40-bed facility where no one is in any of the 40 beds. That's right, in the middle of an, a, a global health pandemic where we have had 673 people die in residential aged care facilities, this government decides it's a good use of taxpayer funds to spend half a million dollars on a residential aged care facility that has no residents. Now, Jim Hacker, that, that minister of Yes Minister, he was a, fic, he was a fictional character, a fiction character. I know, I might, I'm so excited, Senator Dunham, by this, uh, this, uh, this reference to Yes Minister, which you are too young to remember. You are too young to remember, Senator Dunham, but I'm sure the Senator Betts remembers it. I remember it. Senator Stoker probably remembers it, because here's the thing, Jim Hacker was a famous fictional character, fiction character. But what do we have? We have the all too real Senator Richard Colbeck. Jim Hacker, he was bumbling, he was accident prone, he occasionally got it right, um, but he was an object of derision. He made a mockery out of being a minister, but he was fiction. He was fiction. Richard Colbeck is all too real. And what is also all too real is this government's neglect of residential aged care. Minister Richard Colbeck makes a mockery out of being a minister for aged care. Today in question time, when he was confronted with the evidence, for example, in, under Minister Richard Colbeck's care, I use that word advisedly, of the aged care sector, we have had shocking stories of ants crawling from wounds, residents left in dirty nappies, providers begging for more staff. We have heard that there are 100 reports of assault and sexual assaults every week. More than 1,000 assaults go unreported every week, and more than 2,000 complaints recorded in just three months. What does this minister do? Does he apologize? Does he take responsibility? Does he resign? No. He does what this government always does. Find someone else to blame, leaves Australians behind, takes no responsibility. This government so good on the announcement. They're always there for the announcement in the photo op, never there for the follow through. Back in March, the Prime Minister stood up and waved around in the courtyard what he said was a plan, what he said was a plan for residential aged care. And he said that the federal government will be responsible for residential aged care during this COVID pandemic. Those are his words, not mine. What did the Royal, care, the Royal Commission into Aged Care say last week? There was not a COVID-19 plan devoted solely to aged care. This isn't just some claim by political opponents. This isn't just some complaint made by family members obviously distressed by the sickness and death of their loved ones. This is the finding of the Royal Commission appointed by the Prime Minister. And what does the Minister for Aged Care do in the chamber today? He rubbishes the Royal Commission. He disregards and rejects their findings. This is what the Morrison government always does, though. Finds someone else to blame, leaves people behind, always there for the announcement, never there for the follow-through. We have here 673 older Australians dead. Today, in question time, the minister said that the Australian Labor Party in asking these questions was just pandering to sectoral interests. I tell you what, older Australians are the sectoral interests I am happy to be associated with. The Minister for Aged Care should look thank after you, them too. Thank you, Senator Keneally. Your time has expired. Senator Abbott. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, Madam Deputy President, 
We know that the Australian Labor Party's ongoing attacks on Minister Colbeck are designed for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to distract attention from the deaths and disaster in aged care in one state, Victoria. If Senator Colbeck is to be held responsible for aged care Australia-wide, why is it that we've only had these COVID outbreaks in the state of Victoria? Could it be because of Premier Daniel Andrews and his negligence and the way that he and his government, and they can't remember who, employed these contractors and did not keep the Victorian community safe? Because if Minister Colbeck is to be held responsible, why didn't he muck it up in my home state of Tasmania, or New South Wales, or Queensland, or the Northern Territory, or Western Australia, or South Australia? Why is it that there is only this one pocket on which the Australian Labor Party continually seeks to refer us to, and that happens to be in the state of Victoria? And we know why the outbreak has occurred in the state of Victoria because of the incompetence of the state Labor government in Victoria. So let's not have any of this nonsense that somehow Minister Colbeck ought to be held responsible in circumstances where every Australian knows that the tragic consequences of Premier Andrews has led to the statistics that the Australian Labor Party seeks to enjoy crowing about very distastefully. But in circumstances when you look at the numbers, I simply ask, what are the numbers emanating from the state of Victoria? And why is it that Senator Colbeck should somehow be held responsible for Victoria? I think we all know what happened in Victoria, why it happened, and it would be good and decent of the Australian Labor Party in this place, rather than try to do Premier Andrew's dirty work, accept the responsibility that it was state Labor's fault in Victoria. Now, in relation to the misquoting of the Royal Commission, let's be exceptionally clear, Madam Deputy President. Labor purposefully, I would submit, sought to say to the Senate that somehow the government's behaviour was deplorable. Indeed, the Royal Commission never said the government was deplorable. In fact, the only time the Royal Commission used the word deplorable in their special COVID-19 report was on page 25, when they were referring to the alleged practice not of the minister but of a provider. And allow me to quote the full sentence. Insufficient supplies of PPE and infection control training for the aged care workforce were the subject of evidence in the form of union surveys and accounts. We heard of workers being told they could only use one glove rather than two and a guideline at a residential aged care facility that only permitted two masks per shift. This is deplorable. Clearly not a reference to the minister, clearly not a reference to the government, clearly a reference to a provider. And so for the Australian Labor Party to come into this question time to so egregiously misrepresent that which the Royal Commission has provided to the public, might I add a Royal Commission deliberately set up by this government because of its concern for aged care residents, because of some of the stories emanating from the aged care sector, and we as a government wanting to get things right, having established the Royal Commission, we are adopting and implementing their recommendations. And so what does Labor do? They come in here, one, misquote the Royal Commission, and then most egregiously so, and I don't know why, but they seek to defend Premier Daniel Andrews in Victoria for his neglect. And I just hope that the newly 
implemented industrial manslaughter charges will apply you, Senator, to the Victorian Labor expired. government. Senator Sheldon. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Acting, uh, Deputy President. I'd like to speak on uh, to take note on answers by Senator Colbeck. And just uh, as I go to those answers, I'll just address some of those matters that were raised because quite clearly knew much house. Quite clearly the overseas experience of what was happening in aged care. The government learnt nothing from it. They learnt nothing from those deaths that were occurring right around the world and the front page of every newspaper before any of this crisis uh, got a hold to the degree in our aged care system. There's a consistent position from the Royal Commission. And as this government and the Assistant Commissioner clearly pointed out, this go the, assisting the Commission, uh, the, um, Peter Rosen uh, uh, pointed out, and that is that there was a very clear degree of hubris and self-congratulations by the government. They failed to turn around and listen to what had happened. They failed to act. They failed to take responsibility, and even now, they won't take responsibility for a sector they are responsible for. Funding, oversighting, implementing arrangements. And they still fail that test after these many months. Let's look at this a bit, a bit deeper. Now, we're starting to get to know how the Prime Minister operates here, Scott Morrison. They know that he likes to make a flashy announcement. There, but of course, we also know there's never follow up. He likes to not show up when there has to be taken responsibility. He famously accused himself, excused himself from responsibility for the safety of Australian people during the bushfire crisis. Remember that? He took himself secretly off to Hawaii, and then in defence he said, they know I don't hold a hose, mate. What a great defence. Then we would take, he wouldn't take responsibility for the Ruby Princess cruise ship debacle. In March, just three days after he said that cruise ships would not be permitted to enter Australia except under the bespoke arrangements, I quote, bespoke arrangements under the, the Australian border force, we now have more than 20 people have died, hundreds were infected, and we now know that these passengers flew all over Australia taking COVID with them, even after our airlines pleaded for the passengers to be identified fell on deaf ears. And now the Prime Minister would like us to deflect responsibility for the aged care crisis in Australia, when aged care has always been and will continue to be a Commonwealth responsibility. The Special Aged Care Royal Commission report on COVID-19 was released last week and the failure of this government to take responsibility for aged care has been laid bare. There can be no excuse because all we knew what had happened to aged care facilities in other countries, as I said before, and New March House. They failed to protect the most vulnerable in our community, and they continue to fail. They have no specific plan to protect them. We now must face a national tragedy at their hands, at their feet. But it's our loved ones that are paying the price. It's our families and our communities paying that price. It's the workers in those industries that are paying the price, not the minister, not the prime minister. Thousands of family members are forced to say goodbye to parents, grandparents, loved ones, uncles and aunts without being able to hold their hand. The Royal Commissioners should be noted cannot so easily be sidelined by the Prime Minister or by his minister, since he chose those commissioners. The Royal Commissioners have slapped down the claim by the minister that there was a plan for aged care. They said, and I quote, there is a clear need for a defined, consolidated national aged care COVID-19 plan. It's clear. There's also said that at the peak of the pandemic, the aged care regulator was missing in action and provided no written guidance to the aged care sector in the period between June the 20th and August the 3rd. There it is, Deputy President, in black 
and white. My message to this government is this. The six recommendations, implement, it, implement them before the pandemic hits even worse. And implement arrangements that will actually improve the conditions for working people. Make sure that one in three aren't trained, Thank you, Senator but all Sheldon, are trained. Your time has expired. Senator Stoker. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, while I always enjoy Senator Sheldon's contributions, I'm not super clear what that contribution was about. I mean, it veered from one moment to talk about um, aged care to veer at another moment to talk about something entirely different. And um, I'm going to focus on the aged care point because I think that's what he's getting at. Um, but I've got to say, amid all the gumph, <laughs> it's pretty hard to make sense of it. But the, the truths are these, and uh, they're, they're what nobody wants to talk about in, in the field of aged care. Um, uncomfortable truths, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, it might sound easy for someone of my age to say, um, but I'm quoting someone very wise, and um, that's my grandmother. And she always says, getting older ain't easy, and getting older ain't for sissies. <laughs> now, she's got a sense of humour, my grandmother, um, but it points out, I think, something really very real about this time in life. Aged care is deeply challenging. Nobody really wants to be in aged care. Everybody would rather be living independently and healthy without the circumstances that force them to come to require aged care. And that puts to the front of one's mind the raw realities. It's very confronting to enter the place where you know you are opening the book on the last chapter of one's life. And so to make life as good as we can for older Australians for as long as we can, this government has delivered record investment right across the aged care system over the forward estimates, not just in residential aged care but also in assistance to help our older Australians live in their own homes independently for longer with the little bits of help they need to be able to do so for as long as possible. In fact, new home care packages under this government have increased from 60,308 under Labor in 2012 to 13 through to 164,135 in the coming financial year. Now, that's an increase of over 170 per cent. Over the same period, funding for them will increase by 258 per cent due to the growth in the number of people who are seeking higher levels of care from home, which again highlights that, rea that reality. People want to be able to stay in their home for as long as they possibly can. It's also worth noting that for all the gloating, for all the confected emotion we see on that side of the chamber, Labor at the last election offered no additional funding in their costings, not a single cent, nothing, not a penny, no, not even mentioned, not a single dollar more for home care places, not a single dollar more for aged care quality, not a single dollar more for investing in the quality of the aged care workforce, and not a single dollar more for residential aged care. So I am not inclined to listen to the confected outrage of those opposite when they had no plan to improve this sector, they had no vision for investing more in older Australians, and they had no interest in the welfare of those in that difficult last chapter of their lives. Now, the fact that this is a difficult chapter of life doesn't mean we don't, as a society, continue to aim high. It's vital we have in place measures that make this tough chapter as positive and as healthy as it can possibly be. And so that's why the Morrison government, under this minister, has provided 
PPE from the national stockpile for aged care workers. That's why, under this minister, the Morrison government has put in place infection control training and PPE measures and infection control protocols that are designed to keep this workforce and our older Australians safe. And as at 30 September of this year, 1,244,709 1, aged care workers had completed Thank you, basic Senator training. Stoker, your time has expired. Thank you, Ma Senator Marielle Smith. Thank you, Deputy President. It's got to be pretty tough to come in here at the moment as a senator on the other side and stand up and defend what's happening in aged care. It's got to be pretty tough. And you know it's pretty tough when colleagues like Senator Stoker have to refer to in-home care packages as sort of the shining beacon of what the government's done, because we know that rollout has not gone smoothly either and has left a lot wanting. What we've seen in Victoria over the past few months in aged care is nothing short of a national tragedy, and it is nothing short of a disaster for those Australians in residential aged care and for the families who have had to watch what they go through in residential aged care during this pandemic. I don't think there's a single person in this room who expected the government, the minister, the prime minister to predict the global pandemic. But when the pandemic was upon us, when we started seeing the lessons from overseas, when we started seeing the lessons in Australia, New March House, of what was happening in New South Wales, at that point, we did expect them to come up with a plan. At that point, we did expect them to go through a process of lessons learned, to look around at what's happening globally, to look around at what's happening in Australia, develop a plan, do what they had to do to keep Australians safe. No one expected the government to predict the unpredictable, but we did expect a degree of ministerial responsibility for the crisis which is happening in aged care, aged care being a federal government responsibility. We expected the Prime Minister to take responsibility for it. We expected the aged care minister to take responsibility for it. We expected them to do what was required to keep Australians safe. Not an unreasonable set of expectations for us as the opposition, and certainly not an unreasonable set of expectations for the Australians in aged care for the families who love them. But the government failed on that. They failed on that. The minister has said he had a plan, but I tell you, if the Royal Commission couldn't find it, how could the Australians in aged care expect to find it? How does the sector find it? How do the families who have family, have family members in aged care find it? If the Royal Commission couldn't find it, where was it? What was it? These families expected more from their federal government. They expected a sector which was resilient, but most importantly, they expected a sector which would be prepared to respond to the things we knew could come. And we knew they could come because we saw them come in New South Wales and we've seen them come overseas. This government does not take ministerial responsibility when it comes to the aged care sector seriously. We saw that last time we were here in Canberra when the minister turned his back on this chamber as we were seeking an explanation about what was happening in his chamber. He turned his back and walked out. We've seen it in question time today when he is waffled in answers to questions from Labor senators, serious questions about what's happening in the aged care sector in Victoria and his responsibility for it. This is not a minister who takes his responsibility seriously. It is not a minister who takes his responsibility to this chamber seriously. And we see that time and time again. All we get from this government is excuses. We've seen today in this debate more excuses that it's not the government's problem, it's someone else's problem. You are the level of government responsible for aged care. So whilst it's easier to deflect the blame and harder to stand up and take responsibility, that is what is expected of you. That is what is expected of you by those Australians in aged care in Victoria. And it's not just Victorians. 
because I know people in my home state of South Australia are looking at what's happened in aged care in Victoria and they feel scared too. They feel scared because they don't feel like the government, which is meant to be representing them in Canberra, which is looking after this sector, which is meant to have a plan and has been found wanting, will be there for them if a crisis comes to SA. They are scared and I don't blame them for being scared. So instead of standing here and waffling or trying to devolve yourself of responsibility or trying to attack Labor senators because that's really all you can do if you don't want to stand up and take responsibility and ownership of what you've been doing, why don't you think about the Australians who feel fear out there, think about the Australians suffering and actually take your responsibility as Minister Thank seriously. Thank you, Senator Smith. Your time has expired. So the question is, the motion to take note of answers as moved by Senator Keneally be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Seward. Madam Deputy President, um, I rise to take note of Minister Rustin's answers to my questions about tax cuts and the, and the job seeker payment. It really is an insult to the community and to job seekers to tell them that their payments haven't been cut. The minister, instead of answering my questions, chose to play with words and say the coronavirus payment hasn't been cut. Well, tell a job seeker that. Tell a job seeker who's trying to pay the mortgage, who's trying to pay the rent, who's trying to look after the kids and feed the kids, who's trying to put food on the table for the whole family, the whole family, including parents, because we all know that if you're trying to exist on $40 a day on the original job seeker payment, very often parents go without food, trying to feed the kids, trying to put, make sure they take their medicines and meet their essential bills such as power and water, for example. Tell them that their payment has not been cut by $300 a fortnight, because it has. And very soon we are going to start seeing families losing the roof over their head because they cannot afford to pay rent. And in the chamber tonight, during adjournment, I will be telling people's accounts of what they've said to me, and I've been inundated with what people are feeling about the cuts to the job seeker payment, which has been brought to bear because the coronavirus uh, virus supplement has been cut. The minister said I was completely and utterly misleading by saying the coronavirus had been cut. Call it what you will, people do not have enough money in their pockets. They have been dropped below the poverty line by the cuts to the coronavirus supplement. Or, in the, to please the minister, I'll say the new coronavirus supplement payment, which is $250, which is a cut of $300 from the 550 coronavirus supplement. And what's the government trying to do? What did the minister try to do in here? She tried to justify tax cuts to millionaires. It is simply unjustifiable to be giving any more money to millionaires when people are literally living below the poverty line, will lose the roof over their heads, will be going hungry, can't afford to pay their bills, can't afford to pay their mortgage, trying to renegotiate with the bank the fact that they're having to extend even further their mortgage or the fact that they're not going to be able to pay it for quite a long time. We all know that living below the poverty line has an impact on your well-being. It has an impact on your ability to find work. And I tell you what also has an impact on your well-being is the lack of certainty about what's going to happen at the end of December when the coronavirus supplement will disappear. And the government has given nobody any certainty that they will not be subjected to $40 a day again. So if you're trying to plan, if you're trying to negotiate with your bank to say, oh, you know, I, I can't, you know, I've had a, another cut to the job seeker payment or the coronavirus supplement. If you're trying to negotiate with your bank to extend your mortgage, you cannot provide that bank with any certainty that you are not going to be put back on $40 a day. It's the same as goes for if you're trying to negotiate with your landlord. Oh, trust me, the government will be, you know, I'll be on job seeker and the coronavirus supplement. Well, no, you won't be able to say that because you have absolutely no certainty. 
I've sat with people who are desperate, who don't know how they're going to make ends meet, who aren't going to be able to find a job because there's still 12 applicants or 12 job seekers for every job that is around. And don't tell me the number of people employed has gone up. Yes, I've heard that, but the numbers of our hours worked have only gone up by 0.1 per cent. In other words, people aren't earning the money they need to get by. So don't run the line that employment has gone up tremendously so we don't need to keep job seeker payment at a rate that actually is livable because they aren't being able to find the work that is necessary. And who are the people that are suffering the most? The young, young and older women are particularly disadvantaged. And that also goes with a lot of the accounts that I'll be telling you tonight in this place about the impact that cutting this payment is having on people, and it is a cut. In anybody's language, it is a cut. Make no mistakes. This is unacceptable in a country as, as wealthy as ours, even in Order, this recession. Order, Senator Seawitt. Time for debate has expired. The question is the motion moved by Senator Seawitt be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. We will move to petitions. The clerk. A petition has been lodged as noted on the dynamic read. The terms of the petition will be incorporated in Hansard. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Smith. There being no other notices of motion, I was going to deal with a leave of absence for senators, if I may. Um, by of course, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Smith. I, I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for senators. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators. <laughs> senators Brockman, McGrath, Patterson and Van from the 6th to the 8th of October 2020 for personal reasons and Senator Payne from the 6th to the 8th of October 2020 on account of ministerial business. question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. The leave is granted. Senator Urquhart. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senators Billicks, Alex Gallagher, Kitching, Walsh and Shikoni for Tuesday the 6th uh, till Thursday the 8th of October 2020 for personal reasons. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Seawood. Thank you, Mr President. I also seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for senators. Leave is granted. Senator Seawood. Thank you. Um, I seek leave for um, Sen a leave of absence for Senator Wish Wilson, Senator Rice, and Senator Steele John from the 6th of October to the 8th of October for personal reasons. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The, the ayes have it. I shall now proceed to the any other placing of business and call the clerk. Uh, postponement notifications have been lodged as followed. Um, business of the Senate notice of motion number one, standing in the name of Senator O'Neill, postponed from today to the 8th of October. General business notice of motion number 753, standing in the names of Senators McCarthy and Dodson from today to the 9th of November. General business notice of motion number 785, standing in the name of Senator Brown from today to the 7th of October. General business notice of motion number 802, standing in the name of Senator Waters for today to the 8th of October. And general business notice of motion number 800, standing in Senator McKim's name for today to the 8th of October. And committees have lodged extension notifications as indicated at item 14 on today's order of business. I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, unless there's any other matters to be raised there, I will proceed to the discovery of formal business. And with the consent of the Senate would leave, I'll try and deal with it in the most conducive matter to everyone's time as possible. So I will commence with number 780, which is in the name of Senator Steelejohn. Senator Seawood. Oh. oh yes, yeah, sorry. Sorry. Um, I ask that general business notice of motion number 780 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Seawood. I move the follow I move the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to amend. Oh, do you say that or do I? Sorry. You say that. Yeah, I thought so. It's just um, to amend the law in relation to royal commissions. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. 
The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Seward. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law in relation to royal commissions and for related purposes. Senator Seward. This bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Seward. I table an explanatory memorandum and I seek leave to have a second reading speech incorporated into Hansard and to, to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Seward. Could I go to 783 in the name of Senator Wish Wilson? Senator Seward. Thank you. I ask that General Business Notice of Motion Number 783, standing in the name of Senator Wish Wilson for today, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Seward. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Uh, could we go to number 786 in the name of Senator Gallagher? Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr President. I ask that General Business Notice of Motion Number 786, standing in the name of Senator Gallagher for today, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none. Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, the government agrees with the Department of Defence that the release of the unredacted document is commercially sensitive. And the government agrees also that the provision of the requested documents would adversely impact on the ability of defence to achieve value for money across the shipbuilding program and meet Australia's broader strategic objectives. The draft tendered plans cited in this motion include commercial <coughs> and confidence information, which encompasses proprietary information, arrangements with other parties, sensitive financial data and commercial strategies that could impact the competitiveness of companies. The disclosure of information uh, also impacts the government's ability to effectively negotiate AIC arrangements, as well as multiple Australian businesses and suppliers who would have no chance to control or object to the public release. The question is that motion number 786 be agreed to. Oh, sorry, Senator Patrick. Uh, short Le statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, this, this OPD calls for documents which are critical to the, to the committee conducting its business, that is, to examine. Uh, the, the Naval Shipbuilding Program from an Australian industry content perspective. Uh, we've got to a point in time now where the government is denying the Senate basic information that is to do with commercial arrangements agreed to by companies in order to win a procurement contract. The Senate or the government is now seeking to uh, expand its, its confidentiality over just about anything as long as it, it might have come from a company. This, this is really important uh, material. It goes to the Australian industry content uh, that uh, was promised by these companies at contract, and the Senate has a right to look at these uh, documents and make sure that the, these companies and defence are holding them to, to account in relation to their promises. The question is that motion number 786 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Could I jump to 791 in the name of Senators Hughes and Canavan? Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr. I ask that general business notice of motion number 791, proposing the establishment of a select committee, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Hughes. I move the motion standing in my name and in the name of Senator Canavan. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Could I come to 793 now? Senator Patrick. Oh, Senator Seward. Could I have recorded that the Greens oppose that motion, please? So recorded. Thank you, Senator Seward. Uh, 793 in the name of. Oh, sorry, Senator Griff. I have recorded that Senator Alliance uh, uh, opposes that too. that motion. Thank you. So recorded. Senator Patrick, could I come to your matter number 793, please? Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 793 be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Patrick. I move that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to amend the Judges' Pension Act 1968 and for related purposes. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Patrick. I present the bill and move that the bill may proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. The question is the bill be read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. 
A bill for an act to amend the Judges' Pension Act 1968 and for related purposes. Senator Patrick. I move that the bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Patrick. Well, thank you, Mr President. I table an explanatory memorandum and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in the Hansard and to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Uh, 794 in the name of Senator Kitching. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 794 will stand in the name of Senator Kitching be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr President. On the 2nd of September, the Australia Post chairman stated that the Australia Post board had determined that no short-term incentive payment would be made to the executive team for the financial year 2020. The government welcomes the board's decision, which is in keeping with the CEO's commitment from earlier in the year. The question is the motion, motion number 794 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Could I come to 796 in the name of Senator Rennick? Senator Rennick. I seek leave to amend general business notice to motion 796 before asking that it be taken as formal. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Rennick. I amend the motion as circulated and ask that it be taken as formal. Question. Uh, is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none. Senator Rennick. I move the motion. Question is that motion as amended, number 796, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Could I come to 797, Senator Roberts? Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 797 relating to a document discovery be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Roberts. I move the motion. Question is motion. Sorry, Senator, Senator Keneally. Make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. Labor opposes this motion as it is not necessary, and the unredacted document in question is available publicly via a simple Google search. Labor takes this opportunity to again note our ongoing support for the CSIRO. The question is the motion moved by Senator Roberts be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The noes have it. The noes have it. Could we come to number 798 in the name of Senator Canavan and others? Senator Davey. I seek leave to amend general business notion, notice of motion 798 before asking that it be taken as formal. Is leave granted? <coughs> leave is granted. Senator Davey. I amend the motion as circulated and ask that it be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Davey. I move the motion standing in my name and in the names of Senators Mackenzie, Davey, Macdonald, McMahon, being the name of Senator Canavan, and add Senator Henderson as co-sponsor of the motion. The question is that Senator Faruqi. Uh, Mr President, I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Um, the Greens want a thriving, expanding and green manufacturing sector, but this government's plan for manufacturing is based on completely unconscionable climate wrecking expansion of fossil fuels. You can choose renewables, but you don't. They talk up advanced manufacturing while actively decimating local research and innovation. A manufacturing plan without funding for research and skills isn't worth the paper it's written on. The Liberals and Nationals have defunded TAFEs and gutted research. They're not interested in our future. Senator Canavan is more interested in engaging in toxic culture wars about former Senator Bob Brown and Black Lives Matter. His Facebook post yesterday, sharing a photo of a youth with a black Coal Matters sticker, was both racist and climate denialist at the same time. It was absolutely disgraceful. Black Lives Matter has been a critical rallying cry and global movement against racial injustice and police Order, violence. Senator Faruqi. Order. Time has expired. Before we descend into very tense issues, I'm going to ask senators, and I'm going to review the Hansard, to be very careful about their reflections on the individual actions of other senators, because pejorative terms can be unparliamentary if they are directed at an individual senator. So can I ask senators to reflect on what they say? I'll review the Hansard then um, because, before we get into more tension than we need. Senator Roberts. Seek leave to make a short statement. 
leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. We support this motion. We support the intent and most of the words, while noting that the LNP policy and actions at state and federal level drive high energy prices, undermining manufacturing and agriculture. So the question is that, as amended, motion number 798 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Could we come now to matter number 801, Senator Seward? Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 801 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Seward. I move the motion. I'll, Senator Keneally was on her feet first. The motion has been moved. Senator Keneally. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. Australia is in the biggest recession in almost a century, and we need a plan for jobs. We've always been open-minded about tax cuts for low- and middle-income earners, but we've expressed our concern with stage three tax cuts throughout. We need to see what is in the budget tonight, Tuesday, but the government doesn't need to choose between tax cuts for low- and middle-incomes and a permanent increase to job seeker, which is too low. The government should provide Australians who are out of work some certainty by announcing a permanent increase to job seeker in the budget tonight. Senator Dunham. I uh, seek leave also to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. The government wants Australians to earn more and to keep more of what they earn. Under coalition governments, taxes will always be lower. They'll be fairer and simpler. The question is the motion moved by Senator Seawitt, number 801, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
stop the bells. The question is that motion number 801 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Seawitt tell of the ayes and Senator Urquhart tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 8, noes 31. The matter is resolved in the negative. Now, Senator Lambie, did you wish to proceed with business of the Senate? No? We won't proceed with business of the Senate. We... Um, just for, with the new provisions, could you advise, do you plan, uh, would you like to advise that with, you're withdrawing the motion, Senator Lambie? Yeah, Mr President, I do believe that my office has already done that. Uh, with it, I do might have taken a while to get here. Um, look, okay, you, that was done this I, morning. You're seeking leave to withdraw the motion. Leave is granted. Thank you, Thank Senator you. Lambie. Um, could we move then, Senator Seward? Sorry, um, could I just ask that the Greens' opposition to motion number 798 um, be uh, recorded? Thanks. I neglected to jump. Earlier. Okay. Sorry. So yep. So recorded. Um, So can we now move to business of the Senate matter at number three in the name of Senator Hanson Young. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that business notice of the Senate number three, uh, motion number three, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Hanson Young. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. Make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. The process for identifying and endorsing the 15 major projects involved cabinet and national cabinet consideration. <laughs> And as such, prior deliberations on the list may be subject to cabinet confidentiality arrangements. These projects are worth more than $72 billion and they're expected to support over 66,000 jobs. By reducing assessment and approval timeframes without reducing environmental protections, these major projects will be shovel ready earlier, helping create thousands of new jobs and support the economy through the COVID 19 crisis. Question is that business of the Senate matter number three in the name of Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. The question is the business of the Senate matter number three. In the name of Senator Hanson Young, be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart, tell of the ayes. Senator Dean Smith, tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 27, noes 27. The matter is therefore negative. I ask senators to remain in the chamber for imminent divisions. Could we come to matter number 784 in the name of Senators Chisholm, Watt and Green? Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr President. I ask the general business notice of motion number 784 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none. Senator Urquhart. The motion. Quit. Senator Dunningham, then I'll come to you, Senator Waters. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. If the Australian Labor Party want to talk about economic vandalism, they should look at their own record. Former Deputy Premier uh, Jackie Tradegate, Queensland, the highest unemployment rate in the nation, the highest numbers of bankruptcies, and the worst business confidence in a decade, all before coronavirus, too, I might add. Uh, Labor preference the Greens ahead of other candidates in every election, and if the ALP are so offended by the Greens, they shouldn't accept their preferences at all. The government also looks forward to hearing uh, to the Labor Party preferencing the LNP ahead of the Greens in all 93 seats in the Queensland election. Queenslanders have had enough of former, Jackie, uh, former Deputy Premier Jackie Trad's deals. She and her government have got to go. Senator Only an Watt LNP government led by Deb, Fre Deb Frecklington will rebuild Queensland's economy and ten. create secure jobs for Queenslanders that they desperately Senator need, Watt, that Labor won't deliver. I remind me of my rule that you have to count to ten before you be disorderly again. Senator Waters. Mr President, I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, President. Whatever the LNP decide to recommend to their voters about preferences has nothing to do with the Greens. And the Queensland Greens said publicly weeks ago that we would suggest voters put the LNP last, along with One Nation. The fact that the Labor Party has chosen to use Order. their time in the Senate today shows just how worried they are about the growing green movement in Senator Queensland. McKenzie. And well, they should be, given the secret royalties deal they just did with Senator the Derby. Watt. They Senator raise McKenzie. jobs in Queensland. Sen Order. Order. Senator Waters to continue. Thanks, President. They raise jobs in Queensland. Our plan to revive manufacturing, including building publicly owned renewables and public housing, would create tens of thousands of jobs. Meanwhile, Queensland Labor's plan for the Queensland economy is to freeze teachers' and nurses' wages while giving mining companies a royalties holiday. That's why people are voting Green. Order! 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 I will call Senator, Senator Watt. 
Senator Ayres, I will call Senator Hanson, who is seeking the call when I have an opportunity to hear what she seeks to say. Senator Hanson. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, look, I can't believe what I'm reading here, and actually, it's admission by the by the Labor Party say the Greens' policies would do great economic damage to Queensland at a time when every job is vital. They do great economic damage all the time, regardless of whether COVID-19 is around or not. And yet they swap preferences every time. It doesn't matter what election, state or federal election, they swap their preferences Order. every time. So it will, and yes, you are right, Senator Watt, because it does increase Senator the chances Ayers. of a minority government in Queensland. So here we could end up with the Labor Greens government. You're bad enough by yourselves. The Labor Party destruction of Queensland, but put the two together. My God, heaven help Queensland if we actually end up with the Greens Labor government. It would be the Greens setting the agenda. So I think. In I, you, you actually, I don't know what I'm going to do here. I don't know which one support you or the Liberal Party. Order, You've Senator Hanson. Time for the statement has expired. The question is that motion number 784 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Let the whips do their job. Senator Watt, please.
Stop the bells. The question is that motion number 784 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart tell of the ayes. Senator Dean Smith tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 18, noes 36. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senators, could I come to matter number 788? Senator Mackenzie, in your name. I'll give you a moment to get to your seat. Senator Mackenzie. Uh, thank you. I seek leave to amend general business notice of motion number 788 before asking that it be taken as formal. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Mackenzie. I amend the motion as circulated and ask that it be taken as formal. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Mackenzie. I move the motion standing in my name and in the names of National Party Senators Davey, Canavan, Macdonald and McMahon. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Could we now come to matter number 790, Senator Wong on Keneally. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr President. I ask that general business notice of motion 790 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Keneally. I move the motion standing in my name and that of Senator Wong. Senator Dunningham. Seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, thanks, Mr President. Over 391,000 Australians have returned since 13 March with 64 government-facilitated flights. On 17 March, the government advised Australians uh, overseas who wanted to return to do so as soon as possible by commercial means. To manage quarantine arrangements at the request of the states, the National Cabinet agreed to international pa uh, passenger arrival caps. While critical for, the communi for community safety, the caps have restricted flight availability. Resumption of travel to Melbourne, when permitted by the Victorian government, will increase our capacity to assist Australians. The government has made available a hardship program for emergency assistance for the most vulnerable Australians still overseas. Senator Rice, remotely. Thanks, Mr President. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. The Morrison government just seems to have washed its hands of the thousands of Australians who are stranded overseas who just want to come home. I mean, we Greens have said time and time again that aiming to get stranded Australians and their families home by the end of the year just is not good enough. I mean, thousands of people are in desperate financial and personal circumstances, not being able to come home due to ill health or the remote location or flight cancellations or pregnancy. I have heard so many heartbreaking stories from my constituents and the evidence that was given to the COVID committee. So the government's approach of small loans will just not, simply won't cut it. I mean, Prime Minister Morrison and Minister Dutton must urgently provide extra resources for quarantining capacity, 
and to stop the airline price gouging so that people can come home. Question, Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Request leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Jackie Lambie Network won't be supporting this simply because we believe the states have not come to the party. Uh, they have not voiced it. Uh, the states have not said how many people they're going to take exactly or what they're going to do. And actually, the states are missing in action when it comes to this, and that includes the state of Tasmania, where their own stuck over here. So this is not just up to the federal government. This comes down to the states as well, and that's why the Jackie Lambie Network won't be supporting it. Question is that motion number 790 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. Yeah. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. Question is motion number 790 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart tell off the ayes, Senator Dean Smith tell off the, Dean Smith, tell off the noes. The result of the division is ayes 28, noes 26. The matter is therefore resolved in the affirmative. Senators, that concludes the discovery of formal business. I will give senators a moment to take their seats or leave the chamber prior to starting on the next item. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 15 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter was received from Senator Waters. Pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose that the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. Instead of investing in Australia's future, the Morrison government is choosing inequality and climate collapse in its federal budget. Yours sincerely, Larissa Waters. Is the proposal supported? It is. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the Senate speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerk to set the clocks accordingly, and I call Senator McKim. Uh, well, thank you. President, and uh, we know enough about this budget now to be able to offer some informed commentary on it. And uh, because of uh, the budget leaks and the budget drops that we've seen over the last few weeks, we know that this budget will choose inequality over equality, and we know that this budget will choose climate collapse over climate sustainability. Budgets are about choices, and this budget chooses wealth inequality and climate collapse. It's important to know that the choices we make now will have massive and long-reaching consequences for the climate and for people that we represent in this place in particular. This budget will contain tens of billions of dollars of direct corporate subsidies to the fossil fuel sector, to big coal, big oil and big gas. And we know that the mining and burning of fossil fuels are the single biggest driver of our climate breaking down around us. This budget will show that we are being led by a government that picks big corporations and their millionaire mates, many of whom are direct donors to the LNP over the millions of Australians who are unemployed or underemployed. It's a budget for the millionaires, not for the millions. With the money the government is committing to tax cuts in this budget, we could have a green recovery, a Green New Deal, where we can create hundreds of thousands of good jobs that ensure 
that people have an income that they can live on and creates a strong and environmentally sustainable economy. If you want one window into where this government's priorities lie, look at what's happening to company profits. Look what's, look what's happened to company profits over the last seven years, and look what's been happening to wages over the last seven years. So over the last seven years, corporate profits are up massively and people's wages are down. Wage growth is at its lowest rate in Australia since records began to be kept. Conversely, corporate profits are at the highest level in Australia since records have been kept. Working people are getting less for their efforts and the executives and the shareholders are getting more. And this was all before the shock of the pandemic that we are living through. Tax cuts on top of this trend are only going to make inequality worse. Now, we know that these tax cuts are not going to adequately stimulate the economy because we've heard this story before. And I want to be clear, we should be looking after low-income people. We should be raising the rate of JobSeeker. We should be providing relief to people on low incomes because it's the right thing to do and because we don't want people to live in poverty. But when you look at the first round of the tax cuts, which was all about, according to the government, stimulating the economy, it just got trousered instead. People saved it rather than spent it. We know that that is true. And we are now, unlike when the first tranche came in, we are in a recession. And why would Mr Frydenberg think this round of tax cuts is suddenly going to magically be spent rather than saved? And of course, he knows it's not, which reveals the real reason for these tax cuts. And that is that they are ideologically driven largess to the millionaires and the big corporates in this country. That's why this government is bringing forward the tax cuts. Now there is a better way. There is a better way. We can invest in a job guarantee. We can invest in a Green New Deal. We can invest in government-backed jobs and income guarantees to help to create a good life for far more of our people and make sure that nobody is left behind. We need bold and strong government investment in green manufacturing, in sustainable infrastructure to create jobs and opportunities to build the foundations of a fairer and cleaner economy. And we need massive investment into public services for our communities, health, education, public transport, childcare, aged care, those public services that people expect governments to deliver and expect them to be delivered locally and at a high quality. Economies need to work for people, not the other way around. And until we have an economy that works for people and until we see budgets that will prioritise people over the economy and prioritise nature and climate over environmental destruction, we are in for yet more of the same. I call uh, Senator Rennick. Thank you, Acting Madam Deputy President. And Senator McKim, you'll be pleased to know that tonight's budget is prioritising people. The income tax cuts are for the low to middle income earners. They are for the battlers, the working class. Because we know that if you want to get ahead in this country, if you want this country to succeed, it is all about wealth for toil. Wealth for toil. You're not going to get Australia out of the mess that COVID has got us into if we don't get people back to work. We can't stay under the dunas forever. We can't stay under the dunas forever. And these income tax cuts are going to put more money into the people who go to work every day 
and if it puts more money into those pockets, they will spend more, and that will create more employment. It will create more employment, and we know it works because we saw in the Howard Costello years regular income tax cuts every year, and the budget continued. The economy continued to grow. Wage rises went high, incomes lifted. Wages have only stopped growing since Labor introduced the Fair Work Act. You don't want to talk about that, do you? You know, employee, uh, employer uh, uh, improper payments because of the Fair Work Act is so complicated. Even Labor-aligned uh, firms like Morris Blackburn have been caught out paying the wrong salaries. Now, if an industrial relations firm can't work out what the right salary to pay is, then what hope has the rest of us got? What hope has small business got? They can't afford to pay a high-priced lawyer. Now, in terms of support and welfare support, the Morrison government doubled JobSeeker the moment we shut down the economy and shut down the country with COVID. It went from about $540 a week to around $1,100 a week. We implemented JobKeeper straight away. We've spent over $200 billion supporting the economy, supporting the economy since the introduction of COVID. We've given two $750 payments to pensioners. Okay, there has been no support, sh uh, shortage of support for those in need since COVID has struck. Since COVID has struck, and we are investing in infrastructure. Now, I don't know exactly what's in tonight's budget, but you know, from what I read, you know, I love it how the media know more than our own backbenchers. But anyway, that's another story for another day. But you know, we're led to believe there's going to be significant investment in infrastructure. Now that is going to be very welcome to the economy because it's infrastructure that provides essential services. You know, I stood up here in my maiden speech and I said that government should never have sold infrastructure. Hawke and Keating should never have sold the CBA. CSL, CSL. You know, how many billions are we paying to CSL? The government is paying to CSL. We sold that back in 92 for $200 million. A couple of years ago, we signed a $3.4 billion contract for nine years, almost $400 million, in order to get CSL to clean the blood that's donated to Red Cross. Now, why on earth did we ever sell that asset? That was just madness. I don't know what Keating was, uh, former Prime Minister Paul Keating was thinking, but that was just silly. You know, Queensland Labor has just decimated, decimated that state by selling our forestry plantations, our ports, our railways, our roads, our golden casket. Never sell infrastructure that provides an essential service that people pay taxes for. They expect governments to provide essential services. They're not going to line up out in front of Macquarie Bank when it all goes wrong. Okay, so this government supports infrastructure, and it's something I'm pleased to stand here and say I back wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly. But then I want to talk about this inequality uh, allegation that's just uh, t total rubbish about somehow that the LNP and the coalition uh, isn't being fair. You know, if you want to talk about inequality, let's look at Victoria and Queensland. Let's look at Victoria and Queensland. You know, if you want to see an example of just brutal, misogynistic inequality, Go and hop on for Craig Kelly, for, uh, member for Hughes, Craig Kelly's Facebook page, and look at his posting with the Helen Reddy song of all the women that have been arrested in Victoria for trying to stand up for their rights, for their rights. And of course, the Victorian premier's name, Daniel Andrews, never gets mentioned on that side of the parliament, does it? Because they just, you know. Uh, have complete amnesia when they look at Victoria. They don't want to acknowledge what a debacle that state is. But if there's ever an example of inequality, it's Victoria and Queensland, my beloved home state. And how disgraceful, how embarrassing uh, was it to see Anna Palaszczuk, uh, Queensland Premier Anna Palaszczuk, get up there and say, Queensland hospitals are for Queensland people Sorry. and New South, New South Wales hospitals for New South Wales people. That is terrible. My mother was born in Kempsey. You know, my family, on my mother's side, are from uh, the Northern Rivers, Kempsey and Orange. You know, I love New South Wales. It might be three nights of the year I don't, but the rest of the time I do. You know, it's a beautiful state, beautiful state, and it's just embarrassing. It is embarrassing that she has kept pregnant women 
from getting to hospitals. She has kept families from attending their family members' funerals. She has kept other people from getting necessary uh, cancer treatment or recuperating from cancer treatment. She has uh, separated children who attend boarding school in Queensland from their families, all to save her own skin. All to save her own skin. So I don't want to take any lectures from the Greens or Labor about inequality in the coalition. Because if you want to look at inequality, you've only got to look at the treatment and the, and the complete destruction of our individual freedoms under the Queensland and Victorian uh, state governments. Shocking. And then we come to you know, the whole climate doom, climate collapse stuff. I mean, it just goes on and on and on and on and on. You know, well, if you want to talk about equality, if you want to talk about looking after taxpayers, how about we get real here and look at the subsidies that renewable energy gets? $10 billion for the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, $5 billion for the Snowy Hydro, uh, Pumped Hydro Project, $3.5 billion of taxpayer money has been pumped into the Climate Solutions Package, $2.5 billion into the Emissions Reduction Fund. One and a half billion dollars of taxpayers' money has been pumped into the Australian Renewable Energy Agency. Another billion dollars has been pumped into the Grid Reliability Fund, and half a billion dollars, taxpayers' dollars, has been pumped into the National Hydrogen Strategy. I mean, the renewables industry has had to be one of the most propped-up rent seekers this country has ever seen, and it doesn't end there. You're going, it's going to take. AEMO has come out and said that if you want to get to 90 per cent renewables, you're going to have to spend $100 billion. That's not to get to 100 per cent renewables, sorry, and I just said that, to 90 per cent renewables. And they won't go to 100 per cent because they know that you're always going to need base load power, whether it be coal or gas, in the background to back up renewable energy. To back up renewable energy. And we can see, if you go and actually analyse what's happening with energy prices, you can actually see why they are rising. Despite the fact that you know, everyone says that renewable energy is cheaper, it's not. Maybe renewable energy generation in the middle of the day is cheaper, but the cost of transmission, storage, security services and clean-up, which of course is never factored into it because there are no environmental bonds. I'm glad we got that motion up today. I'll be sending that off to all the state premiers, demanding that environmental bonds are paid by these renewable uh, companies. Uh, so when they talk about costs, 48 per cent of energy costs now are in transmission costs. From building all those transmission lines that have to connect solar and wind. And of course, what's in all these transmission lines is switching gear. And what's in the switching gear? Sulfur hexafluoride, the most potent global greenhouse gas there is on the planet. It has a greenhouse warming effect 23,000 times greater than carbon dioxide. I somehow don't think that's part of the clean, clean green dream. And then the solar panels? Nitrogen trifluoride, the second most toxic uh, global greenhouse uh, gas in the environment, is used to make solar panels. And that stuff hangs around in the environment for 700 years. 700 years. And it goes on, it goes on. What's used in the batteries? Lithium. A 1 per cent ore body. You've got 1 per cent of metal in the ore. So that means you're going to have to mine 100 tonnes of the ore just to get one tonne of metal. And then it's going to have to go all the way to China or somewhere like that, get melted down through four energy intensive electrolysis processes, and then come back and it lasts for about eight years. Senator That's Rennick, uh, your time has okay. expired. I can now call Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, as Senator Rennick's uh, remarks demonstrate to the chamber, uh, this government is indeed choosing inequality and climate collapse uh, as its agenda. This government has a record of entrenching inequality in our communities, in our tax system, in our schools, our health systems, uh, in uh, our um, uh, university sector, and on it goes. And yet, we have a government that does not even want to structurally ad address or even recognise the nature of inequality in our nation. 
From the disproportionate financial burdens that we now see on Australia's young people in the higher education bill that's before us today, uh, we've seen uh, in our health system many Australians fork out money for their, um, for their health insurance that they then can't afford to use because they can't afford the gap payments uh, that they need to make in order to access the care that they need for the health uh, uh, that they thought health protection they thought they were buying. In our university system, we see now astronomical thank you levels of debt uh, sub that students will now be subjected to. In our tax system, we see tax deductions for people who are, are buying their fourth or fifth or sixth house, and yet for those young Australians buying their first house, they will struggle to get ahead. These are all policy decisions. These are all decisions of government that embed inequality in our nation, a fact that this government chooses to deny or thinks somehow that it is in the economic interests uh, to behave, of the nation to behave in this way. Well, when you look at inequality in this country and you look at the astronomical levels of debt that are now being accumulated, and I'm not saying it's not justified to stimulate the eco <coughs> economy to make sure that people have enough money in their pockets to live. However, this government is going to make the tax burden on future generations of Australians even harder because not only is that, that future debt to pay off, those young people have stacked against them a whole range of other policy settings that make their life more difficult. From the difficulty of buying a house, from low wages, from the inequality in our nation's schools and our higher education system. We have here a government that is so ideologically opposed to fair access to higher education opportunities, so blind to the aspirations of young Australians who want to study hard and get ahead, that this government has put forward a bill that does the exact opposite. I don't think most uh, senators actually understand how perverse this bill actually is. So, for example, currently, uh, a, uni uh, a humanities degree or a business degree might cost uh, a combined contribution from the student and the government of about $13,500. Now, if you want to do a commerce or an economics degree, wow, it looks pretty good on paper. There's going to be a $14,500 bill to the student. So that looks like a, a, um, a $1,000 funding increase in the funding for that student for that place, including uh, on top of that another $1,100 in subsidy from the government. Well, that's a cut of $5,000, more than $5,000 in the government subsidy to that student place. But it's going to saddle that student with $14,500 worth of debt when, in fact, Universities aren't cur are currently spending uh, and allocated only $13,500 on that student. So unless universities are going to start funnelling money into uh, the business faculties and arts faculties, those students are going to be used as a cash cow in fees for cross-subsidy to the very faculties that this, that this government says it wants to prioritise. You've said you want to prioritise engineering, you've said you want to prioritise maths, you've said you want to prioritise science, but instead you've reduced student debt to the, uh, in some places, but you've also reduced the government contribution, capping the, number of, the amount of funding for those places, disincentivising uh, in, uh, the enrolment of uni uh, the capacity for universities to enrol uh, in those faculties, and resulting, I think, in the future, in the over enrolment uh, of students in uh, the faculties where a university can afford to charge a student more than that student costs them. That is the heinous level of inequality that is embedded in the higher education 
legislation that is currently before this parliament. It is unthinkable to me that we can have a government that is so committed to Americanising our education system that it is prepared pretty much to fundamentally break it so that it's no longer fit for purpose, so that every part of the university sector and system in the future can be deregulated from a fees point of view. There can be no other uh, reason for the government to approach uh, this issue in this way. You're conveniently saying on one hand that you want to you want to increase the commitment to science, you want to make it easier for students to study science, when embedded in this legislation, uh, it will make it harder for students to study science. Sure, they'll have lower fees, but universities will have to cap the number of places in those faculties because they cannot afford to deliver them at the income that uh, this government will provide to them. It is unthinkable to me uh, that we have a government that is so not blind to inequality. You seek to use inequality in order to create a dog-eat-dog -dog society in our nation because uh, you reckon that's what's going to get the best out of people uh, in terms of having a fair go. Well, I have to say to you, uh, it is not at the core of the fundamental values of our nation to behave in that way. In the kind of things that this government has done uh, in keeping wages down, in cutting penalty rates, uh, in harming the economic standing of women in this country, you know, the cuts to job seeker payments will disproportionately affect older women who disproportionately lost their jobs uh, so far as part of the COVID crisis. In our country, women over 60 represent the largest cohort of people on JobSeeker. They face the greatest difficulty in re-entering the workforce, grappling with structural bar barriers and age and gender discrimination. When we uh, look to the future in terms of JobSeeker returning to its old base rate, then older women very much risk retiring in poverty. In today's budget, I would really like to see the government providing older women who are out of work some certainty by announcing a permanent increase to JobSeeker. But your bungled decision on JobKeeper, it locked out short-term casuals, it locked out the most vulnerable people uh, in the workforce. Here we go. No attention to inequality in our nation, uh, Mrs uh, Acting Deputy President. No attention to inequality in its response to these issues. Instead of ensuring that casual workers, who are already the most disadvantaged in the system, instead of ensuring they also had access to JobKeeper, no, you biased it towards those who were already in secure work. And what do we know? We know that in our casual uh, workforce, they're also more likely to be women. All of these women excluded from government assistance in the higher education sector, also uh, in the childcare sector. It is extraordinary uh, that you have then left families and women to draw down on their superannuation. Did you know that there are now 600,000 working Australians, people who have been working, who have no superannuation of their own? It is appalling, utterly appalling, that this government has such an explicit passion for entrenching inequality in our nation. Thank you, Senator Pratt. I call Senator Ron Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting <coughs> Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I'll discuss the real climate collapse risk, the Greens' New Green Deal. The Greens complain about a system that's unfair, yet their alternative plan would cause the total destruction of our economy and our way of life. What's fair about that? The Greens' new Green Deal is a plan to decolonise Australia, deindustrialise our economy, decommodify life, and is an assault on our democratic society. The new Green Deal is wholly dependent on an overbearing and all-controlling big Greens government. Firstly, 
The green in the New Green Deal is nothing to do with protecting the environment or controlling the climate. Green is the colour of camouflage. It's really Socialism 101. The Greens' New Green Deal would see us living in a real-life 1984, an Orwellian socialist totalitarian state where the thought police would monitor our every word for signs of offence or our somewhat free market replaced with a ruinous state-regulated controlled economy. The New Green Deal is a radical restructure of our way of life, a political nightmare that would destroy everything Australians hold dear. So what are the Greens proposing? Firstly, economically. Free university, a sitting on your backside living wage, free childcare, a billion dollar green army, hopefully an environmental army and not one to control the likes of you and me. Hundreds of billions to fund billion dollar foreign corporations to build more short lived junk, wind and solar plants. The list goes on and on and on. Free money, free money, free money. In short, Madam Acting Deputy President, when the Greens talk about investing in our future, it means investing in unaffordable, unreliable power that will cause blackouts and economic destruction. If implemented over 10 years, the Green New Deal will cost taxpayers $2 trillion. Taxpayers will carry that cost with profits going to corporate partners. The Greens are socialising the cost and privatising the profits. The Greens' method of financing worked so well in Venezuela that in 2018 inflation reached 1,700,000 per cent. As Baroness Thatcher once stated, the problem with socialism is that you eventually run out of other people's money. And what about the New Green Deal's social policy? That's even scarier than the New Green's New Deal economic policy. Increased powers to monitor and police hate speech which I'm sure under the new Greens regulations would outlaw this very speech. More rules to divide us along race, gender, sexuality, age and any other division that the Greens can create to divide us and separate us and pit us against one another. A truly disgusting anti-Australian, anti-community and anti-human political strategy. Our borders would be open to everyone looking for the Greens living wage, unelected race-based seats in parliament. So enough of socialism and control. The real solutions to both recovery from the COVID-19 recession and returning Australia to a prosperous and free society are these. One Nation will build new coal-fired power stations for affordable, reliable, stable, dispatchable power. One Nation will fight for restoration or compensation for farmers who have lost the right to use their land due to UN agreements. One Nation will build more dams and create water security across Australia, including building the hybrid Bradfield scheme a fairer tax reform, including multinationals to pay their fair share, a drastic cut to permanent immigration numbers to net zero until infrastructure catches up, a fair family law system for families, exit from free trade agreements, so-called free trade agreements, treaties and deals not in Australia's best interest. We must exit the Greens' mothership, the United Nations, to restore our sovereignty and freedoms. These proven basics will restore Australians to having the highest per capita income. Thank you, Senator Roberts. I call Senator Scar. Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, I note that in ancient Greece uh, there was an oracle in a town called Delphi who travellers used to come to and they'd ask for her, uh, her view on their fortunes, what was going to happen to them in the future. And uh, on one famous occasion, uh, King Croesus from somewhere in modern day Turkey approached and said, uh, Dear Oracle, tell us. What will happen if I declare war on my neighbour? And the oracle said, well, surely a great kingdom will fall. Now, the king, of course, misunderstood what the oracle was saying to him, and the great kingdom that fell was the king's own kingdom. Hence the oracle of Delphi's somewhat Delphic fortune-telling. Then in the Middle Ages, we had Nostradamus, the great French uh, astrologer who is frequently quoted in the modern day, and every time something happens, someone says, well, Nostradamus predicted this. But of course, if one reads the poetry of Nostradamus, one can read into it what one will. And here we are, some one hour and, what time is it? I've just come back from Queensland, so I'm still on uh, Eastern Standard Time, about two hours, two hours from the, from the bringing down of the budget, two hours from the bringing down of the budget, and the Greens already appear to know the Greens already appear to know what's in the budget. They already appear to know what was in the budget. And here we are debating what the budget, what the budget provides for two hours out.
from the actual delivery of the budget. But fair enough, I'm happy to debate on first principles in relation to this matter. Quite happy to debate the Greens on first principles with respect to their philosophy and their version, their version of equality. Their version of equality is equality of outcome. The levelling down, the pulling down of the successful, the entre entrepreneurial, those who create wealth, generate jobs, help provide prosperity, support charities, will drag them down. Will drag them down in the hope that we can lift other people. And does this help? Does this levelling process help? Has it ever worked anywhere in the world? No, absolutely not. What works? What works is providing opportunity providing opportunity, a quality of opportunity, not a quality of outcome, providing opportunity to each and every Australian, wherever they live, whether they live in the bush or the city, whatever their background, whether they're a new Australian or one of our Indigenous Australians, wherever they come from, provide them with the opportunity, provide them access to education, to health, the opportunity to fulfil their potential. And that's what I believe in. That's what I believe in. And I've seen that in practice. I have seen that in practice in my life before coming to this place. I saw that in a little country in South East Asia called Laos, where the company I work for and company, Madam Acting Deputy President, that, that swear word the Greens would have you believe, company. What is a company? A company is simply a collection of shareholders investing their capital in a common entity to progress some sort of commercial objective. That's what a company is. It comprises shareholders, employees and a range of stakeholders. It's not a swear word. The company I work for, the company I work for, lifted thousands of people out of poverty. Thousands of people out of poverty. Provided them with training and skills. Provided microfinance programs so women in the villages could bring their kids in from the fields and send them to school. That's the company I work for. And what did that? It was the entrepreneurial spirit of investors here in Australia investing capital, providing their faith in a management team, which then went and invested that capital overseas and provided those opportunities to some of the poorest people in the world. That's what I believe in, Madam Acting Deputy President. Those are my beliefs. Opportunity. Opportunity for all and support for those in need. That is a fundamental core LNP value. It goes out on LNP emails of notices of meeting. Opportunity for all and support for those in need. Support which is provided by wealth generated from that entrepreneurial activity. Support provided through that entrepreneurial activity which generates tax income and also provides people with the ability to contribute to charities of their choice and do their own lifting in their own communities. And yet, and yet we have the Greens in this modern day socialist articulation seeking to drag our society down. And we don't have to look far. We don't have to look far. We don't have to look further than Venezuela to see how this turns out. We don't have to look further than Venezuela to see how this, these utopian policies work out. Because in Venezuela, in Venezuela, we have a modern day living hell for the people of that once affluent country. And I want to quote from a journalist who I highly regard. His name is Anatoly Kermenev, and he's written um, extensively on Venezuela. And this is what he said. He spent five years in Venezuela. And he, he observed that what he saw in Venezuela was worse than anything he saw in the old Soviet Union as it was collapsing. And I'll quote from an article which he wrote. Quote, by the end of 2018, it will have shrunk, that's Venezuela, by an estimated 35 per cent since 2013, the steepest contraction in the country's 200-year history and the deepest recession anywhere in the world in decades. From 2014 to 2017, the poverty rate rose from 48 per cent to 87 per cent, according to a survey by the country's top universities. Some nine out of ten Venezuelans don't earn enough to meet basic needs. Children die from malnutrition and medicine shortages. Caracas has long been a dangerous yet vibrant city, but the crisis has transformed it into a zombie movie set. When I moved into my neighbourhood in Chaco, in the eastern part of the city, the streets were full of food stores, cafes and shops run by Portuguese, Italian and Syrian immigrants. Groups of young and old stayed in the streets, drinking beer or chatting into the small hours. But Chaco's 
streets are now empty after dark. Most of the streetlights no longer work, and the only people outside after 8 p.m. are homeless kids rummaging through garbage bags." End of quote. There is your socialist utopia. There it is in action. There is the result of your politics of envy, and there is the result of the ultimate equality, equality of misery doled out by government officials who are the only exception to that rule. Madam Acting Deputy President, I can predict the principles upon which the budget that is deli delivered tonight will be framed. And I can do that because I can draw upon the track record of this government. I know it will be a responsible budget. I, I know it will economically seek to target those who most need assistance at this point in time. And I know that because of the way the government has responded to the COVID-19 pandemic. And the principles which the Prime Minister put in place back in March have been adhered to. Any government policy has been targeted, temporary, proportionate and scalable. There haven't been any pink bat disasters under this government's watch. No over overly expensive school halls. No checks sent out to dead people. It's been targeted spending using existing delivery services. Targeted spending using existing delivery services. And I know that the driving force behind that budget will be a desire to make sure that people currently in a job get to keep that job and those who don't currently have jobs have the opportunity to find a job as quickly as possible. I would like to make a few comments in response to Senator Pratt's remarks. And I'd just say to her what she said does not, does not reflect my experience on the ground in my home state of Queensland. Just in the last week, I can draw on some experiences which draw out the truth of the matter. Two weeks ago, or a week ago now, I visited a building site where the land developer said that their new sale of land, new sales of land, had fallen off a cliff in March. When the government introduced its home builder subsidy, they went from a pre-COVID rate of sales of 20 per month to 100 sales in six weeks. 100 sales in six weeks. Absolutely transformative. As soon as a vacant lot of land in the Brisbane, Greater Brisbane region is released, it is snapped up by, in many cases, first home buyers. So that policy is working. That targeted policy providing support to one of our most fundamental industries is working. And when I visited charities and assistance organisations throughout the region in which I uh, focus, I also see the impacts of the effect of Australian federal government support in terms of emergency food relief and other aid which is being provided to the most vulnerable in our society. And I expect, I expect that principle of opportunity for all and support for those in need to be reflected in the budget which is being delivered by the Treasurer this evening. Thank you, Senator Scar. I call Senator Sheldon. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on this matter of public importance that instead of investing in Australia's future, the Morrison government is choosing inequality and climate collapse in its federal budget. Some of my other colleagues have spoken about the climate collapse, so I will focus my remarks on the Morrison government's choice to perpetuate inequality. The Morrison government hopes that COVID-19 has given us all amnesia. They want us all to forget how unequal and how weak our economy was before the pandemic hit. Trust me, millions of Australians that for years have faced stagnating wages and work insecurity have not forgotten. Let's take a look at where we were in December 2019. At that point, we had notched up six years of this government. The economy was slowing and had continued to slow after Scott Morrison had stabbed Malcolm Turnbull, the ex-PM, in the back. The economy was already not working for ordinary working families. Growth anemic, consumer confidence was down, unemployment was up, household spending was growing at its slowest pace since the global financial crisis. Retail trade was at its worst since the 1990s recession, 
and many retailers were shutting, on the, shutting up or on the brink of collapse. And household debt had surged to record levels and was at almost 200 per cent of disposable income. Household living standards were actually on the decline, with real household, household medium income lower than it had, was when this mob came to office in 2013. Business investment was tanking and was at its lowest level since the 1990s recession. Net government debt had already doubled since the Liberals and Nationals came to office and was at record highs. All of this was pre-COVID. Then there are many older Australians who are struggling, mostly those who do not, know, do not own their own homes or those who have little superannuation to access. And of course, ordinary families, men and women struggling to pay their bills, young people especially being forced to juggle multiple jobs and finding near impossible to get enough work where they can earn a decent wage and to get basic protections like sick leave and workers' compensation. So Prime Minister Morrison and Treasurer Frydenberg don't get to hide behind the pandemic and pretend that inequality was not already rampant. The other thing this government does not like to get out, they don't like to pull the, curtain, the COVID curtain over or go to the result that we saw a steep increase in intergener intergenerational inequality on their watch, worsening inequality which they have done little or nothing to mitigate. But if you compare across generations, you can see just how much harder it is for younger people today to reach these milestones my generation took for granted. Secure job, marriage, family and a home of their own. The average household age, aged between 55 to 64, is $300,000 richer than the same household back in 2003. If you go to the 64 to 74 age group, the difference is more than 500,000. Meanwhile, the picture for the 30, 25 to 34 age bracket is quite starkly different. Even before COVID hit, this generation was going backwards, and over that time frame, their wealth was already stagnating. There is a myth out there that younger Australians somehow are to blame for their own failure to accumulate wealth or buy a home because they spend their money on travel and eating out, the famous smashed avocado on toast example. Well, the problem with the smashed avocado story is that it's not true. Figures compiled by the Grattan Institute show that 25 to 34-year-olds save as big a proportion of their disposable income as did their elders. The difference is that today their savings can't keep up with surging asset prices and they cannot get housing and other assets of their own until much later, if at all, because they cannot get secure work. Insecure work is the biggest driver of inequality in this country. Insecure work persisted in the Australian labour market long existed and long before the market long before the COVID pandemic. The pandemic has shone a light on the consequences of insecure work for our entire society. This government has a historic choice. They can bake in the inequality that has been laid bare by this pandemic, or they can begin to address it by tackling what has become a two-tiered labour market. The world of increasingly insecure work and the inequality it creates is what will leave our children behind if we don't take steps now. The Morrison government needs to start valuing work again from the point of view of working people and the role it plays in their dignity and power and the opportunity it gives to them and their families to gain real economic freedom. If you don't think insecure work is a problem at the heart of the persistent inequality in our economy, I urge you to consider these statistics. The Australian Bureau of Statistics figures, jobs figures announced last month showed that 111,000 net new jobs were created in August. The ABS was at pains to point out that nearly every single one 
of the 111,000 net new jobs was of self-employed staff, not normal employees. Two-thirds of these new jobs were part-time. The conclusion that most economists are drawing from this, including Phil O'Donoghue from Deutsche Bank and Daniel Wood from the Grant Institute, is that most of these jobs were created in the gig economy. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with short-term contract and gig work if you have rights. In fact, in many industries, including trucking, which I know very much about, small business contractors are the norm. At the Transport Workers' Union, I often used to say that our owner driver members made us the largest small business organisation in the country, and it still stands. The problem with the gig economy is it uses as cover for those who would pay people less than the minimum wage and strip basic protection, protection from those hard-working Australians. This leads directly to a two-tier workforce, one with a group of people with rights to demand better without rights and a group who has no rights and a group that has rights that um, to, can demand better conditions. A two-tiered system. Gig workers are often deliberately misclassified as that second group, as contractors who miss out on superannuation, sick leave and compensation for injuries while at work. The platforms in many cases have tried to create a legal vacuum where they can underpay workers below the minimum wage. Food delivery workers are earning $10 an hour less with no paid leave, rideshare workers that can be fired from Uber with no risk course, even after working part-time or full-time with them for years. Depending on how you measure it, the gig and contracting economy is about 8 or 9 per cent of the workforce and rising. But the rapid emergence of the digital platform employers like Amazon, Uber, Deliveroo, Airtasker, etc has presented us with a new kind of challenge. In a recent survey from delivery riders for this month, drivers recently found that 71 per cent of these workers were struggling to pay bills and buy groceries. 36 per cent had been hurt or injured on the job, and of those workers, 81 per cent didn't receive any support from their company. 36 per cent hurt or injured, and 81 per cent receiving no support from their company. 63 per cent said they had been unfairly treated by the platforms, like having their account deleted without a chance to defend themselves. Well, that's the Prime Minister's brave new world. It should not be the rest of the country's. The lack of even the most basic protections make these workers incredibly vulnerable. There could be some steps that could to address many of these issues I've described and give us a path out of insecure work and therefore out of inequality. We need to fix our temporary migration system to stop employers using visa status as a means of exploiting migrant workers. We need to rethink the regulatory regime for labour hire. We need to invest in TAFE and universities to future-proof workplace skills. We need to be creative on Commonwealth procurement rules and corporate procurement. These are the sorts of things to make sure we have an equal economy, one that serves everybody. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. I call Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. Well, instead of investing in Australia's future, the Morrison government is choosing inequality and climate collapse in its federal budget. Now, we know this because the billions of dollars in fossil fuel subsidies that have long plagued this government's budgets will still be there tonight, and they've got this gas-led recovery that they're full steam ahead on despite the massive impacts to farmland, to groundwater, to our climate and to First Nations land rights. Uh, but full steam ahead for the government's corporate donors, their big mining mates, their millionaire mates, their lobbyist friends, their future employers. And inequality will be turbocharged because we know that the tax cuts that are being brought forward, that the cost of the PBO says roughly $28 billion, well, about $5 a week of that will end up in the pockets of people that earn less than $37,000, five bucks a week. People that are on uh, over $120,000 will get $50 a week. Well, 
Are people on less than 37,000 meant to be happy with $5 a week? If this government's got $28 billion to splurge on tax cuts, why do they just cut job seeker and job keeper? They've just ripped 300 bucks out of people's pockets a fortnight, and then they're giving back $5 a week to low-income earners, and they're supposed to be happy with that. So this budget will turbocharge inequality, and it will also turbocharge gender inequality. Now we know that the COVID crisis has exposed and exacerbated existing structural gender inequalities, and that women are fighting to maintain the progress that we've made in the past two decades, let alone move forward. According to the Women's Finance Index, the pandemic has reversed two years of growth in women's full-time employment. And for every month of COVID, it's added another year to the timeline for reaching gender wage parity. So we're at 36 years now before we'll see gender pay parity. Now, women drawing down their superannuation accounts to make it through the pandemic, when this government let them down so badly with the prescriptions on uh, job seeker and job keeper eligibility. Those women will really struggle to rebuild their retirement savings. And some al analysts have said that the early withdrawal of $20,000 now could mean $100,000 less in your uh, retirement balance when you retire, with compound interest, of course. On Equal Pay Day this year, the um, WGIA, uh, uh, Gender Equality Agency CEO Libby Lyons, said that a gender pay gap rose two percentage points during the global financial crisis, and it took a decade to recover. Now, we can't let that happen again. We can't afford another decade. The government's budget must invest to address inequality, and it must close the gender pay gap and the superannuation gap by permanently increasing job seeker and increasing wages in the lowest paid industries, which we know are feminised. It must invest in the care economy. Rather than private construction and brown infrastructure and tax cuts for the rich, um, the Australia Institute has uh, estimated that by investing in education and care, you'll actually create nine times as many jobs as construction and manufacturing, and not just more jobs for women, but more jobs for blokes too. Um, so there's actually no downsides to doing that, but this government's just on its ideological warpath. Now we also want this government to invest in free childcare to support parents, and in particular women, to return to the workforce. We had a taste of that. It was great. Bring it back. And we want, the, we want the government to give women a chance to rebuild their retirement savings by scrapping that $450 uh, superannuation contribution threshold. That means low-income earners, predominantly women, don't actually get super contributions from their employers. And of course, we want um, super to be paid on parental leave, as it should have been from the word go. Now, as predicted by women's services across the country, family and domestic violence has risen to epidemic levels during COVID, and it's expected to spike with ongoing economic insecurity during the recovery. As many as one in 10 women in relationships reported experiencing abuse during COVID, um, with half reporting that abuse had worsened and a third experiencing that violence for the first time. It is absolutely heartbreaking, and yet the meagre funding that's been provided by this mob has been too little and too slow. And just last week, they had the audacity to re-announce funding from February last year, which was already pitifully small, and try to make out that this was some pre-budget drop. And this is in the same week that the Women's Legal Service told the Senate committee that they've got to turn away 50 per cent of callers because their funding is not adequate. Now, women and children are not only trapped by violent partners, but by an underfunded system that fails to offer support when they escape. Services are stretched. The supply of crisis and long-term housing falls well short of demand. Childcare remains unaffordable, and work is increasingly insecure. Um, now, we welcome the reinstatement of the Time Use Survey and the expanded reporting tools provided to, to Wajia, but data collection means little if it's not reflected in policy. The announcements of the Women's Economic Security Statement is welcome, but it's no replacement for a gender lens on the budget. We don't want funds for kitchen renovations. We want gender equality. Oh, thank you, Senator Waters and Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. 
Instead of investing in Australia's future, the Morrison government is choosing inequality and climate collapse in its federal budget. The federal budget to be handed down tonight is many things. I'll start by saying that it's a real contradiction. After last year's big proclamation that we were back in the black after years of highly misleading and incorrect assertions that surpluses are all the evidence you need of good economic management, we are staring down the barrel of an enormous deficit. The economic response to COVID-19 has involved a level of government spending completely unseen in modern Australian political history. The liberal rule book was thrown out the window as the Conservatives realised that they would actually have to spend money on people and support their incomes in order to get us through this pandemic. Some of the response has been welcome. The Greens certainly welcomed the coronavirus supplement and secured its extension to those on payments, including youth allowance. We've fought to retain job seeker at the increased rate and also backed the continuation of JobKeeper wage subsidy at the $1,500 level. But the Liberals could not wait to cut these payments back. And now we have JobSeeker cut by hundreds of dollars a fortnight and JobKeeper slashed and tiered. The projected deficit in this budget will be big, but it's not because the Liberals are spending what they should be on supporting ordinary people in what has been, for many people, one of the toughest times in their lives. A centrepiece of this budget, handed down only seven months after our country was turned upside down by the pandemic, is going to be tax cuts. Tax cuts! These people really just can't help themselves. When they introduced their big tax cut package last year, this government said that the economy was doing so well. It was the perfect time to shrink the tax base and deliver these massive tax cuts that will overwhelmingly benefit higher income earners. Now that we're in the midst of the biggest economic crisis in living memory, apparently now is even more a perfect time and they want to bring them forward. So if the economy is doing fine, we need the tax cuts. And if the economy is in the toilet, we need the tax cuts. This budget is all ideology. It's a classic liberal slash and burn number while maintaining an appearance of investment in public and social services. This will also be a climate denialist budget. It's an utter failure when it comes to a green recovery. Coal and gas, coal and gas, that's the mantra of this government. You're pushing us down the cliff of climate collapse and inequality, and you're robbing young people and future generations of a hopeful future. Any budget that does not prioritize urgent cuts to greenhouse gas emissions, any budget that does not prioritize strong investment in renewables is a climate denialist budget. While we've been locked down, completely changing up how we live and work in order to get through this pandemic safely, the climate crisis has carried on and the Liberals and Nationals have their heads firmly in the sand still. I will be reading the budget papers with great interest tonight, but I do not expect much from this cruel climate-denying government. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. So the time for this discussion has now expired. I shall now proceed to the consideration of documents, and the documents are listed on pages five today, beg your pardon, five to seven of today's order of business, and we'll start with the documents on page five. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam De Deputy President. I take note of documents uh, 9, 10 and 11 on page 5 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, <coughs> leave is granted. I'll now move to page, uh, beg your pardon, Senator Seward, on page 7. No, page 5, sorry. But, uh, yeah, sorry. sorry, page 5, my um, bad. Sorry, I thought you'd moved on quick. <laughs> I was um, quick. You caught me. The, um, can I uh, take note of document 11 on page 5 and seek leave to continue yep. so my remarks? Senator Urquhart took oh, um, she, yep, as well, note of that one. Um, Senator Rice, are you seeking the call? Yep. Yes, uh, I am. Thank yep, you're right now. Yes, you're now. Thank you, Deputy President. 
Um, I, I wish to respond to the government's response to the interim report of the Senate inquiry into Australia's faunal extinction crisis. Which document is that? I haven't got the We're list there in yet. front of me. We're not there yet, Senator Rice. We're doing documents on page five, and I think we've finished with those. So we're now going to documents on page six. Uh, Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I take note of documents 16, 17, 19, and 21 on page six, and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Any other takers for page six documents? No. I'll now move to page seven. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I take note of document 29 and 34 on page seven and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Are there any other takers for documents on page seven? If not, I shall move to the tabling and consideration of committee reports and government responses, um, those presented out of sitting, and that is page eight. Yeah, okay. I'll just deal with Senator Urquhart because I'm assuming yeah, you're taking I'm note. I'm just taking note yeah. and seeking leave. So uh, if I can take note of document number 37 on page eight and Seek leave to continue my, my remarks. Is leave granted? Yes, leave is granted. Is anyone else taking note before I go to Senator Rice? And Senator Seawitt, if Senator Rice is moving to take note, she'll need your assistance or the assistance of Senator Waters. Senator Seawitt. Thank you. Um, I understand that Senator Rice would like to take note of item 36 on page 8 which is the Environment and Communications Reference Committee Interim Report on Australia's Faunal Extinction Crisis. Thank you. Senator Rice. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Seaworth, and thank you, Deputy President. Yes, I do wish to speak to the government's response to the interim report of our Senate inquiry into Australia's faunal extinction crisis, because I am just so insulted and so disgusted by it. And I speak on behalf of the hundreds of Australian animals, birds, fish, amphibian and reptile species whose very existence is hanging by a thread. And I speak on behalf of the over 13,000 people and organisations who made submissions into this extinction inquiry. I will be their voice in this parliament when the government is ignoring them. The government has chosen today, budget day, to reject the recommendations of the inquiry's interim report that I tabled 18 months ago in April last year. Our recommendations were very simple. We said that there should be new environment legislation to replace the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, given how this legislation has so comprehensively failed to protect our wildlife, and that we should establish an independent environment protection authority with sufficient powers and funding to oversee compliance with Australia's environment laws. And the government, in their response today, merely noted the first of these recommendations and rejected the, the second. And in their response, they had the audacity to talk about recommendations from Graham Samuel's current review into our environment laws, while at the same time they are trying to ram through legislation through this place before that review has even reported. Legislation that is a carbon copy of environment and climate destroying laws that Tony Abbott tried to introduce seven years ago. How insulting and how disgusting and how cynical of them to be tabling this response today on budget day when they are giving tax cuts to millionaires and giving yet more handouts to climate and environment destroying multinational companies. On budget day, when I can be guaranteed they will be announcing policies that are going to be turbocharging our extinction crisis, turbocharging our climate collapse, rather than taking action and investing the billions that they could be doing to, to address the existential threats to nature and to climate and to create tens of thousands of jobs in doing so. No, I mean, in regard to actions to protect our environment, 
I'm sure that the Treasurer tonight, well, they may throw a few crumbs to knock off a few feral cats and achieve little else. And meanwhile, our precious wildlife will continue to hurtle towards extinction. And it's not as if they don't know. They know. They know that the actions of their government and governments before them are killing our wildlife, our koalas, our swift parrots, our lead beaters possums, and they do not care. They are in bed with their mates in the coal and the gas industries and the mining companies and the native forest loggers, and they are willfully ignoring the evidence that is laid out so clearly in front of their very eyes. And what's worse is this, this interim report that they are responding to today was written and tabled way back in April last year. It was before the election. It was before last summer's mega fires, before the burning of a full fifth of our mainland forest, before the deaths of an estimated three billion animals in the fires. That's 120 animals each for each and every one of us, each and every person in Australia. And imagine that every one of us had 120 dead animals around us in a circle to mourn for. And those deaths, of course, were on top of the existing crisis. So how does the government respond in the midst of this crisis? They want to make the crisis worse. The Tony Abbott legislation that they are trying to ram through, far from strengthening our environment laws, is going to hand over power to the states, unwinding federal responsibility that has existed for the last 30 years. I mean, our two simple recommendations for new laws and for an independent EPA, an environment watchdog with teeth, are backed by the overwhelming majority of anyone who's got any insight or expertise in protecting our precious wildlife and who knows what needs to happen to halt our extinction crisis. And our report laid out in heart-wrenching detail the current state of our precious wildlife. I mean, some quotes from that report make that clear, that clear, that Australia has got one of the world's worst records for the extinction and lack of protection for threatened fauna, and it's ranked second in the world for ongoing biodiversity loss. That Eastern Australia is one of only 11 regions of the world undergoing, undergoing high deforestation and the only one in a developed country. And that Australia is now a global deforestation hotspot, standing next to places like the Amazon and Indonesia for deforestation. And the koala is now on the brink of extinction in many regions of Queensland and heading for extinction in New South Wales within decades. About 100 million native birds, reptiles and animals were killed because of destruction of their habitat in New South Wales in just seven years to 2005. This is a crisis that is unfolding before our very eyes, and it's not like the pressures that are driving these events are abating or diminishing. In fact, they're ramping up. And what's even worse is that there are large numbers of other species, poorly known but imperiled, that are at risk of extinction but not protected because we know so little about them. And what did our report say about our existing laws? That existing rate, extinction rates are accelerating because the underlying causes are not being addressed effectively by Australian governments, communities and industries, and laws and policies meant to protect against loss of species are not adequately implemented or often subsidiary in decision-making to development legislation. And that small initiatives and limited investment are insufficient to fully address a legacy of land clearing combined with growing pressure from population growth, expanding development, invasive species and climate change. I mean, this matters. This matters. The report tells us that the loss and decline of threatened species have potential ecological domino effects on other species and communities, including re reduction in species for pollination and seed and fruit dispersal and loss of environmental engineers, for example, mammals that burrow and dig. In WA, for example, the critically endangered boilie turns over large volumes of soil, dispersing seeds and fungi, improving water filtration, nutrient cycling, plant regeneration, and it reduces fire risk 
by lowering leaf litter loads. Professor Wintle from the Threatened Species Recovery Hub put it beautifully, that species have a right to exist and the loss of species degrades our society. We have a responsibility to pass on to future generations the wondrous natural heritage that we've been so fortunate to inherit. The ACF commented that extinction events can have profound cultural implications. There are deep connections between Indigenous culture and custom and Australia's wildlife. Extinction events break these connections. So the problem is stark, and the evidence of what we need to do to fix the problem is equally stark, yet denied by this government. I mean, and the conclusions that we reached in our interim report after hearing all this heartbreaking evidence were clear. We need new strong environment laws, and or our extinction crisis is just going to get worse. And we need an independent watchdog with teeth, with sufficient power and funding to oversee compliance with stronger laws. Yet after 18 months since we put these recommendations forward, the government just slaps us in the face. Prime Minister Morrison, you and your environment and wildlife destroying government, your government that gives tax cuts to millionaires, your government that props up coal and gas companies, that gives the green light to climate collapse, you are on notice. Australians care about our wildlife and they will not take this lying. Thank, thank you, thank Senator you. Rice. Um, Senator Faruqi. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Deputy President. Um, I would like to seek leave to take note of the government's response to the Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport References Committee report feasibility of a national horse traceability register for all horses and uh, make some comments. Uh, Senator Seawitt, um, just before I come to you, Senator Fruki, was Senator Rice seeking to continue her remarks? Thank you. And so that's uh, document number 38, Senator Faruqi. Thank you. Um, yeah. The Australian government delivered its response to the Senate inquiry into the feasibility of a national horse traceability register last month. The response agreed with or agreed in part with most of the 18 recommendations of the committee, including the establishment of a national horse traceability working group to progress the design, the development and the implementation of a national register. However, they are distancing themselves from the key ask of the federal government taking on this responsibility, showing leadership and driving the establishment of a national horse traceability register. I pushed for the establishment of the inquiry in early 2019 after learning more about some heartbreaking events. From Juliana and Mark Waugh, I learned more about the tragic loss of their 18-year-old daughter Sarah in a preventable horse riding incident in Dubbo Tafe in 2009. They have worked non-stop since then to improve rider safety. Their work has resulted in safety codes to regulate riding in New South Wales. But they have also been arguing for a national horse traceability register for safety and also for the good of the horse industry. And it's not just them. I can't actually think of an inquiry where stakeholders have been more aligned in wanting something to happen and unified in what it should be and they want the federal government to show leadership. Everyone from Ho Racing and Harness Racing Australia, horse breeding societies, farming peak bodies, biosecurity bodies, the Australian Veterinary Society, animal welfare organisations and the police understand the need for a national register and are in favour of one. While the inquiry was going on, we saw the shocking expose on ABC that revealed the extent of cruelty and animal abuse. We know that racehorses are thrown on the abattoir and knackery scrap heaps to meet a terrible fate when they are no longer profitable. Evidence the committee heard showed us that a birth to death national horse traceability register would have significant biosecurity and safety benefits. It would improve animal welfare and prevent animal cruelty through more transparency and accountability. Of course, the horse racing industry should also take the moral responsibility for the whole of life care of the thousands of animals that they breed for gambling and racing. 
there should be breeding caps and a dignified retirement plan for every single horse. It's now been close to a year since the committee reported, and eight months have passed since the working group was announced. When the government's response was tabled, it had not been established, let alone met. Finally, yesterday, we saw a media release from the Victorian Minister for Agriculture announcing the establishment of the working group and advising that we would meet for the first time later this month. This is certainly a welcome development. Let's be clear, though. The states and territories have an important role to play in the establishment of a register. But this is no reason for the federal government to distance itself from a national register and this issue. A national register requires national leadership. The federal minister needs to be part of and drive this process. No one wants to see this report gather dust in Minister Littleproud's office. The government needs to start work immediately. The community wants real action on safety, on biosecurity, and on animal welfare. And it is really time to get this done. I seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. And I'm assuming leave is granted to Senator Rice to continue her remarks. Senator Henderson. Much, Madam Deputy President. I'm pleased to speak to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights 11th Scrutiny Report of 2020, which was presented out of session on the 24th of September 2020. As usual, this report contains a technical examination of legislation with Australia's obligations under international human rights law. It sets out the committee's consideration of 32 bills introduced into the parliament between the 24th of August and the 3rd of September 2020 and 63 legislative instruments registered on the Federal Register of Legislation between the 28th of July and the 11th of August 2020. The committee is seeking further information in relation to six bills and one instrument. For example, the committee seeks further information about the Counter-Terrorism Legislation Amendment High Risk Terrorist Offenders Bill 2020. This bill would assist establish an extended supervision order scheme for high-risk terrorist offenders who have completed their custodial sentence or been subject to a continuing detention order. It would enable a court to impose any conditions on a person which was satisfied on the balance of probabilities were reasonably necessary and reasonably appropriate and adapted for the purposes of protecting the community from the unacceptable risk of the person committing a terrorism offence. This could include requiring that the person remain at specified premises uh, and it would also enable evidence to be withheld from the offender uh, but still used against them as well as triggering monitoring powers under other acts. The committee notes that an extended supervision order scheme may protect the public from harmful acts and so promote the right to life and security of the person. The committee also notes that these measures engage and may limit other human rights. For example, the committee seeks further information with respect to several human rights which may be permissibly limited where a limitation is prescribed by law pursues a legitimate objective, is effective to achieve that objective and proportionate. The committee also seeks information about the Crimes Legislation Amendment Economic Disruption Bill 2020. This bill seeks to introduce new offences which would apply absolute liability and reverse the legal burden of proof which engages the right to be presumed innocent. The bill also provides that undercover operatives may question children suspected of committing an offence without first allowing the child to communicate with a parent or guardian which engages the rights of the child. The committee is seeking further information in relation to these and other matters in the bill. I think it is uh, important to reiterate that the committee has not reached a concluded view as to these bills' compliance with human rights law where the committee seeks a response or further response from the relevant minister. The committee is seeking information as to whether particular limitations on rights which have been identified are permissible as a matter of international human rights law. Most rights can be properly limited 
if it is demonstrated that the limitation is reasonable, necessary and proportionate. I encourage all parliamentarians to carefully consider the committee's analysis and with these comments I commend the committee's report number 11 of 2020 to the chamber. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Henderson. You're not seeking to continue your remarks? Uh, no, I'm not. Thank you. Thank you. So the question is that the human rights report be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Are there, is there anyone else in the uh, shortness of time that just wishes to take note of documents on page eight? No? Okay. Um, Sorry, Senator Smith, how could I not see you? I was wondering that myself. Um, <laughs> Madam Deputy President, uh, with your indulgence, I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for a senator. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you very much. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator Macdonald from 6 to the 8th of October 2020 for personal matters. Uh, so the question is the motion is moved by Senator Smith be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Um, so we've dispensed with uh, tabling and consideration of committee reports. Um, are there any ministerial statements? Minister. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I table documents relating to the order for production of documents concerning Centrelink's compliance program. Thank you. Uh, Senator Brown. Um, I move to take note of the ministerial document. So what we saw here today in terms of the tabling of the document by the minister was again a government trying to cover up the robo-debt scandal. Throughout the public outcry, Senate inquiries, a flooded AAT uh, courts, court cases and a uh, class action, it has said nothing to see here. That's what the government has said. Nothing to see here. The system is working as intended. The Morrison government have attempted to stifle questioning of its decision making around the biggest social security scandal committed by a government against its people. That's what it's done. It has attempted to stifle questioning of its decision making around the biggest social security scandal committed by a government against its people. They have put roadblocks in the Senate Community Affairs References Committee's Centrelink Compliance Program inquiry in the form of the public interest immunity claims. We saw that again today, and we will continue to see it by this government. Thank you, um, Senator Brown. You will be in continuation. I now advise. Yes, leave is granted. Thank you. Leave is granted. I now advise senators that the sitting of the Senate is suspended until 8:30 p.m.
Thank you, Senators. I call the Leader of the Government, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, President. I tabled a budget statement for 2020 21 and other documents as listed on the dynamic red. Uh, I seek leave to move a motion uh, relating to the documents. This leave, leave is granted. Senator Coleman. Uh, I thank the Senate. I move that the Senate uh, take note of the budget statement and documents and move that the debate be now. Well, I might speak to it now. So, <laughs> And then I move that the debate be now adjourned. <laughs> Uh, I, was, I was just making sure that everybody was on their, on their guards. How many times have you done this? This is the first time that I'm doing it this way. It's, a, it's an innovation. It's, 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 a, it's, 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 it's an innovation. When, when, I, when I first, um, when I first uh, uh, tabled these budget statements in the Senate, Mr. President, uh, it had been long standing convention that budget statements be tabled at 8 p.m. And it was always difficult because treasurers of both political persuasion sort of were stretching uh, the half hour that the budget debate were meant to be in. It was sort of, I had to leave uh, the uh, treasurer's speech early, and so we delayed it from 8 to 8.30. So tonight there's another innovation. Um, I'm making a short, brief uh, contribution as I'm tabling the um, budget statements. You know, you've got to keep the innovation going. Uh, Mr. President, uh, for every one of our first six budgets, uh, a key budget message has been a uh, focus on the importance of our budget repair effort uh, to underpin uh, our strength and resilience in the face of any global economic headwinds that may come our way. Uh, no one <laughs> expected a storm of the magnitude Australia and the world had to confront this year, but the hard work we have done as a nation uh, during our first six years in government uh, put us in a strong position uh, to do what needed to be done when the pandemic and the COVID recession hit. Uh, the budget uh, the Treasurer has delivered and which I just uh, tabled in the Senate tonight uh, is our plan uh, to get Australia out of the COVID recession. Uh, it's a plan uh, for hope and opportunity and it is our plan for jobs. Uh, to keep saving jobs, to restore the jobs that were lost, uh, to create as many new jobs across the economy as possible. Uh, as we set out to grow out of this COVID recession, <laughs> private sector businesses across Australia will be the key to the jobs recovery and the jobs growth our economy needs and which our budget needs. That's why in this budget, most of the fiscal support is aimed at giving businesses the confidence to invest in their future growth and success because genuinely viable, profitable, growing businesses will hire more Australians. And those Australians will pay more in income tax, while fewer will have to rely on income support. Now, just based on parameter variations, uh, uh, let me make a number of observations about our fiscal position as reflected in this budget. Uh, it is self-evidently a challenging fiscal position. It is not the fiscal position we expected to be reporting on in this budget uh, this time last year. But when the crisis hit, we had the fiscal firepower to deal with it. Uh, we're now facing significant deficits and for Australia, historically significant levels of debt. Uh, our deficit ex is expected to peak at 11% of GDP this financial year before falling to 1.6% of GDP at the end of the medium term. Uh, net debt is expected to peak just below 44%, while gross debt is increasing before stabilising at around 55% of GDP. But while this is higher than we're used to, it remains sustainable and it remains low compared with most advanced economies globally, particularly in this current global economic context. Debt sustainability will also be assisted by historically low interest rates. And as I've said, in this chamber and at various occasions before. We all know why we're here. We're here because of the fiscal impact, firstly, of the COVID recession on our tax receipts and our welfare payments. And we're also here because of the fiscal impact of the policy measures we had to put in place to support our health system, to cushion the blow on the economy and on jobs, and now to facilitate the strongest possible recovery moving forward. Just based on parameter variations, uh, not policy decisions by government, but parameter variations, 
Tax receipts are down by $41.6 billion and payments are up by $18.9 billion in the 2020-21 financial year alone. Over the forward estimates, tax receipts are down by a whopping $227 billion and payments up by $47.8 billion. Again, none of that based on decisions of government but because of parameter variations driven by the economic impact of the COVID recession on tax receipts and welfare payments. Importantly, the fiscal impact of our deliberate policy decisions to provide fiscal support is very much temporary. And I've commended to my uh, colleagues and I commend to the Chamber uh, to uh, refer to uh, Budget Paper 1, page 3-30, which has got a graph uh, which uh, illustrates that very well, where you can see the temporary nature of the fiscal support and how the payment uh, trajectory uh, goes back to what it was uh, pretty well uh, is aligned and goes back to what it was expected to be in my EFO 2019-20 uh, before uh, the um, coronavirus uh, pandemic hit. To illustrate uh, that point, average annual real growth in payments over the four years from 2020-21 is expected to be just 1.7 per cent per annum. That is actually very low by historical standards and might at first blush appear to be counterintuitive. But somewhat uniquely in this budget, real payments growth is highly variable across the forward estimates years. This reflects the temporary nature of the policy decisions we made in response to the COVID recession, with especially significant investments in the 2019, 20 and 2020, 21 financial years. The combined effect of the economic impact and the impact of policy decisions on our payments in this financial year, 2020-21, is expected to lead to real growth in payments of 22.6 per cent, the highest certainly since 1970-71, uh, which is how far uh, back the time series published in the budget paper goes for. However, this is followed by a real reduction in payments of 17.5 per cent in 2021-22 and a further 0.6 per cent real reduction. Uh, in payments in 2022-23. As, as the economy recovers and temporary support measures are gradually withdrawn, the level of payments is expected to continue to decline from the peak in 2020-21 and over the medium term and bro broadly return to levels projected uh, at the 2019-20 mid-year economic and fiscal outlook. This very much demonstrates the targeted and time-limited nature of the government's response to the pandemic and the resulting COVID recession. So finally, uh, Mr. President, let me finish uh, my brief remarks where I started. Uh, this budget uh, is our plan to get Australia out of the COVID recession. It is our plan for jobs, jobs restored and more new jobs created by genuinely viable, profitable businesses is what our economy needs and what our budget needs. It's what will give Australians hope and the opportunity to get ahead and it will ensure we can restore our public finances and continue to guarantee the essential services Australians rely on. And uh, Mr. President, if it's appropriate, uh, I now propose to, that the debate be now adjourned. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, I table uh, particulars of proposed and certain expenditure for 2020-21 and seek leave to move a motion to refer the documents to legislation committees. Leave is granted. Senator Corbyn. I thank the Senate. I move that the documents be referred to committees uh, for um, examination and report. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. I table the portfolio budget statements for 2020-21 for the Department of the Senate, the Parliamentary Budget Office and the Department of Parliamentary Services. Senator Cormann. Um, I table portfolio budget statements for 2020-21 for portfolios and executive departments as listed on the dynamic red. So before we move to adjournment, I just have a message, a couple of messages to read. I have received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence. Defence Legislation Amendment Enhancement of Defence Force Response to Emergencies Bill 2020 and Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Amendment Streamlining Environmental Approvals Bill 2020. Senator Cormann. Um, these bills are being introduced together. After debate on the motion for the second reading, 
has been adjourned. I shall move a motion to have the bills listed separately. I move that these bills might proceed without formalities. It's the way it's no, no, no. It's like it's like the way it's been put to me. I think somebody made a mistake in my script. I'm just following the script. I'm, I'm sort of a bit intrigued myself. I move that these bills may, be, may proceed without formalities, may be taken together and be now read a first time. The question is the bills be read a first time. Um, those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to the Australian Defence Force and for related purposes. A bill for an act to amend the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act 1999 and for related purposes. Senator Cormann. <laughs> I'm now wondering about the script. Uh, I move that these bills be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches uh, incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Cormann. I move that the debate be now adjourned. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Cormann. Uh, I move that the bills be listed as uh, separate uh, orders of the day. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. I have just a couple, some more messages. I have received a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that the House has agreed to the amendments made by the Senate to the Payment Times Reporting Bill 2020. I have received a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate of changes in the membership of the Joint Select Committee on Australia's Family Law System. I have received messages from His Excellency the Governor-General notifying assent to 15 laws, details of which will be incorporated in Hansard. I have received letters requesting changes in the membership of committees. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I seek leave to move a motion to vary the membership of committees. Leave is granted. Senator Cormann. I move that uh, senators be discharged from and uh, appointed two committees uh, as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed on the dynamic red. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. I'm looking at the clerk and we can now proceed. Um, I propose that the Senate do now adjourn, and I'll give senators a moment to take seats or leave the chamber before I call the first speaker on the adjournment debate, as a courtesy to our colleagues. I'm going to ask senators so I can commence the adjournment debate to either vacate the chamber or take a seat, as a courtesy to colleagues. Senator Abetz. Thank you, Mr. President. In 1988, President Ronald Reagan inaugurated October the 15th as National Pregnancy and Infant Loss Remembrance Day. It has been observed ever since. Tasmania and some other states recognise it as well it might be time for us to consider doing so on a national basis. Those of us blessed with the gift of children will know the joy and fulfilment they bring. Those of us that have experienced the devastation of a miscarriage will know the heartbreak and shattering of dreams that such an event brings in its wake. The loss of a later term child or a stillbirth or death shortly after birth must be indescribably heartbreaking. In, recogn in recognition of this, the stillborn baby payment is offered by the federal government. This payment is equivalent to the sum of the newborn supplement and newborn upfront payment. So far, so good. In June 2019, I was alerted to a Devonport lady, Mrs Vicky Purnell's wonderful charity work known as Bridies, Blossoms and Blessings, a self-funded project in Tasmania the founder making clothing layettes, quilts and keepsake packages and gifts them to families who experience the tragedy of stillbirth and miscarriage. It was for this wonderful work that Mrs Purnell was rightly awarded the Tasmanian Local Hero Award in the 2019 Australian of the Year Awards. In writing to congratulate her on her recognition, Mrs Purnell responded by drawing attention that earlier in that year she had come across a family with limited financial resources which had experienced the unthinkable tragedy of having a second stillborn child. In their devastation, 
They also discovered that they were entitled to a lesser sum of money than previously for the bizarrest of all reasons, namely, it was not their first stillborn child. This family of limited means was forced to take out a personal loan to make up the shortfall of the funeral expenses to farewell their baby with love, dignity and respect. It begged the question in Mrs Purnell's mind, as it then did in mine, when I learnt about this inequity, as to why this inequity existed. Surely we can all be agreed that parents are not in the habit of giving birth to stillborn babies in order to have a financial gain. It, of course, costs no less to confront a second stillborn than it does a first. There appeared no justifiable public policy rationale for this situation. Mrs Purnell advocated against this glaring inconsistency in the Centrelink benefit and asked that it be rectified. It was my privilege to be able to take up this cause with the Minister for Families and Social Services. On becoming aware of this, the Minister requested further information from her department to consider whether there could be a way forward. In tonight's budget, that inequity was rectified. There was a way forward. I have no doubt that other funding matters will take precedence in the reporting of tonight's budget and grab the headlines, as in fairness they quite rightly ought. Nevertheless, I believe that the remedying of this inequity because of the advocacy of Mrs Purnell is worth, uh, worthy of mention and celebration. It shows many good things about our democracy. An individual with a concern can raise it with a local representative who can elevate it to the ministerial and then cabinet level, which in turn sees it incorporated in a budget. Our democracy, for all its perceived failings, does work and is effective. Individuals like Mrs Purnell can make a difference and change the federal budget. Because of Mrs Purnell, tonight's budget, with all its difficulties, with all its concerns for the future, has resolved an inequity and will, I am sure, make life easier for many people in the future who suffer the tragedy of more than one stillborn child. It was a privilege to be able to advocate for the change. The minister deserves our appreciation for effecting the change. More importantly, congratulations to Mrs Purnell for alerting the government to the inequity, enabling its rectification. Many mothers, in particular, will be grateful to Tasmania's 2019 local hero, Vicky Purnell, for her efforts. Thank you, Senator Betts. Senator Seward. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. On September the 25th, the government cut the COVID supplement by $300 a fortnight, thereby dropping more than 1.8 million people on income support below the poverty line. This cut means that four in five people on JobSeeker will now be forced to skip meals, and almost half of JobSeeker recipients will be forced to ration their medication. Despite this, the government hasn't done any modelling or looked at the impacts that cutting the COVID supplement will have on people in our community. A num I asked the community what the COVID supplement cut during a recession would mean to them, and I've been overwhelmed with response from people sharing their experiences, their experiences of how this cut will impact themselves and their families. Because the government wouldn't even take the time to measure how the cuts to JobSeeker will impact our community, I thought it was important that I share what I've learned from people. And I, these are people's experiences and concerns that they've raised with me. Because we have a mortgage and are not renting, we don't get rent assistance. We are both over 55 and probably won't work again. It's likely that we will lose our home. It means that I can't afford my prescriptions or specialist visits. I need dental work but can't afford that either. I have a back injury and an, and an autoimmune disease, but I'm not considered disabled enough to qualify for the disability support pension. Another person said, I, assessed, I accessed my super so I could escape an abusive relationship. I used it to, to pay a bond and six months rent. I live alone and, pay, and the rent is $620 a fortnight. 
I also need to pay for electricity, my phone, gas and food. Job seeker simply isn't enough for me to survive on. Another person. After paying all my electricity bills, I have $40 a week for food and fuel. I have tried to find a job since I lost mine in March and had no luck. Not even grocery stores will accept me. Not working is not through lack of trying. There are now hundreds of other people going for the same positions. Because I'm a student at the same time, nobody will give me a second look because it could impact my availability. I am a 61-year-old woman with a bachelor's degree in social sciences. I highly doubt I'll re-enter the workforce again. Employment depends not only on someone's experience and qualifications, but very much by discrimination by age, gender, marital status, ability or disability. I very often feel discriminated against and pushed into poverty for reasons that are beyond my control. I have no idea how I'm going to survive on JobSeeker now that it has been reduced by $300 a fortnight. I will struggle to afford rent along with medications for my mental health. One of the bills I will struggle to pay is my private health insurance. I have it because I am trying to receive the best treatment for my ill mental health so I can work again. I'm terrified that I'll have to go back to food parcels and not be able to eat well to stay healthy. I need a higher rate of job seeker for a little bit longer while I receive my treatment so I can be able to work again. These are just some of the experiences that, have, that I have um, received from people who have shared um, their um, accounts with me. And what clearly this shows is that despite what the government says, their buzzwords, we are not all in this together. We are simply not if the government hasn't even bothered to look at what the impact of cutting the coronavirus supplement and I can already hear the government yelling, we didn't cut it. Yes, you did. You've cut the money that goes into someone's pocket. And these experiences here outline just how it is going to impact people. Magnify those accounts that I've just outlined by the over a million people, the 1.8 million people who have suffered a $300 cut per fortnight while we're still in the pandemic situation, while we are in recession. People will lose their homes. They are, will be living in poverty. poverty. Poverty in and of itself is a barrier to employment. This isn't good enough. We need a permanent increase to JobSeeker. Thank you, Senator Seward. Senator Antic. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise tonight to speak regarding the enduring plight of the Uyghur people of East Turkestan, or sometimes referred to as Xinjiang, at the hands of the Chinese Communist Party. The Uyghur people are the original inhabitants of the region of Xinjiang and have a rich history and culture, one that dates back thousands of years. The Australian Strategic Policy Institute recently launched the Xinjiang Data Project, which details the CCP's detention systems and cultural destruction in Xinjiang. The ASPI has identified 380 sites, including re-education camps, detention centres and prisons, many of which have been built or expanded since 2017. The ASPI also estimates approximately 16,000 mosques across Xinjiang have been destroyed or damaged since 2017. In July 2020, Foreign Policy magazine exposed the horrific realities that take place in these detention facilities which include allegations of abuse, torture, rape, murder, people being subjected to electrocution and injections of an unknown substance. According to the ASPI, a new facility was opened in January 2020. It's surrounded by a 14-metre high wall with a 10-metre high watchtower with at various points along the wall. It contains 13 residential buildings, each five storeys tall, totalling 100,000 square metres of space and capable of housing 10,000 people. But the plan runs deeper than simply targeting the current Uyghur population. It involves the prevention of their future populations, and reports have now emerged of the CCP using birth control methods to reduce the fertility of the population, including sterilisation, forced insertion of intrauterine devices to, to prevent pregnancy. This has had the effect of 
uh, dropping the birth rates in the Xinjiang region by 24 per cent uh, last year and 60 to 80 per cent decreases in population growth in highly populated Uyghur areas. At a conference recently in Xinjiang, President Xi explained that it was necessary to educate Xinjiang's population on an understanding of the Chinese nation and guide all ethnic groups on establishing a correct perspective on the country, the history and nationality. He added that this is completely correct and should be a long-term approach. Now, the Australian government has consistently called for, China and the arbitrary, called for China to end the arbitrary detention of Uyghur people. Uh, the, these actions are completely at odds with Australian values. South Australia is home to a large Uyghur community to whom these matters are extremely important, as they are to, more Australians, to, to Australians more broadly. The South Australian Xinjiang Association is a community-based organisation in my home state. But it's difficult to find much information in relation to the South Australian Xinjiang Association, and unfortunately uh, it appears very difficult to locate a street address, a registered office, an email address or even a phone number. So it's with this in mind that I reviewed their Facebook page to see if they'd made any statements regarding the treatment of Uyghur people from the region which they represent. And despite their logo showing two hands shaking combined with what seems to be Mandarin symbols and Uyghur Arabic script, there appears to be no mention made of the matters I referred to earlier. Now, last week in Adelaide's Advertiser newspaper, the South Australian Xinjiang Association was quoted as saying, our association is not in any way linked to the Chinese Communist Party's United, Work Front, United uh, Front Work Department, and our association's role is to provide community and social activities to support migrants and their families from Xinjiang, as well as the broader Australian Chinese community. So with that in mind, I have no doubt that an expression of condemnation by this organisation in relation to the treatment of Uyghur people by the CCP would be much valued and of significant support to the local Uyghur, Uyghur community. And as a consequence of same, of same, tonight I call upon the South Australian Xinjiang Association to make a public statement condemning the treatment of the Uyghur people of Xinjiang. And when a point of contact can actually be established, I'll be writing to that association in those terms. The Uyghur people deserve this simple act of support. Thank you, Senator Antic. Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I rose to tell the stories of two food delivery workers who have lost their lives in Sydney in the past fortnight. These two workers represent a group of workers forgotten by this government. On Sunday, the 27th of September, DD Freedy died following a crash with a car in Marrickville, three days earlier while working for Uber Eats. He leaves behind his wife and family in Indonesia. On the 29th of September, Xiao Zhu Jin died while involved in a crash with a bus in Zetland while working for Hungry Panda. He was working in Australia and financially supporting his wife, two children and their grandparents back home in China. He leaves behind his dependent family, now unable to make ends meet without money that he was sending home. Xiao Jun's wife is now urgently seeking a visa to come to Australia to collect the body of her husband and grieve for him. Their deaths are tragedies to their families and friends. Their brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, children are now deprived of their loved ones by an industry that looks the other way on safety cares nothing about the pressure it places on its workers and neglects them for, to fulfil its obligations to them. Too often these deaths are not reported in the rel to the relevant agency as their companies view them as contractors. I, along with the Transport Workers' Union, am calling for Safe Work New South Wales to investigate these cases, the companies involved, and clarify what obligations must be placed on their employers. For too long, our federal parliament has sat idly by while the future of work has well and truly arrived. No longer the sharing economy, its supporters like to trumpet. This has become the gig or on-demand economy in which worker sits anxiously by an app waiting for the next paycheck. Just like the hungry mile of the Depression, you can walk the busy streets of any commercial area in our capital cities and see tens of people queuing with helmets and bikes, checking their phones, waiting for a job to be given to them. 
A recent survey of food delivery riders and drivers found that more than 70 per cent were struggling to pay their bills and pay groceries. A third of them had been hurt or injured while working for the vast majority, whilst the vast majority receiving no support from their employer. 88 per cent had seen their delivery payments decrease over the time they had worked in the industry. One writer said, we are hardly making $10 an hour. Please help us. The coalition has thought too long about what they can simply, whilst they can simply ignore the problems of the gig economy and simply hope to reap the benefits. These politicians have championed innovation while ignoring the growing electronic hungry mile of many desperate workers working too many hours for too little pay, putting their safety at risk for the sake of making ends meet. The benefits of convenience for this industry will never outweigh the cost to our society which we fail to regulate these new forms of work. Our laws have become hopelessly out of date by the changes in our economy. It's not just employees that need rights, it's workers that also need rights, all workers. Companies are increasingly dreaming up new ways to shirk their responsibility to their workers, using technology to allocate work to supposed contractors whilst denying rights to bargain, to set their own wages or to own their own data. The gig economy has become just another loophole for companies to fit through. Just like reducing their tax obligations through creative counting, they invade their industrial obligations through creative software. This parliament must act to grant workers rights, rights to irrespective if you are a part-time, casual, a contractor or full-time employee. If you are a worker, you should have rights, working rights, rights to collective bargaining and freedom of association and representation, that the rights of employees be broadened to include all workers, that our tribunals be given the power to inspect and intervene in all emerging forms of work to protect all workers. It is for the family and friends of DD Freed and Xiao Shu Xin that we take up this fight. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr. President. Last week, I visited Port Stevens to meet with community members who have been raising the plight of koalas in the area, in particular the destruction of 52 hectares of prime koala habitat for expanding the Brandy Hill Quarry. Um, thank you to Brandy Hill and CM Action Group, Port Stevens Koalas, Eco Network, and countless people who have been campaigning with passion, with commitment, with resilience to save our irreplaceable wildlife. They are rightly concerned about the irreversible loss of koala habitat and koalas in this area if this mine expansion is allowed to go ahead. In New South Wales, at least 5,000 koalas died in the climate-induced bushfires earlier this year. Since the Liberal National Government in New South Wales introduced their land clearing laws under which 99% of koala habitat can be chopped down, we have seen a 13-fold increase in land clearing approvals. Even before these disastrous laws, koala populations had already shrunk by one quarter over 20 years, according to the New South Wales chief scientist. We are sitting on a time bomb here. Koalas are facing extinction by 2050 if we don't take urgent action. My fear is that if we continue on this tra trajectory, our next generation will not see any koalas in the wild, in the bush, in our national parks. The only koalas that they might see are in the zoo or in a museum. And that would be devastating. And Australia without koalas? That doesn't even bear thinking about. But not only must we think about it, we must do everything possible to prevent it. And that's why it is crucial that the Federal Environment Minister, Susan Lee, rejects the proposal to expand the Brandy Hill Quarry. She has the power to do something good here. This is the time to stand up for the environment, not against it. In contrast to the reckless, irresponsible New South Wales government, which fast-tracked the approval of the quarry expansion a couple of months ago, knowing full well 
that it would affect koalas and other endangered species such as the gray-headed flying fox. The Port Stephen koalas are at high risk of local extinction. The koala survey report completed on behalf of the developer found that the project would result in a significant impact to the koalas. A recent assessment of the impact of the quarry expansion on the koala and its habitat undertaken by experts from the University of New Castle found koalas breeding within one kilometer of the current quarry boundary. Expansion of the site will be a disaster for koalas as it will destroy critical habitat. No amount of biodiversity offsetting can bring back habitat that has been destroyed. Offsetting is a total and complete scam. Once a critical habitat is gone, it's gone forever. We also know that there's no quality assurance process, no appropriate system to map offsets, and offsets for some matters of national environmental significance are increasingly not possible due to lack of suitable locations. You can't say koalas are a national treasure and then greenlight their destruction. It was so hypocritical of the New South Wales Environment Minister, whose government fast-tracked koala destruction, to then turn around and effectively ask Minister Lee to stop it. But it's also an admission of willful wrongdoing, and that's exactly what the New South Wales government does again and again, egged on and held to ransom by their junior partners, the koala-hating anti-environment nationals. The recent revelations that New South Wales national leader John Barillaro insisted that logging continue in state forests after the devastation of the bushfires and against the pleas of the New South Wales EPA. The koala implosion they had a few weeks ago shows us the rot that is at the heart of the National Party when it comes to the environment. They don't even pretend to care anymore. They are completely disconnected from the people that they represent. They are nothing but greedy, hollow men. Luckily, we still have laws under the EPBC Act that are a line of defense against weak state environmental protections. The fate of the Port Stephen koalas is now in the hands of Minister Lee. They have, you have the power, Minister, to save these iconic koalas. I know you care for animals. As the Environment Minister, you have an obligation to stop the decline and demise of koalas. There is only one decision that you should make. Reject the Brandy Hill Quarry. The koalas and future generations will be forever grateful. Senator Stoker, are you seeking the call for a five-minute adjournment? In that case, um, you will forfeit your adjournment if you don't take it right now. If not, I'll go to Senator Rickard. Thank you very much. Mr Acting Deputy President, the budget we have received tonight is an important one for the Australian people, but it was made possible because of the excellent economic management of this government before the COVID virus hit and because of the strong and decisive leadership of the Morrison government post-COVID. It recognises that the best way to pay off a nation's debt is to grow the economy. And the best way to do that is to promote investment, to invest in infrastructure and to leverage more investment from Australians in the businesses and jobs that are needed for economic recovery. But can I say, Mr Acting Deputy President, it is with great sadness that I say Right now, Queensland does not have that same kind of leadership. Queensland had the worst unemployment rate well before the COVID virus hit. It had the highest debt of any state government in the country before the COVID virus hit. It lacked leadership. It was just lazy and populist politics every day of the week. But there's an opportunity to change that coming up very soon, and that is by electing a majority LNP government on the 31st of October. To get that, Queenslanders must vote one for the LNP. What history tells us time and time again is that having a flutter with the minor parties simply delivers a Labor-Greens minority government time and time again. Don't risk it. There's no time for that. So, going into the end of this month, 
Nine seats are needed for the LNP to win government, and it doesn't need to be just any. <laughs> it can be more, that's fine. But there are so many great candidates from our side right across the state. And so I'm hugely proud that there are now more than 20 outstanding female candidates that have been selected by the LNP to go into this election, selected on their merit, selected because of the attributes they bring from quality life experience to the job, and they are ready and raring to go, already working so hard in their local communities to contribute. And so I thought I'd mention just a few of them who are really very impressive. In Gavin, we have Kirsten Jackson, who's a mum, a business owner, someone who understands the daily challenges faced by small businesses. And boy, is she a stark contrast to the political hack incumbent. The incumbent, who was handed a plum assistant ministry for tourism, but has utterly abandoned Gold Coast tourism operators during their time of need when COVID has meant they are needed most. And so she has a passion for the industries and for the people that make the Gold Coast great. In Springwood, we have Kiralee Bolton, running for the LNP against yet another Labor union hack turned underwhelming minister, whose greatest achievement in this term has, not, has been not being sacked for blatantly misusing taxpayer funds in the way that people opposite have complained so much about in the past. Would a Senator Stoker, I just remind you of Standing Order 193, uh, which says that uh, you should not use offensive words against members of either this House or a state or territory parliament. I withdraw, Mr Acton Deputy President. Yes. Thank you. Yes. And on the crossroads of the M1, the Gateway and the Logan Motorway, the potential of the Springwood electorate is enormous, and it can only be achieved by electing a majority Frecklington LNP government, including um, the great benefits that would be reaped from the second M1 at that important location. In Mansfield, we've got the amazing, dynamic Janet Wishart, and she has had a career that is all about public service, helping people work through um, the time of need, working through disability, working through some of the most heart-wrenching circumstances people could possibly experience. In Maywa, Lauren Day, a former journalist, mother of two, wife of a policeman, is an utter superstar, an energetic um, achiever that would just kick goals for her local area. For those in Aspley, Amanda Cooper needs no introduction. For over a decade, she's represented and delivered for this region as a member of Brisbane City Council, and her husband and she have raised three children in that local community. Now, in Morani is a favourite of mine, Tracy Newitt, trucker Trace, drives a road train. She's got everything Order, you need to succeed, and there's so expired. many more. Senator Green. Thank you so much. Um, what, a, what a speech from the um, uh, senator opposite, um, talking about the next, federal, the next state election, with absolute hypocrisy to bring up the fact that what the LNP wants is supposedly a majority government, and yet they've chosen, they've chosen to preference minor parties across the state. But I'll get to that a little bit later. Last week we saw millions and millions of dollars taken out of local economies all across regional Queensland. When JobKeeper was cut and JobSeeker was cut back from the communities that need it the most. JobKeeper cuts in Leichhardt affected 7,179 businesses and 27,000 workers. That's the equivalent to $24.3 million per fortnight coming out of the economy in Cairns and Leichhardt. The communities that need it the most had, their, had the money and the support that they need right now cut back by the Morrison government. In Leichhardt, uh, when job seeker cuts came in, $5.82 million was ripped out of the economy per fortnight. Extraordinary amount of money being cut back from the LNP. But we know 
from experience that the LNP likes to make a lot of promises and announcements before elections. Not very good at following up on the delivery of those announcements. But it is only after polling day in Queensland when Queenslanders actually find out what the LNP stands for and what nasty surprises they have waiting for them. Queenslanders will never ever forget when Campbell Newman promised public servants that they had nothing to fear under an LNP government. Fast forward to three months after the election and Campbell Newman unveiled plans to sack 20,000 workers. 20,000 workers lost their job under the LNP after the Campbell Newman had promised them that they had nothing to fear. And when the axe finally fell on 14,000 workers, guess who, is Ca who Campbell Newman's apprentice and assistant, assistant treasurer was? Who was the assistant treasurer when 14,000 public servants were sacked in Queensland? Well, it was none other than Deb Franklinton. She was right there next to him, making every single decision, sending 14,000 public servants on their way home, sacked them made sure that that 14,000 people in Queensland wouldn't be able to provide for their families. Order. Standing Order 193 prevents reflections and imputations of improper motives and personal reflections on members of this Senate, the House and state chambers. I require you to withdraw that. Thank you. I withdraw. You have the call. It is true, though, that 14,000 people were sacked in Queensland under the Campbell Newman government. We know that. And what we also know is that the LNP opposition under Deb Franklinton right now has $23 billion in election promises that they are unable to tell the people of Queensland right now how they're going to pay for those promises. That is because we know that in the LNP DNA is cuts, cuts, cuts. Public servants weren't the only ones to get the chop under Campbell Newman. Who will they cut this time? Last time, they cut nurses and police officers, and people in regional towns will never, ever forget. You knock on doors in regional Queensland and you meet nurses who got sacked under Campbell Newman. Order. The LNP won't maintain Order. the Senator growth Smith. needed for health staff to keep up with the demand over the next four years, and that is what we know. And I'll take that interjection because the scars that went deep that Campbell Newman inflicted when Deb Franklinton was his assistant treasurer will never be forgotten Order. by the Senator people in Green, Queensland. You are still required to use the correct titles, even though they're members of an, another parliament. Well, she was the assistant treasurer. Now she's the leader of the opposition, and when she was the assistant treasurer. She cut the guts out of the public service in Queensland, including nurses. Imagine what would have happened under the LNP, under a health crisis. A government that cuts nurses cannot keep Queensland safe. Senator Rickard. Thank you. Pity President. In late June this year, I received an email from a constituent on the northwest coast of Tassie um, who wrote to me, and what I want to do is actually, it's quite bizarre, I want to read her email out, but she wrote to me after an experience um, with a number of paramedics, a number of doctors, and she wanted somehow to express her gratitude to those people for the support that they had given her, and she didn't know how to do it. Um, so I wrote back to her and I said, well, look, I'm very happy to raise that matter through the Senate and give those people the absolute recognition that they deserve. The subject in her email line was a heart song story in a time of COVID-19. She said, two weeks ago, I survived a massive heart attack and within two hours was treated by two paramedics and a cardiac nurse at my home in La Trobe. I said my goodbyes to my 17-year-old son in case it was a forever goodbye. Then to the Mersey Community Hospital and back into the ambulance, rushed to Launceston General Hospital and had a stent inserted into an artery which was 100% blocked. They saved my life and today 
my son sits his last year 12 mid-year exam. The reason was so significant is that I have complex PTSD, severe depressive disorder, anxiety and panic attacks, body dysmorphia and agoraphobia. I have rarely left my house in two and a half years. Being in lockdown was easy for me. Three days in hospital should have had me reeling, but it didn't. In fact, these amazing people, from the paramedics at my home to the nurse who walked me out, helped me more than just my heart health. They, got, they have given me hope that there can and will be a new chapter in my life that there will be another heart song to a life of many experiences and traumas, but now with a lighter heart and thirst for life that has long since left me. There are miracle, they are miracle workers, and I need your assistance in acknowledging these paramedics, emergency personnel at Mersey Community Hospital and Launceston General Hospital Coronary Care Unit and Pharmacy. I would, have, I would appreciate that they receive a, a letter of recognition, an award or a bouquet for the work that they do, particularly when they're in a new physical premises due to COVID-19. Also operate as a day procedure unit, the feet on the ground at the front line, the givers and the selfless helpers of our Tasmanian health system. Lara then goes on to address the letter to the magical staff at the LGH coronary care unit. Thank you for keeping me alive. So this is to those people who are at that coronary care unit and in the paramedic um, family back home in Tassie. Thank you for keeping me alive. My son still has his mother. My parents still have their daughter. My sister still has her sister. And now I have hope. You're all special people with skills like superpowers. I'd give you all a medallion of honour if I could for your kindness, compassion, humility and humour. You're truly cared for the whole of me. And holistic care is the best care. I wasn't a patient, I was a human being. It takes unique gifts to do the work you do. I am ever so grateful. Not only were you dealing with my heart issues, but my mental health issues, which are severe. But I felt so safe and secure in your presence that my usual fear of strangers being anywhere outside my home and countless doctors after five years of treatment for my mental health. My workplace accident may have robbed me of my teaching career, but the other symptoms have brought my life to a plateau of merely, merely, being merely functional. My only job was being a great mother and keeping our world turning. Then my heart stopped working and you cured it. And in curing my heart, you reminded me to treasure my life that I can still laugh and joke, I can listen, I can emphasise, and I felt at peace. I felt normal for the first time in five years. The team in particular are the two nameless paramedics and cardiac nurse who attended my home on Wednesday the 10th of June 2020, the emergency room team at Mersey Community Hospital and the paramedics who got me to Launceston so quickly. Within the coronary care unit, I specifically remember my main nurses, Di, Robin, Ann, Mishy, Paul and John. If I have forgotten someone, my apologies. Dr John Esho and Dr Raj and of course Dr Herman. Doctors in my experience are often cold and clinical, not the doctors in this unit. No blame, kindness and acceptance, heartfelt advice and a sense of humour that is so important in a place which is so serious. Each of these doctors are amazing, they're among the best of experience, having lived in three states and overseas in private and public hospitals. My nurses were funny and sweet, serious and helpful. The most important gift they gave me was my voice. I started to talk, to relax and to accept help. Even the smallest thing, like making a cup of tea in a china cup, sitting with me for a few minutes to chat and reassuring me that I would recover. Without question, the most knowledgeable, inspiring and lovely nurses to ever have cared for me. I was never made to feel guilty or that my life choices and family history had caused the heart attack. I deeply appreciate that as I was punishing myself on the inside. Now I feel after the last five years of deep trauma, surviving family violence, raising a son solo, smoking on and off for 30 years and a family history of my heart simply broke. It has sung all the stories it could, had felt as much pain as it could and loved more than it should. 
but your team provided the jump start it needed because they are a team of excellence, of honesty, professional, highly educated and perceptive, vigilance, being human, a calm in the storm of day procedures, humour, advice with a cup of tea, compassion, education of patient greatly assisted by the package provided by Di, diversity of backgrounds and experience, kindness, humility and laughter. And when I got home and had a question, I simply rang and my panic subsided as I was advised on my question. I start rehabilitation on Monday. My new heart is stronger and it was laid with the best foundations in the critical care that I received. We are all ordinary people, but with a little extra heart and soul, spirit and determination, we become extraordinary individuals. My deepest gratitude, kind regards, Lara Watchman. I wrote to Lara, as I said, and indicated to her that I was prepared to share her story, to have it recognised and to make sure that these heroes within our medical system, which is pulled to pieces in Tasmania, that the paramedics who suffer so much with their own um, mental health issues um, often don't get recognised. Um, so when I wrote to her, uh, she came back to me and she said, thank you for your kind words and well wishes, but more importantly, thank you that my everyday heroes will be acknowledged. And I think it's important that we do that. So for Lara and for the people at both the Mersey Community Hospital, the Launceston General Hospital, the fantastic nurses um, and the fantastic paramedics who keep our health system together, I also say thank you very much. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Oh, damn. Dr Bernadette Boss has been announced as the Interim Commissioner. When the government announced they were going to go ahead with this Interim Commissioner model, I said to them that it wasn't going to work if it was someone who was a current or former serving member of the ADF. I asked the Minister for, Minister for Defence if it was going to be. She said, no. She said to me unequivocally, no, it won't be. I asked the Minister for Finance. He said no, unequivocally. Ask them if they deny it. Let them go on the record and say that didn't happen. Now, the decision of who to put in as an interim commissioner was one for Cabinet. The Minister for Defence sits at the Cabinet table. The Minister for Finance sits at the Cabinet table. They told me the National Commissioner wouldn't be ex-ADF. And guess what? Yep, it is. Now, one of two things happened. Either they lied then or they were telling the truth and just didn't have the numbers around Cabinet. If they lost the vote around the Cabinet table, it's because someone else in the room, when the decision was being made, fought against someone independent being put into that role and pushed instead for someone who's got that car key tinge to them. And I don't know which one it is, but if you're saying one thing will happen and the exact opposite thing happens, it's either because you were overconfident and you lost or you lied. There isn't another option, so which one is it? Let's say someone at the table there in Cabinet didn't want someone independent in charge. Ask yourself, why is that? What do they have to lose from someone asking questions without fear or favour? I'll tell you what I think. I think this government doesn't, doesn't want an independent investigation because they have a sneaking suspicion what they'd find. I didn't ask the question for no reason. There's no way the Commission can do their job if they don't have the confidence of the community they're supposed to be assisting. That would be the, ex ex uh, the service organisations, which they don't. So now you've just blown the trust thing. Let me put it to you this way. It would be like putting John Secker in charge of the Trade Union Royal Commission or Ken Henry in charge of the Banking Royal Commission. You don't put someone in to investigate an institution if they're also tied at the hip to that institution. It makes no sense, unless, of course, you're going for cover-up. You don't do it unless you don't want them being independent. And why wouldn't you want someone independent investigating it? Independent investigations don't give a damn about who they offend, who they drag out to the front up to, tough, up to the tough questions. They don't care who is upset by a finding, because that is their job, to find and tell the truth, not to cover up. Their obligation is only finding out what's going on and to be honest about it and for people to trust that what they're telling them is the truth. And I'm not saying Dr Boss is a bad person. I'm just saying that she spent 20 years 
as part of an institution, and she's now being asked to do the impossible, to separate herself from it. I mean, come on! Come on! These veteran suicide, some of them are being caused by the brass and the armed forces and their decisions. She's tied at the hip to these people. You don't become uninstitutionalised after coming out of the army after 20 years. It's just rubbish. It doesn't work that way. You can't spend that much time rising through the ranks of an institution without becoming attached to it. And if you're loyal to the institution, you're not loyal to the people who are supposed to be coming forward with claims against it. Nor do you have trust that you can do that. If you're even perceived as being loyal to the institution, who's going to come forward? And if people don't come forward, it's not because they don't have problems. It's because they don't trust their concerns will be given a fair hearing, and they won't. Let's not forget, we've got a Minister for Veterans Affairs that thinks the Royal Commission will be a waste of money. He supports the National Commissioner. The Department of Veterans Affairs was flatly opposed to a Royal Commission. It supports the National Commissioner. The RSL has criticised the idea of a Royal Commission as being costly and unwarranted. It supports a Royal Commission. You've got to ask yourself if there's nothing different between a Royal Commission and a National Commissioner, why does DBA, the RSL and its president and the minister all like the National Commissioner but not the Royal Commission? Why is that? If there's no difference between the two, why do they only like one of them? It's because they aren't the same at all, and everybody knows that. Royal commissions are completely independent. Nobody tells a royal commission what to investigate. The national commissioner has its terms of reference written by the institutions it's supposed to be holding to account. That's not it. That's not independent, and that's not fair to those veterans who are taking their lives out there. It's just not fair at all. Royal commissions get every resource they need to do their jobs. The National Commissioner has one quarter of the budget of the Trade Union Royal Commission. It has one quarter. That's what a veteran's worth. If you ask the National Commission to do the same job as the Royal Commission, but cut three quarters of its budget before it starts, you've already set it up for failure. It's finished. It's over. It's gone. So having a National Commissioner or an interim commissioner is a waste of our time. You tie it laces together before the race kicks off. You make a joke out of it, and that's exactly what you're doing. Royal commissions are flexible, responsive and dynamic. They're able to adopt, to adapt their focus and their priorities around what is happening in real time. Not once you're dead. It's too late then. Too late then. You can't just say, hey, hey, are you up there? Can you come down for a few minutes? Been down here, Scotty. It doesn't work like that. You won't find any mentions of COVID-19 in the Aged Care Royal Commission's terms of reference. That doesn't stop it from looking into its impacts. That's because Royal Commissions interpret their own terms of reference without any interference from the government of the day. The National Commissioner is a prisoner, is a prisoner to its terms of reference. It can't stray outside what it's told to look into. and If it does, it's liable to be pulled into line by the government that controls it. That's the other thing. The National Commissioner can't be fired or replaced for any reason at any time. Its terms of reference can be changed with a stroke of a pen. If a government doesn't like what the Commissioner is looking into, it can change the rules halfway through its investigation. It can make it unlawful for the Commissioner to keep looking where it's looking. If it's getting too independent, the Commissioner can be fired. If it's getting too powerful, the Commissioner's budget can be slashed. If it's getting too much done, it can be axed altogether, and the government says it's permanent. But that's only until they change their minds. Royal Commissions deliver a single set of recommendations to the government. The National Commissioner just does, oh, how good day, I'll check in today. Good day for it. No worries there, mate. It delivers a report to Parliament that will get filed away in a drawer. Not even journalists will bother to open it. It is not out in the open. That's the other thing. Royal commissions get public attention. They use that public attention to demand a public response. The response demands accountability. They get, a, get, get governments to do something. The National Commissioner doesn't have an end date, so it never delivers a final list of recommendations. I'm sure that's suiting you guys over there. I'm sure it's just fabulous. It just delivers the same recommendations year in and year out, and they never get the public attention that forces the government to respond. 
so they get ignored. They become part of the furniture. You want to know why DVA, the minister responsible for DVA and all those ex-service organisations that rely on DVA funding are opposed to? A Royal Commission, because a Royal Commission would hold DVA to account and would also hold defence to account. It would hold the ministers to account. It would hold the ex-service organisations who aren't doing the right thing to account without fear and without favour, with a commitment to nothing other than preventing suicides from current and former defence members. The organisations that don't want to be put under the microscope are opposed to being put under the microscope. That's not a shock. The organisations that are trying to avoid scrutiny all support the National Commission. That is a shock, because it isn't it exactly the same as a Royal Commission? If you want to know whether there's any difference between a National Commissioner and a Royal Commission, ask yourself if there's any difference between who supports one or the other. The families of veterans who have taken their own lives support a Royal Commission. The institutions who are being blamed for those suicides support a national commissioner. What do you know? I don't think Dr Bernadette Boss is a bad person, although I haven't seen her in action yet. I think she's been put in a bad position, and you've done that to her. And now I'm going to be chasing her, so good luck with that. She's been asked to fix a problem with none of the tools she needs to fix it. She's expected to succeed while she's being set up for failure. Her job is not really to fix anything, so long as she's not a, not a royal commission. As far as the government is concerned, she's done all she needs to do. There's nothing else left of her to do but to show up and nod her head and expect everybody to agree with her why veterans' desks stay on the rise, and that's exactly what's going to happen. For God's sakes, do the smart thing and call for a royal commission. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Women's sports women's toilets and women's change rooms are designed for people of the female sex and should remain that way. These are the words that the Tasmanian Anti-Discrimination Commissioner deemed to be potentially prohibited conduct under the Anti-Discrimination Act. How is it, in a democratic country, that it could be prohibited to say that women's sports and women's toilets are designed for female people? The Orwellian powers granted to unelected anti-discrimination bureaucrats are being used as a weapon by aggressive activists to stop Australians speaking about the realities of biological sex. The recent complaint against me for speaking about safety and fairness in women's sport has been dropped, only because I'm an elected parliamentarian who has the platform to speak up and fight back. But this back down brings little comfort to the millions of Australians who will have no such protection when the thought police come for them. Tonight, I want to put on record the way the complaint against me was initiated and manipulated to pressure me into silence. I have no doubt that these actions, directed against someone who isn't a senator, would have had the result of permanently preventing an Australian citizen from exercising their democratic right to speak freely and openly. While these unjust laws remain on the books and are wielded as a weapon by activists to shut down legitimate debate, Free speech is absolutely under threat in this country. On 3 September, I received an email stating that a complaint had been made about me and that I must attend a compulsory conciliation. The complaint, lodged on 18 July this year, said, Senator Claire Chandler had an article published in the Talking Points pages of the Mercury on 17 July 2020. The complainant said, I despair that Senator Chandler's conduct that is, writing an article about free speech, is being seen as acceptable by way of being published in a mainstream newspaper. I would, at the minimum, expect Senator Chandler to receive education, apologise and never engage in this kind of behaviour again. These were not idle wishes by the complainant. The Anti-Discrimination Tribunal does indeed have the power to order apologies and retractions and compel a person to never engage in certain behaviour again. Had the complaint not been dropped, I would have been ordered by the tribunal to never again say that women's sport is designed for people of the female sex. Such powers are absolutely incompatible with free speech and with our democracy. Yeah, yeah. It was immediately clear on receiving the direction to attend conciliation that something very strange and legally questionable was occurring. In the complaint against me, dated the 18th of July, the complainant specifically said, since publication of the opinion piece, I have sought clarification on Senator Chandler's views by contacting her office by telephone and email, but I have not heard back. 
The complainant did indeed email me on Saturday, the 18th of July, the same day he lodged the complaint. He said, I'm writing as one of your Tasmanian constituents seeking clarification on your article in the Mercury yesterday. I wonder if you could clarify that you understand the difference between sex and gender and whether you believe trans women are women. I was asked a direct question by a constituent and I responded honestly and politely. I do understand the difference between sex and gender. That's why I've made the point in my article that women's sports, women's toilets and women's change rooms are designed for people of the female sex and should remain that way. These single-sex facilities exist for the privacy, safety and dignity of women and girls, and we should not be required to give up those rights in the name of inclusiveness. In the decision letter I received from the Commissioner, she says, I decided possible breaches are disclosed by the following conduct. Senator Chandler's letter to the complainant sent around July 2020. Strangely, the Commissioner's decision omits the exact date on which I responded to the complainant's email. The date I sent this email was Monday, the 20th of July, two days after the complaint was submitted. How can the Anti-Discrimination Commissioner assert that a complaint made on the 18th of July refers to an email that wasn't sent until the 20th? Clearly, inconvenient facts have been ignored in order to compel me to attend conciliation. No complaint relating specifically to my email of the 20th of July has ever been provided to me. The only document to refer to this correspondence was the assessment decision of the Commissioner. I was given no opportunity to respond to point this out and the other errors before I was directed to attend conciliation. When I was able to provide a detailed written response to the Commissioner, it was ignored. To this day, she hasn't written back. Given the complaint seemed to have no legal basis, I made a request to Equal Opportunity Tasmania that my lawyer be able to attend conciliation. Permission was denied. Several days later, I was advised that the complainant had been granted permission for a support person to attend with him. The following week, Equal Opportunity Tasmania emailed me to complain about my public comments and threaten legal action against members of the public who found the complaint to be vexatious and had written to the Commissioner asking she drop my case. The email said, please see attached a sample of emails that the Commissioner has received since your public statements in the media about the complaint. I note that legal action can be taken against any person who uses insulting language towards any person exercising any power under the Anti-Discrimination Act. Later that week, still with no acknowledgement of my response pointing out the lack of legal substance to the complaint, Equal Opportunity Tasmania sent me a pre-conciliation confidentiality agreement that I was instructed to sign. Not only did they want to compel me to attend a conciliation for writing an article about free speech, they now wanted me to surrender my right to talk about how the Commission itself was limiting free speech. I refused to sign the confidentiality agreement. Less than 24 hours before conciliation was due to take place, it was suddenly cancelled. Then, 24 hours after that, something remarkably convenient for the Commissioner happened. The complainant withdrew the complaint. I learnt of this not from Equal Opportunity Tasmania, but from the media. Because the complaint has been withdrawn, the Commissioner now never needs to acknowledge that the complaint had no legal substance. Most troublingly, we are left no clearer about what Tasmanians and Australians can say in defence of sex-based rights or safety and fairness in women's sport without being hauled before the Commission. Presumably, if the Commissioner thought it appropriate to summon me to conciliation for saying that women's sports and women's change rooms were designed for females, she may take the same action against any other citizen for saying the same thing in the future. It is one thing to be on the end of this absurdity as a senator. I was fortunate enough to have a platform to let the public know what was happening and, know how, and let them know how free speech in defence of women's rights is being targeted. But this could easily happen to one of the millions of other Australian women who acknowledge the reality of biological sex and support women having access to female sports and female facilities. Completely out of the blue, any of these women could receive a legal direction to go and explain to a man you don't even know why they've made comments about women's sex-based rights. If they don't attend, they'll be fined nearly $2,000. The Commissioner refuses permission for you to have a lawyer at conciliation. You're provided with a pre-conciliation confidentiality agreement and told to sign it, with a strong implication that you have no other option. 
This process is highly stressful and intimidating for any private citizen targeted by Equal Opportunity Tasmania. You're on your own, you're out of pocket, you've had to ask your boss for time off work because you've been accused of engaging in prohibited conduct. You're up against the power of an anti-discrimination commission that seems determined to put you through the ringer for saying that women's sports and change rooms are for females. This whole process is designed to operate in secret, behind closed doors, where you're guilty until proven innocent. It's unfair, it's undemocratic and it's an affront to freedom of speech. Here, here. I want to conclude tonight by reflecting on a comment made by the complainant. He suggested in his statement to the media late last week that the only reason he lodged a complaint was to force me to go to conciliation to enable, and I quote, an open and frank conversation. Let me be absolutely clear. If you initiate legal action against a woman for expressing her views about women's rights, you don't want an open and frank conversation. You want to control what she says. Here, here. My response is the same as my message to those who threaten and vilify J.K. Rowling for defending sex-based rights and to the Australian Labor Party who smear Australian women who speak up, myself included, as transphobic. We will not be controlled and we will not be silenced. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, on this budget day I will address corruption in Queensland local government. Corruption that is ripping off millions of dollars of Commonwealth and state taxpayers' money and local ratepayers' money. We cannot afford corruption at any time, especially not in today's economic climate. The corruption in Queensland local government is systemic and criminal to the extent that people are essentially stealing from taxpayers and ratepayers. Government-provided taxpayer monies are redirected, not spent on their intended purposes, not spent at all or corruptly provided to persons in exchange for overvalued materials and service. The Natural Disaster Relief and Recovery Arrangements NDRRA, governs the disaster recovery funding. The Australian government reimburses 75 per cent of the cost of the works. The state government reimburses the other 25 per cent of the cost of the works. Emergency Management Australia administers NDRRA funding on behalf of the Australian government. The Queensland Reconstruction Authority and Emergency Management Queensland coordinate the NDRRA funding in Queensland. Councils regularly wrought this arrangement with the assistance of the Local Government Association of Queensland, the LGAQ, through several of its business entities, including by local. Take, for example, the Tablelands Regional Council. It made a claim for road damage which allegedly occurred allegedly occurred during severe weather and flooding in February 2016. There was no declared disaster event. In fact, the dates Council provided were not consistent with any particular event at all. Local residents confirmed there was no damage to the road during that period. No damage. The Council directed sections of a perfectly good, undamaged road to be dug up. It was replaced with inferior materials at half the cost claimed for specified suitable replacement material. This was coupled with shoddy workmanship. All parties in the project knew that the road was substandard, dangerous and would fail, yet it was signed off as satisfactory and completed. Council correspondence states that the road would, would be expected to have a design life of 12 years. This road did not last 12 weeks. And this is not an isolated example. Having practices Similar practices have occurred under previous administrations in Central Highlands, Fraser Coast, Charters Towers Regional Councils, as well as Carpentaria and Cook Shire Councils. The councils and the LGAQ are facilitating and encouraging a system where contractors fraudulently make unreasonable profits on road building. They fraudulently claim payments and strip 40 to 60 per cent out of NDRRA project funding as private profits. They do this using road materials of substandard quality from private and unlicensed quarries with inferior work. The net result is fraudulent expenditure on roadworks that has rorted millions of dollars in Commonwealth and state monies. Substandard materials and works also contribute significantly to more rapid deterioration of local assets. 
These rorts mean that taxpayers pay up to 40 per cent more than they should. Substantial misuse of local buy contracts contributes to the fraud. Local buy is a wholly LGAQ-owned company set up with the stated aim of meeting the needs of local councils, with their procurement process arranging contractors to fill council contracts. In reality, it's a way to rip off ratepayer money, especially where the complaints processes and the anti-corruption body of the Crime and Corruption Commission, the Triple C, are so ineffective. Local contractors are often sidelined when contracts are given to outside contractors who do not satisfy the required standards. Once local buy gives a contract to a contractor, a percentage of the contract price must be paid to the LGAQ for arranging the contract through local buy. The local buy concept is widespread and is clearly a front to gouge profits of up to 60 per cent from ratepayers' money. And the LGAQ protects local buy. Corruption by Queensland Council members is a reality, and the number of Queensland Council members and officers convicted and jailed in recent years is the proof. This, though, is just the tip of the iceberg. In recent times, corruption in local government has seemed to be centred on Ipswich, arguably the corruption capital of Queensland. Former Labor Mayor Paul Pasali was convicted of extortion and related offences and jailed. For his successor, former Mayor Andrew Antonelli, with close connections to Labor, was convicted of multiple fraud charges. Fortunately, though, former State MP Joanne Miller and honest Ipswich locals like Gary and Connie Duffy worked hard to expose this corruption. Yet they were thwarted at every step and bullied at every step. The corruption has been linked to the Queensland Labor state government. After 16 years of Joanne Miller's hard work, the entire Ipswich City Council was sacked and court proceedings against individual councillors and officers remain ongoing. There are so many of them. This level of corruption is not isolated. Our sources from across Queensland, right across Queensland, confirm this. We have many examples. In Logan, City Council, seven councillors and the mayor were charged with corruption and conspiracy offences, and the entire council sacked. A common link to this local government corruption has been the Local Government Association of Queensland, the LGAQ, a private company limited by guarantee that many people think is a government instrument, but it's not. The association's principal activity is said to represent Queensland local governments in their dealings with other governments, unions, business and the community. What makes the Local Government Association of Queensland, the LGAQ, unique are the special statutory provisions that make the LGAQ virtually unaccountable for their actions. Under Rule 234 of the Local Government Regulations 2012, a council is exempt from calling contracts to tender or calling quotes if the contract is entered into under an LGAQ arrangement. This includes a contract made with the LGAQ. Every contract the LGAQ enters involves a substantial fee being paid to the LGAQ. It is the classic cartel arrangement prohibited in every other state except Queensland, where Rule 234 legalised it. Rule 234 must be repealed to ensure transparency and integrity. And as for audits, under Section 591 of the then Labor Government's Industrial Relations Act 1999, the LGAQ Limited are exempt from appointing an auditor to inspect the accounting records and issue an audit report as usually undertaken under the Corporations Act 2001. There is no independent audit. The LGAQ is a powerful organisation that is well protected from revealing the murky side of its operations. How such an organisation can have such wide exemptions from integrity checks and balances must be explained and remedied. The Queensland Labor government has failed the people of Queensland again. It is equally difficult to break through the corruption when incriminating evidence is disclosed to authorities who do nothing to stop the corrupt practices. Much of this information has been disclosed in the Queensland State Parliament and directly to the Triple C, which inexplicably 
declined to investigate. Many complaints to the Triple C about a council are simply referred back to the council to investigate itself. No problems found. Complaint resolved. Oh, really? The LGAQ must be brought to account. The LGAQ is supporting, if not directly funding, the current fabricated proceedings brought by its CEO, Mr Greg Hallam, against former State Member of Parliament, the courageous Mr Rob Pine, and Queensland resident, Ms Lynn O'Connor, as an attempt to silence or punish them for challenging the LGAQ practices. It's hard to argue that while these corrupt councils have rorted the finances of the Commonwealth, State and taxpayers, the ministers of local government, including former minister for local government, Ms Jackie Trad, have been blind to the extensive corrupt practices going on around them. Willfully blind? The mechanics of the corrupt practices are known and have been brought to the attention of the authorities. The ministers for local government cannot say that they are unaware. Yet still do nothing. This is corruption. It must stop. Tomorrow I will submit a motion calling for a Senate inquiry into the corruption in Queensland local government that has cost, and unless stopped, will continue to cost millions of dollars of Commonwealth and state monies, all ultimately paid by the taxpayer. It's estimated that stopping the corruption will halve council rates, a huge saving every year for honest, hard-working Queenslanders. has expired. Senator Scarf. Mr Acting Deputy President, well, it's perhaps timely uh, that I should give this adjournment speech following Senator Roberts, uh, because Senator Roberts has spoken about some of the, uh, perhaps, um, how can one put it, the bad history of uh, previous councils in the Ipswich region, and yet I would like to talk about the Ipswich region's future. Last month, my office, in fact, moved the Ipswich Regional Council uh, within their area. Ipswich is one of Australia's most historic cities. It was founded in 1824 and was actually named in 1843. The school I went to, Ipswich Grammar School, was actually the first secondary school established in the state of Queensland. And a new council was elected this year. Senator Roberts has referred to some of the issues with the previous councils. I actually would like to pay tribute to all those members of Ipswich City Council, including um, employees who blew the whistle on previous practices. And here, here, Senator Roberts says, I acknowledge that interjection. Um, and I also pay tribute to all of the great people in the Ipswich community who uh, stood up to those practices. Justice has now been done. It is now time to move forward. Ipswich has a new regional council, and Ipswich has a new senator based in the Ipswich region, and I'm delighted to be there. Ipswich has an extremely exciting future in front of it. There is extraordinary growth occurring in the region. The population grew by 4.1 per cent between 2018 and 2019, and is expect expected to grow to 558,000 residents by 2041. 558,000 residents. My office is located in the city of Springfield within the Ipswich Regional Council area. And Springfield itself just encapsulates everything great about this country. A great Australian by the name of Maha Sinathambi, who is chair of Springfield Land Corporation, looked upon vacant land and saw a city. He saw a city and then went about building it. Just as Michelangelo looked at a piece of marble and saw a statue, Maha Sinathambi looked at vacant land, a bush, bush, and saw a city and proceeded to build it. And since then, $18 billion has been invested. Uh, in Springfield, one of the uh, Australia's second master planned cities, will have investment, it already has investment in education, technology, health, defence services, the arts. It is an extremely livable city and it's absolute joy to have my office located there. Now, an event occurred last weekend which sums up the future of Ipswich, not the past that Senator Roberts referred to, but the future, and I was delighted to participate. On Saturday, I attended at the commemoration of building of a new STEM building at the Himba Yumba Independent School, which received $2 million in support from the federal government.
And just to give you a feeling for this event, I thought I might walk through the itinerary or the agenda for the uh, proceedings, just to give you a feeling, and hopefully I can give you some sort of um, appreciation of what a great event it was. First, there was an acknowledgement and welcome to country from patron Uncle Albert Holt. Now, Uncle Albert Holt is a great Australian, a great Indigenous Australian, a respected Aboriginal elder from Inala in Brisbane South West. He grew up at the Sherberg Mission in my home state of Queensland after his family was forcibly removed from their home. He overcame that adversity to become a respected role model. And towards the end of 2001, Uncle Albert Holt retired from his full-time work. His last job was, in fact, as a police liaison officer, and he served in that role for more than seven years. And he then went about driving a vision for the creation of this school, the Himba Yumba Independent School. Himba means development of skills in listening, reflecting, evaluating and planning. Yumba means the building and support for learning. This school started Uncle Holt's vision was realised in 2011 with 50 jarjums, and that's how they refer to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children who are students, jarjums. And they were being teach, taught in rented premises. Now in 2020, there are 213 jarjums and growing, now based in beautiful premises in Springfield. Uncle, when Uncle Holt was speaking about his passion for education, it reminded me of the great Neville Bonner, who preceded me in this place as a Liberal senator from my home state of Queensland, who was also based in the Ipswich region. After Uncle Holt's welcome and acknowledgement to country, a choir then performed, the junior choir from the Himba Yumba School. And the choir participants were Yvonne Jones, Kalani Jones, Talay Brady, Tamea Brady, and Summer Wiley Coolwell. And they sang the Australian national anthem in the Younger Bay language. And it was just beautiful, absolutely beautiful, Madam Acting Deputy President. Principal Peter Foster then set out the vision for this school. Respect for self, respect for elders, respect for family, respect for community and country. And he described how it's become a really special place. And I must say, the first time I attended the school, I felt that. I really felt that I was in a special place, this holistic education where all graduates from this school, the commitment is that all graduates from this school are either earning or learning. A senator then gave an address, and we can pass over that. <laughs> Minister White then spoke by video conference, and how special it was for our first Indigenous Indigenous Affairs Minister to speak to those kids and for them to see him by video. And he promised uh, to visit the school once uh, restrictions had been, um, had been lessened. And then we had the opportunity to put our hands in the concrete, to leave a lasting impression, as this school will leave a lasting impression on the students who attend it. And I got to put my hands in the concrete with Elder Uncle Albert Holt, but also with the school captain. Jamala Bonner, Jamala Bonner, great granddaughter of Neville Bonner, and how proud he would be, how proud would he be, a man who came to serve in this place with barely two or three years of formal education to see his great granddaughter, school captain of the Himbiyumba Independent School and on the way to university. How proud would he be? This is the Australia he dreamed of. This is the Australia he dreamed of, which is there in living reality at the Himbiyumba Independent School. I'd like to pay tribute to members of the board, Mrs Carla Brady, the chair, Kerry Silver, the deputy chair, Stan Siloff, the treasurer, Ivana Jones, Michael Bong, Roseanne Ware, Christine Figg and Neil Bosman. I'd like to pay tribute to all of the staff, past and present. I'd like to pay tribute to the elders and local community supporting the school, including Vivian Bonner, who was Neville Bonner's daughter-in-law, and she's the community engagement officer, driving that engagement with the local Indigenous communities and the broader community. I pay tribute to Springfield Land Corporation. Raina Sinathambi, managing director, was in attendance. 
And her father, Maha Sinathambi, the chair of Springfield Land Corporation, had at the core of his vision for Springfield education. Education. And you can see that at the Himba Yumba Independent School. I'd also like to pay tribute to the builders of the STEM building, which is currently in construction. And can I just say in this regard, um, it was quite inspiring to have representatives there from Hutchinson Builders, a great Queensland company established in 1912, Hutchies as we call it in Queensland. And they weren't just constructing a building, they were taking the opportunity to show the Indigenous kids, this is what we do, this is what you could do, these are the sort of opportunities open to you. And they were broadening their horizons. It was quite outstanding. I pay tribute to Decky Richards, a design firm, the architects, for designing this beautiful building, nestled in its environment, and everyone else involved in this project and the Himba Yumba community. Madam Acting Deputy President, if you seek hope, if you seek inspiration, if you seek a raising of the spirits in these hard times, then go to Himba Yumba School in Springfield, a place where education is transforming the lives of our Indigenous children. Thank you. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. In February 2022, just 15 months away, the People's Republic of China will host the 24th Winter Olympic Games. This will be a big moment for China. The attention of the world will be focused on Beijing, the first city ever to have hosted both the Summer and Winter Olympic Games, having previously hosted the 2008 Summer Olympics. Now, the Olympics is supposed to be an apolitical event, and many people like to think that sport should be separate from politics. But the reality is that sport is, and always has been, inextricably linked to politics, to national pride and the interests of governments that seek to use sport to boost their prestige domestically and internationally. When China hosted the Summer uh, Games in Beijing in 2008, the Chinese Communist Party promoted the occasion as a demonstration of China's newfound status as a global power. The 2008 Games attracted plenty of criticism, especially in regard to China's poor human rights record, including uh, repression in Tibet and the Chinese government's violation of a pledge to allow open media access. However, the Chinese Communist Party went all out to present the Olympics as confirmation of a long-held nationalist dream. Any criticism was denounced as an insult to China. Many people will remember the highly organised demonstrations of strident Chinese nationalist sentiment that accompanied the Olympic torch relay as it progressed through, uh, throughout Australia's cities. The 2008 Games gave the Chinese Communist Party more leverage to suppress political dissent. Efforts to suppress any political unrest before and during the Games contributed directly to the rapid expansion of China's internal security forces, and that all intrusive power has grown every year since then. In 2015, Beijing was selected as the host city of the 2022 Winter Olympics, beating Alamity in Kazakhstan by just four votes in the Inter International Olympic Committee. The IOC's 2015 decision aroused further concerns and complaints from human rights groups. Two years later, February 2017, the IOC belatedly introduced human rights principles into its future host city contracts, the agreements between the IOC and the cities chosen to host the Olympic Games. The key provisions of the new host uh, city contracts provide that host cities, National Olympic Committee and Organising Committee for the, for the Games agree to prohibit any form of discrimination to protect and respect all internationally recognised human rights and to implement internationally recognised anti-corruption standards. The IOC is to establish a reporting mechanism covering these principles and standards. These principles and arrangements will first apply in the 2024 Olympics in Paris in France. But where does that leave the 2022 uh, Winter Olympics? Beijing has already started the, the Olympic countdown clock. 
but the human rights concerns that cast a shadow over the 2008 Games have grown a hundredfold. Early last month, more than 180 human rights groups from around the world called on the IOC to pull back from holding the, the Winter Olympic uh, Games in Beijing. Weeks before that, US presidential candidate Joe Biden's campaign declared that the Chinese Communist Party's repression of Uyghur, the Uyghur population in Xinjiang amounted to genocide the gravest charge that can be made under international law. US President Donald Trump's administration is reportedly considering making a similar direct declaration. There is no denying the deeply sinister developments in Xinjiang. In what amounts to a massive exercise in political, religious and ethnic cleansing, the Chinese government has forced a massive number of Uyghurs, probably upward of a million, into internment camps. It has pressured them to relinquish their language, culture, and religion while subjecting them to forms of political indoctrination, something human rights groups have called brainwashing. Torture and other brutal, brutal punishments are also reported wide, reportedly widespread. There are also reports of forced sterilisations and abortions as part of a state-sanctioned effort to drive down the Uyghur birth rate. Researchers at uh, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute have meticulously documented evidence to, of Chinese government uh, subjecting Uyghurs to forced labour, including selling that labour to companies across China. This industrial scale, rep scale repression is supported by a vast array of identity checks, sensors, cameras, tracking and monitoring technology that is arguably the world's first high-technology surveillance state. All the while, the Chinese Communist Party churns out propaganda claiming that its policies towards the Uyghurs are necessary for national security and warning Western media and governments not to pry into their internal affairs. Of course, China's human rights violations are not limited to mass persecution of Uyghurs. Across, uh, Ch uh, across China, President Xi uh, has cracked down on any free expression of opinion, employing the Ministry of State Security to harass, detain and, and prosecute any person seen to express dissent. We've also seen the effective end of the special status of Hong Kong, uh, its one country, two system policy, enshrined in international treaties through the use of the new national security laws to crush democratic freedoms of the territory. China has also cracked down on the international media and engaged in what amounts to state-directed hostage-taking. A prominent Austra Chinese Australian writer and a Chinese Australian journalist are amongst those held in arbitrary detention, facing potentially grave national security charges. Now, these circumstances have led to the Interparliamentary Alliance on China to call on the IOC to reconsider staging the 2022 Games in Beijing. Senator Erica Betts is, uh, has also uh, included himself in that, uh, in that call. The standing of the IOC will be gravely harmed if they allow themselves to provide global public relations platform uh, for a brutal, authoritarian and indeed totalitarian regime that, is, that, as Joe Biden rightly sa says, has engaged in what amounts to genocide. However, we must be realistic about the IOC's um, uh, um, keenness to deal with this issue. They are affected by uh, the, the delaying of the, J the Japanese uh, or the Tokyo Olympics into 2021. That will have affected their funding, and they won't have much appetite to realistically call for the uh, Beijing Winter Olympics to be uh, moved elsewhere. So we need to think about this. It's my uh, considered view that Australia must take a lead and say no to the Winter Olympic Games. After all, the Australian government's current advice to its citizens is that, quite apart from the circumstances of COVID-19, uh, they should not visit or remain in China owing to the risk of arbitrary arrest and detention. Are we seriously thinking of sending media and we are seriously think thinking of sending our athletes and spectators to China under those circumstances? And if we think things are going to change, then you're wrong. The circumstances are getting worse and worse in China. Uh, President Xi intends to go harder in suppressing dissent and, harsh, uh, and ha dealing harshly with ethnic minorities in Western China. 
As I said, there are people already uh, arguing that we should uh, boycott the Winter Olympics. Liberal MP Dave Sharma has claimed that any boycott would be counterproductive, and Senator, Senator Wong, the Foreign Affairs Spokesman for, for Labor, has said she wants the Olympics to put a spotlight on China, including its human rights record. Well, I'm more inclined to, to agree with the former Socceroos captain Greg Foster, who has said that while international sporting organisations are not responsible for human rights violations in a host country, they are directly responsible if they allow mega events to be used to whitewash broad-scale abuse occurring under the sh shadow of the stadia. Some will say that inter an international boycott won't be uh, uh, effective, that it won't change China's policies. That could be so, but that's beside the point. The question is whether Australia is prepared to lend legitimacy to a deeply authoritarian and morally bankrupt regime. I don't think we can afford to do that. It would send precisely the wrong message to the world about the values we advocate and support. Australia should boycott the Beijing Winter Olympics, and we should announce that decision soon. We shouldn't leave it to the last minute. We should allow for this to be organised. We should uh, compensate the uh, Australian uh, Olympic Committee and the Australian Winter Olympic Institute, and we should let our athletes know and we should support our athletes. We cannot go and stand on the playing fields of a re regime responsible for genocide and human rights abuses on a vast scale. Australia should boycott, and we should take the lead in announcing that decision. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Acting Madam Deputy President. Tonight's 2021 federal budget, handed down by Treasurer Josh Frydenberg, is all about jobs. This is the most important federal budget since the Second World War. Whether it's tax cuts for workers and businesses, infrastructure spending, investment in manufacturing, support for young job seekers, or massive investments to drive business investment, the Morrison government stands with the Australian people to do whatever it takes to drive jobs growth and our economic recovery. Under the leadership of Prime Minister Morrison and in the wake of devastating drought and bushfire, Australians can be incredibly proud of how we have responded to this global pandemic protecting lives and livelihoods. Victorians, of course, have had it particularly tough. Underpinned by our unprecedented economic plan, the federal budget will support all sectors of our economy at this critical time for our nation. Of the new announcements we've heard tonight, the tax cuts for low and middle income workers, 11 million Australians, and the investment incentives for businesses which allow businesses to write off 100 per cent of their purchases are absolute game changers. The job maker hiring credit, along with a major investment in apprentices and trainees, will provide unprecedented support to get young Australians into jobs. More people in jobs means a stronger budget position and a stronger nation. As the Treasurer said tonight, the Morrison government has your back. Our economic plan will provide the fiscal firepower our nation needs to recover from this economic and health crisis, a crisis which has crippled thousands upon thousands of businesses through no fault of their own, particularly in Victoria, where, because of hotel quarantine, and contact tracing disasters imposed by the Victorian government, community transmission has run out of control, leading to many draconian and economically crippling restrictions. Our economic recovery plan for Australia will create jobs, rebuild our economy and secure Australia's future, including in Victoria. Under our plan, around 3 million taxpayers in Victoria will receive tax relief for the 2021 financial year, with 2.6 million taxpayers to receive up to $1,080 for lower and middle income earners 
and $2,160 for dual income families. This means more money in the pockets of local households to assist with the cost of living, but also to generate economic activity and create jobs, because this is a budget all about jobs. Since the onset of the pandemic, the government has provided $257 billion in direct economic support to cushion the blow and strengthen our recovery. This includes $17 billion in JobKeeper payments and $7 billion in cash flow boost credit amounts to Victorian residents and entities. The 2021 budget commits a further $98 billion nationally, including $25 billion in direct COVID-19 response measures and $74 billion in new measures, again, all to create jobs. Other key measures include the extension of the First Home Buyers Deposit Scheme, an additional $1 billion to support construction of affordable housing, a $500 boost for pensioners, a $1.5 billion modern manufacturing strategy to ensure we have an internationally competitive and resilient manufacturing sector and in the process create more high-value jobs. Tax relief for Victorian businesses will allow 99 per cent of businesses to deduct the full cost of depreciable assets in the year they are installed and allowing companies with a turnover of up to $5 billion to offset losses against previous profits on which tax has been paid to generate a refund. This will drive incredible confidence and investment by every business, small, medium and large, across our country. There's $2 billion investment in road safety upgrades to save lives, an additional $1 billion to support local councils to immediately upgrade local roads, footpaths and street lighting, $2 billion in concessional loans for farmers, $2 billion for vital water infrastructure, and another round, $200 million for the Building Better Regions Fund, which will deliver significant opportunities, including in the Karayo, Karangamite, Ballarat and Bendigo electorates. There's record funding for health, education, disability services and aged care, including 23,000 new home care pa packages to support older Australians stay at home longer. And once the Aged Care Royal Commission hands down its finding, next year more significant funding will flow. I am incredibly proud that the budget is funding major local projects in my region to drive jobs and investment. These include $292 million to duplicate Barwon Heads Road from Settlement Road to Reserve Road, including a new bridge over the railway line at Marshall, creating 292 jobs. This, regrettably, is the road which Labor forgot. It committed to fund it at the last state election, but so far not one construction dollar has been allocated in the state budget. There's $200 million for upgrades to the Warrnambool line, which will deliver track works to improve the ride quality, reliability and resilience of the line for passenger and freight rail services. This will create another 640 jobs. There's $30 million to support planning for the extension of the Melbourne Electrified Network to Wyndham Vale on the Geelong Line and Melton on the Ballarat Line. And a massive $605 million has been brought forward into the Ford Estimates for the accelerated planning and delivery of Stage 2 of the Geelong Rail duplication between Warren Ponds and South Geelong, delivering 1,300 direct and indirect jobs, as well as faster and more reliable passenger and freight rail services. For a very long time, I've called on the Victorian government to bring forward this project, and we now have this agreement in place, and that is wonderful news for our region. This is a project that I have advocated for, for many, many years. And this is a great day for the people of the Geelong and Karangamite regions. There is, of course, a critical investment for Geelong, the fuel security package, which will deliver a major boost to Viva Energy's Geelong refinery, including an estimated $70 million per annum 
in a refinery production payment. And let's not forget two incredible defence vehicle manufacturing projects. We've announced $2.3 billion extension of the Howitzer Defence Project to be based in Geelong, an absolute game changer, one of the biggest investments we've ever seen in our region, a program that would deliver up to 350 jobs. And of course, there is the decision to go to full-scale production of the Hawkeye Defence Vehicle in Bendigo, delivering more than 200 jobs. Madam Acting Deputy President, after what we have endured as a nation, after this shocking year, our economic recovery plan delivers economic resilience and support and hope and opportunity ahead. We have climbed mountains before as a nation and we will do, we will do so again. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Henderson. The Senator sta Senate stands adjourned and will meet again tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. Thank you. They're better, they're better earlier at night, I reckon.